music. And I cannot tell you how delighted I am to see this room full of people. The last time we held an in-person meeting was in Ottawa, March 9th and 10th, 2019, and boom, less than, 20, was it 2019? Yeah, and less than a week later, everything shut down. Was it 2020? Oh. It just seemed longer, never mind. <laughs> Two years, three years, what's the difference, right? But it does seem, let me ask a quick question here. How many people for you, this is the first in-person meeting you've had? All right, okay, you guys are really antsy. This is good. <laughs> this is excellent. Well, this is delightful, and we're really delighted. Hopefully, everything continues well and that we will have many more of these. Um, this is, in fact, a really important event, obviously, for us in the rare disease community. We have been working, even though it's been virtually, for the last two and a half years almost, in terms of coming to grips with a rare disease drug strategy. Ever since 2019, that was the date when the federal government announced that they would be setting up a rare disease drug strategy and committing real monies to it. $500 million a year, but a billion dollars to set it up over the first two years, starting in 2022. And guess what, folks? It is 2022. And I can tell you from the rare disease patient community and from all the stakeholders we've been working with, we're going to make that happen. So this is really important. <laughs> but also to know the only reason we're making this happen is because of you. So many of you have participated with us virtually. It's so lovely to be able to go up to people and say, wow, it's so nice to see you in real life. And of course, people that you've never seen before other than in real life. My first comment always is, my God, I didn't know how tall people were. <laughs> you know, online, we're all the same size, right? <laughs> it's like, great. Let me not go too much longer because we do have a very important person that opened the event for us. And we are so very delighted that he was able to take the time to come over from Parliament Hill to actually bring not only greetings, but actually to set us into the path of this day. I'm really happy to invite uh, Adam Van Cooperden, the MP from Milton, who's a parliamentary secretary for the Minister of Health. Many of you will know of him as the champion lord, the flag bearer for Canada and sports. And we are so really delighted that he's going to be the flag bearer for rare diseases. I'd like to invite Adam to come up and say a few comments. Wow, thanks, Johan. It's really nice to be here with you all. Merci beaucoup pour, pour m'inviter aujourd'hui. C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui, ce matin. Uh, it's, uh, my name is Adam Van Cooperen. I'm the Member of Parliament for Milton, and I also get to be the Parliamentary Secretary to two ministers, the Minister of Health and the Minister of Sport. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning to share a few remarks and learn a little bit more about your organization, and of course to meet Durhan in person, because we've only talked on the phone. So thank you for the, the intro, uh, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of what I'm sure is going to be a very thoughtful discussion today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are all gathered on unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin people. I'd like to encourage everyone to take a moment to consider the land on which we reside, whether that's here or somewhere else on this, uh, in this country, and how this reflection is one step in recognizing the historical traumas of colonialism in this country and the continued impacts on Indigenous peoples today. It's even more important this month because June is Indigenous History Month. And uh, we all have a, a role to play in, in walking the path of truth and reconciliation. So to take us back just a few years from today, as many participants here know very well, the Advisory Council on the Implementation of National Pharmacare delivered its final report in June 2019. And that report included recommendations to develop a formal national strategy for drugs for rare diseases. And around the same time, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Health, which I'm on now, but wasn't back then, carried out a study on the barriers to access to treatment for Canadians affected by rare diseases. And in its final report presented to the House of Commons in 2019, it acknowledged that the biggest barrier that limits patients' access to these drugs is their affordability. The re report's recommendations included calls to establish coordinated processes and options for covering the costs of drugs for rare diseases. And following on this work to help Canadians with rare disease access, rare disease drug access, um, Budget 2019 proposed to invest up to $1 billion, as Durhan said, over two years, starting this year, with up to $500 million per year ongoing. And 
this commitment was reaffirmed in budget 2021. The work needed has started and it involves many of the stakeholders and par partners that are represented here today. I know we would all agree that it's crucial that patients, their families, their caregivers, that everyone has a voice in helping to shape the national strategy. The strongest voice I've ever met in the world of rare disease advocacy to uh, improve the awareness of rare diseases and access to drugs and people who need it. He died a little bit more than five years ago. He's somebody that is probably familiar to a lot of you here today, and that's Simon Eibel. Simon was a great friend of mine. He lived a, an extraordinary life of advocacy, and he dedicated himself to the purpose and cause that so many of us here share today. Simon had MPS2, which is Hunter syndrome. He died at the age of 39, but when he was born, doctors said he would probably live until he was five, maybe six, maybe 10. So he really beat the odds. Simon taught me a lot about life. We worked together at Right to Play, which is an organization dedicated to improving the lives of children across the world with the power of sport and play, kids whose lives have been affected by war, poverty, and disease. Yeah, they lived in some of the toughest places in the world, and Simon made sure that their lives were just a little bit better. Simon taught me the value and importance of our voice, our collective voice, and how to use it to improve the lives of other people. Simon was an eternal optimist, a quick wit, an innovator, a trend center, and a great friend. I wrote this yesterday and I didn't think I was going to get all emotional, sorry. <laughs> I loved Simon and I miss him very much. I think about him often. He had an extraordinary sense of purpose and vision and I'm proud to be here today on behalf of Simon in some way. Of course, I was supposed to say that I'm here on behalf of the Minister of Health, the Honorable Jean-Yves Duclos. Sorry, I omitted that part. Sure. <laughs> sure somebody here is going to remind me of that later. <laughs> but I know that he'd be extremely proud of the steps forward that this organization is taking. So thank you for your advocacy. And thank you for continuing the good work uh, that all of you started that Simon was a part of. The vision for the government's national strategy is for all patients with rare diseases to have improved access to effective drugs and better health outcomes. In order to achieve this vision, the strategy is proposing to take action in the following areas. One, to improve access to rare disease treatments and make it consistent across Canada. Number two, optimize, collect, and use evidence that meets the needs of decision makers, along with the pharmaceutical management continuum and across the life cycle of the drug. Three, support optimal patients' outcomes and sustainability of the Canadian healthcare system by ensuring spending on drugs for rare diseases brings value for money. And four, strengthen the alignment of research and innovation systems with drugs for rare diseases across all objectives. Michelle Mujumdar from Health Canada is in attendance today. Michelle here. Hi, Michelle. And she'll have uh, the opportunity to discuss more as a panelist on progress being made on the national strategy for drugs for rare diseases. I know that we all look forward to the discussions today uh, that'll be generated from this event. I want to thank you again for your advocacy, your hard work, your research, your determination. On behalf of the millions of Canadians that live with rare diseases, who all know that rare diseases aren't rare. Rare diseases are one of the most common disease, and we should treat them as a group. I know that everybody here knows that, and that the work isn't just starting today, but it's continuing in a big way, thanks to so many great leaders. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Miigwech. Miawen. Have a great day. Notice how these podiums work for everybody, right? <laughs> the only thing I look for is something I can be seen over. So this is a thank you so much, Adam. That was so meaningful. And we know you spoke from the heart. And we know you speak on behalf of people that are living with rare diseases. So we couldn't ask for more. And we want you to continue to whisper in the ear of the minister in terms of the path that we're on. And we know that you will do that for us. So continue to be the flag bearer for Canada only wave that flag for rare diseases as much as you do for the um, other enterprises. Thank you again. Okay, go. <laughs> Ask some meaningful questions or whatever you need to do there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was inspirational. And it really does say that we are hopefully on a path that will actually do 
I mean, some of you will know, remember Simon, right? Simon participated in so many of our conferences. Simon was, in fact, truly an inspiration. But you will see today and you will hear today from many other people in the patient community, in the care community, who are also those inspirations. But they're more than inspirations. They're real people living with real conditions. They're here to be cause, not for their own sake, mostly, but really to help make sure that we've got a system in Canada that works. I think we do know that in Canada we have one of the best healthcare systems. Well, while I'm introducing the introduction, I would like to invite our first panelists up because I know some of them are on a time schedule and need to leave. So I'd like to invite Michelle Mujumdar to come up, Suzanne McGurn from Cathis, who is um, really been a champion for rare diseases from way back when she was still in Ontario at the head of the drug plans there. Carrie McElroy from Sanofi. Um, Carrie has been, again, a longtime champion of rare diseases and really as somebody who I know has been working, you know, in many different areas, but in Sanofi has been really leading some of the ways around Sanofi and Genzyme. Rudy Fernandez, who I'm happy to say I knew from before she came to Canada, but absolutely has been such a great, you know, inspiration at Takeda moving forward in terms of the industry. And um, See, David, is David going to be able to be online? Do you know? David will be here online. Can we? I don't know if we'll be able to see. I'm here. If you can hear me, I'm David here. You know, is a long term patient advocate from the Canadian Hemophilia Society who knows more about setting up health systems and more about the importance in terms of patient advocacy in there. I kind of gave this panel a bit of a context for what I wanted them to speak. But um, you will have to know is that this panel had no rehearsals. We had no pre-planning panel discussions. We kind of sent them the agenda and said, we want you to talk because we really do want to hear from them, both in terms of their expertise in the positions and the experience they bring, especially from Rudy, you know, who's coming to us, I think newly in Canada from other health systems, uh, from uh, working in Takeda in a more global position, but also from, uh, from uh, Carrie, who I think has led us through many different iterations in terms of rare diseases coming forth, and certainly in terms of Suzanne, who has, as I just said, you know, one of the uh, long-standing uh, reputations in terms of a champion for rare diseases. One of the patients said, and I say it with no, you know, a small amount of pride, that you know Suzanne was one of the first people within the government that actually listened to us, and you know remembers that well and it means so much to him. It still took some years to get to where they want it, but he really gives Suzanne the credit for having made that breakthrough for them. So thrilled that she was there, but thrilled that she's also at Cadiz now. So we're hoping that, you know, with Cadiz, we're going to be even greater partners going forward in terms of this uh, rare disease system. And Michelle Mujumdar, who I really, really respect greatly in terms of not only her past history of it, but she said to me in a phone call when we were really pushing back in terms of what the first iteration of the Health Canada proposal was, she says, we're listening, we're going to get this right. So I'm going to hold her to this because we are going to get it right. And that was the commitment. I also appreciate your coming in person. I know you were a little hesitant because you weren't quite sure whether you wanted to be in the crowd. So to be here in person means a great thing. And there's David. How are you? Can we hear you? Yes, I'm here. Happy to be with you, even at a distance. I'm a bit, I'm a bit very jealous of seeing you all there together. <laughs> well, we are really, really delighted that you made the effort and you always make the effort. As I said, David was one of, actually one of my first mentors in the patient advocacy. David and I have known each other for a good God, 30 years now. So this has been a long, maybe even more than that. It's scary. When 40 his, years, Jerham. I know his his kids and my kids used to go skiing together, you know, as children. And I remember one of the most eventful events we had was skiing in the rain in Quebec, and everybody going like, "This is great!" <laughs> but thank you very much for for making the effort. So I kind of gave two kind of scenarios here. You know, we are trying to get to a rare disease drug strategy, but I think as we have been saying over the last year and a half. It's not just getting drugs, right? We all know that even as we say, I won't say even for people in the industry, because I know for people in the industry, certainly with Decade and certainly with Sanofi, the investment has not been in just coming up with drugs, 
not just in terms of the research and development, not just in the marketing of them, but really in changing the healthcare systems that they're working in, and not just in terms of the developed markets, but also in developing markets. So we know that there is a keen understanding, and I know for many of the other industry partners that are here today, the investment is not just in developing and marketing drugs, but it really is in terms of what's needed in terms of a system in order to make sure that those drugs are going to be not only appropriately used, but effectively used. And as Adam said, it's going to be cost effective. So this is all our shared mission. And so I've invited this panel here. I, mean, I, I kind of gave two contexts. I'm not sure I even needed um, to talk about, you know, if we think about the future, and this was their thing, cast yourself into the future three to five years from now. If we are collectively successful, and I do mean collectively, what does the drug system look like? You know, and you know, the number of opportunities, I talked about the fact that look, we're gonna likely have more drugs that are coming in. There are gonna be drugs that are going to be new therapies, sometimes first therapies for a rare disease, or in many, many cases, ultra rare conditions. They may be in fact really, um, you know, breakthrough therapies, therapies that are going to use new technologies. And I see companies here that are absolutely doing that right now in terms of the kinds of technologies that are bringing in, not just gene therapies, but the mRNA therapies, the other kinds of therapies that are absolutely going across diseases. These are going to be, you know, transformational. So what are we going to do? And what we want to do is not build a drug system for today. I mean, God knows we can barely keep up with today and probably not keeping up with today. But what do we want to do to have a drug system that's going to work for tomorrow? But as importantly, what do we need to have in terms of a rare disease health system? And maybe not just the rare disease health system, but a health system for tomorrow that's going to really be able to make sure that these therapies are going to be effectively prescribed, effectively used, effectively monitored, and effectively reevaluated to ensure that we're getting what it is that we want for patients, but also for the system. I think we're all jointly committed. We need to make sure we get the best therapies to patients as soon as possible. That's the given. If that doesn't happen, and I keep saying if that doesn't happen, most of you may know the research that's you know, there, and I'll show a slide later on. If we think about rare diseases, less than 5% actually, well, about 5% have an actual therapy. Of those that have an actual therapy, in the best countries in the world, fewer than 10% of those that would be eligible for therapy actually get the therapy. And if we think about the world globally, less than 1% of people who would be eligible for the therapy actually get the therapy. And I have to back up and say, what the hell are we doing? If we're not thinking about how do we actually identify the patient, get them to the patient, monitor the patient, and make it so that it's going to be available, then we're doing a lot of stuff but it's not really having the impact. So in Canada, we're back to what do we need to have then? So I'm gonna turn it over to this panel and say, I keep talking about we wanna have a smart drug system, a health system, a smart drug system. And smart meaning it's gonna be built on smart technology, it's gonna be built with smart designs in terms of governance, it's gonna be built in smart in terms of, you know, making sure that it's not just fit for purpose. What do you think a fit for purpose rare drug system will look like? And this is a big question, but you're the right people to ask the question too. And I'm not even going to suggest who should go first. I'm going to throw it out there and whoever would like to volunteer to step up to it. What would it look like three to five years from now? What do you imagine our rare disease drug system would look like? What would our rare disease system look like in order to meet the demands of today and tomorrow? I know Suzanne just dying to speak. I almost see that. <laughs> This was uh, waiting to see who wanted to talk. <laughs> um, so first off, uh, I do just want to thank uh, Duran and the organizing committee for including us. And as she said, unfortunately, I can't stay after this, but someone from my team, uh, Lori Lambert, who you're going to hear from later, will be, will be with you all day. Um, I also just want to let you know that over the course of the last short while, I have seen Durhan in many settings internationally as well. So I just want you to know that what she does for, for all of you here in Canada, she is doing worldwide. And so the remarks that she just gave about uh, impact and, and uh, um, importance of this topic, not just here, it, it is very genuine. So um, I came without notes today, which is unusual for me, even my handwritten scribbles. So maybe just a couple of things off the top of, of, my, uh, uh, off the top of my head. 
the first thing that I was thinking about last night in preparation for today is I'd like to see a system five years from now um, where no patient or family has to feel that their critical illness time period is spent fighting or um, pursuing products that they actually feel confident that there's a system in place that will be able to make sure that products that um, deliver an impact will make their way to them without their individual intervention. I think it's, um, it's it should, we should be all aspiring that no sick patient or family needs to be worried that the system doesn't work. So that would be my first comment. Uh, the second comment that I would make is that, um, and Durhan did give us a couple of examples that Canada really is seen as a place where clinical trials and getting early um, access to, to therapies is seen as a priority, but recognizing that not all research and not all products are created equal. And so there does have to be a system of, of giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to things. And that helps with both making sure risk to patients are managed and it assists with managing um, overall budgets, value and impact. Um, I think the other thing that we need to come to terms with is uh, defining a common language for us to speak about, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, um, when I think about the time I've spent in the drug products area, you know, I've been a nurse for um, over 40 years now, and I've actually only spent about the last eight years in pharmaceuticals, and yet it feels like it's been a big <laughs> chunk of my life. <laughs> Um, and yet every time I go to an event and we have conversations and there's even one in the introduction, whether we're all using the same terms appropriately, what is promising? Is promising really an impactful change for a patient? And so, you know, one of the things that I was reflecting on with my not wanting, you know, to have families worried about whether they would get access to medicines that work is, you know, how do we make sure that the language that we're using um, that is, is evidence in based evidence informed that does not equate to a randomized control trial um, is juxtaposed against best marketing tactics. And I think, you know, what we don't want is marketing of hope where, where that's not likely yet. And so us coming up with ways to talk about hard concepts like promising and impactful uh, would be hugely important. And then maybe my last comment would be, that as we move forward, that there is a genuine belief that even in Canada, and I was really, you know, I was listening to the four bullet points that Adam gave in his introductory remarks, and they sound so easily attainable. Um, but the, in many ways, you know, there's a great deal of tension between some of those topics. But regardless of the system we have, we have a system that is um, uh, configured the way it is across our provinces and territories and our federal government. And what I'd like to say is it behooves us to find a way to make it work, mm -hmm. despite the fact that that is how our, our healthcare system is oriented. You know, we all need to go into this with our eyes wide open about what can be changed and how we can make it work versus trying to change something that's been established uh, constitutionally, at least at this point in time, because I don't know that that's a five year target. Mm -hmm. So those are my opening remarks for you, uh, Durhan. So thank you. That was absolutely amazing and certainly a great breath. Um, I'm going to see who would like to follow up with uh, Suzanne. Do you, do you agree, disagree, share that vision, have some other nuances to that system, to that vision? Sure, I can, I can follow up. Um, of course, I, you know, there's much of what Suzanne um, said that I would echo. Certainly, I could, I could pick up on the, the last part about, around the evidence, um, but uh, that's sort of taking that, that hat off. But I think for me, if I think about, you know, three to five years from now, what I hope is that there's a really solid foundation um, in place where there are some results pragmatic and achievable results that that can be can um, can be demonstrated um, and uh, I think that means that there's critical infrastructure in place to really help build for the future I think that's a key element that's currently um, missing or inadequate and I think it, it's going to help us along the way in terms of even if you think about innovative agreements and the future I think in terms of attributes of the system, I really see something that is, and I know a lot of people say this, but I really do mean it, of something that is nimble and agile and learning. I think we have to think about these next few years as an opportunity to sort of see what we can do, build, and you know, not just let be. I think it's about um, you know, constantly taking a look at what, how things are going, what's working well, what's not, and adapt. 
Um, because I think if we wait, you know, three to five years or more to sort of do that adaptation, that's going to be challenging. That's a different way of working, that sort of very nimble way. It's easy to say things about being nimble and agile are very easy, but it, it, it causes change in the way that we work. Um, and I think that's something that we're going to have to do collectively in terms of you know, to Suzanne's point about, you know, working a bit differently uh, on, on something that's, that's so complex. Um, and, I, and I hope in terms of achievable results where, again, that infrastructure is in, some of that infrastructure is in place or planned, um, and we're starting to be able to, to, um, to use it and demonstrate some value. And, and thinking of the piece that you said, uh, Durhain, that, that, you know, I think people had said was noticeably absent from the from the framework uh, was around the the timely access piece as well, and I, I think um, that's something that certainly uh, think is important. But again, it comes with that learning system. So where where might we um, where might provision or access be provided? Uh, you know, where something is quote promising. You know, what does that mean though, um, and to whom, and and how might we be able to sort of relook at this? So you know, take this chance take this risk when when um, warranted to to sort of provide this earlier or more timely access and then revisit as needed you know with the using the infrastructure that has been put in place um, to you know collect data and take a look at it not just let it sit there so I, I think that's where I see um, a strong foundation in place and already you know reaping benefits of, of some of those pieces hopefully some improved access to um to, to products uh, already and and everyone working to to be much more nimble and agile to provide that timely access so hopefully during the next two couple of days we'll really try to drill down on that i know that you're not going to be here suzanne but as you say part of some of your team is and other people here as well because i mean again those are words that you know, as much as promising what does nimble and agile mean and do we have any examples of any systems in canada that are linked to governments that are actually nimble and agile? Let me let me ask that. I'm not going to ask you to answer that question, but I'm throwing it out there. Like, do we have nimble and agile systems? Do we know how to be a learning system? I do know that some of the hospital systems are very much learning systems, and certainly we're really impressed with the kinds of advances. So if we can think about that cross, right? Others, I mean, and David as well, I don't know if you want to jump in now or you want to uh, let um, some of our industry folks go first. I can jump in now. Thanks, Johan. So looking down the road three to five years, these are some of the things I think should be in place. Um, so first of all, I think, you know, patient communities, either you know, organizations or perhaps individual patients in the, in the ultra rare space, um, they need to, to be able to present lived experience, uh, their, their, their treatment realities and their, their hopes and expectations in a, in a cohesive way. Um, you know, I think often that's misunderstood by by people who look at uh, new drugs and, and reimbursement. So that that needs to be, and, and people need support for that. Organizations of patients need support, and that can only come really from from government or from, or from pharma. Uh, these you know our communities are very small, and we're not rich, and and we don't have those resources unless they come from from government or pharma. Um, a second thing I think is needs to be in place is, is, is patient registries. You know, national when the when the groups are, are big enough, and international when when they're not. We're, in hemophilia, we're looking at uh, gene therapy as a reality in the next uh, year, really. Uh, and and uh, we we're creating an international patient uh, registry for all people who 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 receive gene therapy. That's the only way in in a, in a rare disease. Uh, with a small number of patients receiving a therapy that will start to see some of the, you know, the long-term consequences, either, whether those benefits or, or, or risks. Um, I, I know you've talked about centers of excellence and, and those are really important. Uh, without those, I don't see how uh, we'll be able to deliver uh, care to, to people. Um, you know, there, there'll be numerous if the, if the diseases aren't too rare, but if they're very rare, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to regroup uh, common types of diseases in, in, in some places in the country. Um, so we have those centers of excellence for diagnosis and treatment. Um, I, I think um, clinicians need to, to be, be better aligned um, with their patient organizations, but among themselves to take common positions on, you know, for or against 
the introduction of, of, of new drugs and, and, and if they are being introduced, how should they be introduced in a way that you can uh, you know, collect information, uh, make sure you're, you're, you're measuring the benefits and the risks. Um, and I think in terms of um, uh, HTA processes, we need to make a lot of progress and have a, a much smarter HTA process for, 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 for rare drugs. We can't just rely on the, on the, on the clinical trials. Uh, we need to look at, at real world evidence from around the world. Uh, and, and I think that's probably one of the, one of the most important ways that we can uh, get more timely access to drugs. So those are my, uh, those are my comments. Those are the kinds of things, things we need to have in place, I think, uh, to have a, a smarter and a, and, a, and a, a more nimble uh, system in the future. Thanks very much, David. And I know you speak from a long experience and also some really strong work that the Canadian Hemophilia Society, the patient community, has put into it as well as the clinical community. And certainly a living proof of what centers of excellence can look like are in fact the hemophilia clin clinics, which have been in place for a very long time. And if we had just done those you know, in other disease areas, think how much further along we would be. So I'm going to skip over then. I have actually a great pairing here because I've got Carrie from Sanofi, who's been obviously a born and bred Canadian, who's been in the system now with us for, I won't say how many years, but 21 years, there we go. And then Ruta, who's been in the industry for a good number of years across a lot of experiences, but only coming globally into Canada. So I think we'll have some great perspectives here. So, Carrie, I'm going to start with you. Sure, great. Thanks, Farhan, and thanks for including me today. And I have to, to say, I want to assure all of you, the influencer that Durhan is, and I first became very sort of ingrained in the rare disease space over 10 years ago when Durhan influenced and convinced me to go to the Arctic Circle with her, with patients with rare disease, to prove at that time that with the right support, patients with rare disease could do just about anything. And so I blindly went to the Arctic Circle with Durhan and some patients, <laughs> not prepared, not the right equipment, not the right food, but um, it, it, it was great. So she's the right person in the right voice and has the credibility and I think the collaboration across all stakeholders in the industry. So thank you, Durhan. I think, you know, from, from my perspective, there's never been a greater time to, to be in this space that we're in and to have the conversations we're having. I don't know that I can think of another single time where we've all been aligned as stakeholders across a sense of urgency and have the will to do what we need to do. And there's also some funding attached to that, and we know how important that is. So, you know, I commend uh, Health Canada and all that they're doing, and Michelle has been very open in her team on stakeholder engagement, which has been important and always hasn't been there, and Suzanne as well. And I'm encouraged by the agencies that have existed in this country that haven't always worked together and have existed in a silo system. And I don't think I've ever seen the collaboration and across all stakeholders, including industry, to come to the table. And, and we are an important partner. Um, you know, I do want to say that, Durhan, you talk about if we ever had something agile and nimble, and I would refer to our, our recent pandemic. I don't think we've ever seen all partners and all stakers, stakeholders work together and respond quickly uh, to resolve an issue. And as a result, Canadians are in a very good place and have a high vaccination rate. But it took all of us to put aside all of our pathways, all of our usual ways of doing business, receptive to talking to each other, to trusting. And I think we've set that example and there's no reason we can't apply that to Rare too, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think at the end of this, and we've said it, and, and, and I think it's so meaningful, and especially with Adam opening up and giving his personal story, that we keep patients first and their families, that we're thinking of them and we're moving in accordance to their needs and the positions that they're in. I, I can't imagine a hard struggle than some of the patients that are living with some of these rare diseases and or their children or their family. It, it's, it's pretty tough. I think it's going to be important to um, uh, include all of the province in all of this. I know that it's a, a federal ambition and I think there's inclusiveness of the, the provinces, but it has to be a pan-Canadian approach. Again, there's no one single group or, or, or frame of government that could do it any different. I'm very hopeful, as many of you know, Quebec announced their rare disease uh, framework this week, and I think it was well done, and I think it's a great starting place, and we'll encourage other um, jurisdictions to do the same, and I'm sure all of those elements will be considered by Health Canada and, and the importance of that collaboration. Um, I think there's a lot of um, optimism. I work for a global organization, and I'll tell you, and many people don't understand this, 
you know, um, the treatments that we have are delivered locally, but they're developed global, globally by multinational companies. And so Canada is competing on a global stage and global organizations are looking at what, what does good look like across the world? Um, and there's a lot of good examples in other countries. So I'm hopeful that we can take those ex examples and use what's already established, not reinvent the wheel, but take best practices. Um, I don't wanna see us just fill gaps. I think we need a system that works for this um, group of patients and the, the treatments that they need. And I think if we keep a, you know, a mindset of doing this in a very expedited way, we'll, we'll be on the right path for sure. We have to think first about getting patients uh, treatment in it, and that's, that has to be priority. Um, I think there's a lot of innovative pathways that we can take. And I think, look, I hope looking back in three to five years, we found new innovative pathways because the ones we have now won't work. The system was never set up to have the, uh, the pathways that we have as it relates to rare diseases. And so I think that will be critical moving forward. Um, I think in the end, um, you know, there's predictability would be a word that I would use. And I think all of us, all stakeholders are looking for predictability, right? We as uh, global and uh, local organizations need predictability and having a favorable policy environment and a good business environment to bring the products to patients and get them access as soon as possible. Untoward policy is not going to be helpful when you work for a larger organization looking at the entire business environment. It's critical to make sure that we, we have that space. Canada is a great country for clinical trials. We have a lot of talent. We have a lot of research here. And I think there's a lot of hope and opportunity. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it and turn it over to you, Ruth. <laughs> but I, you know, really what you said was so profound there, and you know, um, Carrie, because bridging back to what Suzanne said in the beginning, and Michelle as well, we need to be nimble, we need to be agile, we need to be adaptive, but we also need to be predictable. We also need to be stable and certainly for the patients as well, right? And I think that's the really big challenge. And I think, as you're saying, you know, what did we learn from the pandemic? Because the pandemic was not something that we actually certainly planned for. It was something we had to react to and we had to react to it in real time. And what we did see was systems, everybody from, as you say, Health Canada to CATF to the you know, clinics to the hospitals. I don't think we did a brilliant job of it, but then again, you know, we didn't have a dress rehearsal, right? You know, we kind of had to make it up as we went along. And so, you know, Canada, you know, did better than many and certainly did worse than maybe some, but you know, again, it's as you say, it was on the health system that we already had. And luckily we had a health system that was actually quite, you know, really, prepared to respond in many ways. And we also, as everybody said, saw the gaps. And moving forward, I think, as you said, let's not just fill in the gaps. Let's think about what needs to be done. But also, we recognize we're not going to profoundly restructure the entire system in order to make this. I will say rare diseases, you know, as we talk about it, I, uh, I don't know where Etienne is, but he clued me into an important statistic. And then you know that one child dies of a rare diseases every 18 minutes in Canada. If that's not a crisis, if that's not something we need to be keenly aware of, I'm not saying that what we can do tomorrow to change the system is going to keep that from happening, but that's what we've got, and that's our goal. So let, you know, let's keep in mind that we're not just talking about something that's benign. We're not talking about something that, oh, well, you know, we can kind of just muddle along and we hope that things will get better and, you know, it'll kind of work. It's not the case. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rudy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. And first, thank you for the, the invitation. Really a pleasure being here. And, uh, you know, congratulations for your leadership and your tremendous work in rare disease. You impact the globe, you know, in Aurorities, Rare Disease International, World Health Organization. And we are so lucky to have uh, Doreen with us here in Canada. So I wanted to say that. You know, when I think about the, um, the system and being in Canada, as you alluded, you know, still recently, like a little bit more than one year, I see, um, and when I imagine that for the future, I see number one, you know, we need to have long term commitment from the government. So this needs to be a priority for the country uh, and we need to hear that that commitment. Second, um, I think we need to really think about rare diseases, um, as it was mentioned, beyond the drugs and really thinking about holistically and addressing those gaps in terms of uh, gaps in terms of the availability of treatments, which is very small, less than 5%, gaps in terms of time to diagnosis, um, gaps in terms of data and evidence, which is not available in a normal clinical trial, um, and gaps in terms of time to access. 
So what can we do to invest in the infrastructure that is needed to, in fact, reduce time to diagnosis with early uh, screening, uh, reduce time to access and have regulatory pathways to enable that? Um, making sure that we leverage the benefits of the of the data evidence, we reduce uncertainties to improve patient outcomes. Um, we establish centers of excellence as similar to what Europe has established with European reference networks to increase training, disease awareness amongst physicians. Um, so to build those patient registries, and uh, Dave, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned that, I think that infrastructure is really needed to that investment so that we create uh, a rare disease strategy that is sustainable um, for the future. It's also very critical that it's really a shared responsibility with multi-stakeholders coming together uh, and we are, I think we represent that, that group already um, that is able to develop that strategy, can work on developing that plan and is able to execute that plan. And we all share that um, accountability together. I think if we, it's all about collaboration, building that trust and focus on what we want to make the most, which at the end is impacts the life of patients, of caregivers, um, and being inspired like a story that we heard um, about Simon. So I think if we have those three, long-term commitment with vision, number two, holistic rare disease uh, strategy, and number four, um, cross a multi-stakeholder collaboration with shared responsibilities to impact patients lives that was Thank perfect you. except that you just say one two and four but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> i just wanted to kind of pick up on that i thought that was kind of cute <laughs> but thank you very much so we i know we're almost out of time and i know that people have to leave and we've got another panel coming on but before i let you go i'm going to ask you two short questions i want chris responses to it right what do you think, listening to everybody and from your own perspective as well, what is the single most important thing that you think needs to happen in this next two years as we're setting up this program in order for us to be successful toward that long term vision? And number two, just quickly on a scale of one to 10, how likely is it that we're going to get it, get it right? OK, and uh, I'm going to go with David. David, I'm going to go to you first. Single most important thing we need to do in the next two years, how likely? From my experience is to improve the HTA reimbursement analysis process so that it can properly um, uh, analyze and review uh, drugs for rare diseases. And one to 10, how likely are we to get there? Not just uh, the HTA, but how likely are we gonna get in the next two years, we're gonna get this system set up right? Uh, I'm not very optimistic, so I'll give it a three. Oh no, oh God, I was thought you were the patient, I was gonna start with an optimism. All right, I need to go to somebody else here. Okay, Suzanne. Um, so actually I, I concur with our, uh, the person who's gone before me, but I would say that it's, it is contingent on better infrastructure, something that Michelle said. And I am optimistic that we will make progress on the infrastructure. So I'd probably put myself at about a six, seven and hopefully, um, as people hear um, work that CADIT is doing on the HTA space and real world evidence consistent with life cycle, people will have some greater optimism. To my American friends and my European friends in the rooms, we're Canadian. Six or seven is probably pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Well, you know, I really do think that the infrastructure is key. Uh, you know, I think it's about being setting up systems where we can sort of collect and be able to use the, that evidence and, you know, have the mechanisms in place around governance. So I would say um, investments in infrastructure are key to, to have that solid foundation, to have the sustainability. This isn't about delivering results in like just over a two year period. It's about building a system for the future. And so, um, you know, sometimes infrastructure sounds a bit boring, <laughs> but uh, it's also something that provides that stability and sustainability. I think most people who know me know that I'm uh, quite an optimist and I have the privileged position of, of sort of see, hearing all the stakeholder views. And there's a lot of alignment and there's a lot of commitment. And I think, as Carrie said, the timing is right. Um, you know, I think I said to someone recently, like, you know, now's the time to, if there isn't a time to do the hard things, um, if it's not now, then when is it? And so I would put myself, you know, much, uh, I would put myself quite high. I, I think it depends on the commitment and the adaptability of others in the system too, and managing some expectations, but certainly, you know, in the eight, nine range. 
Yahoo! Thank you very much. That's coming from Health Canada. I know you're not speaking on behalf of all Health Canada, but that's great. <laughs> Carrie. So, so for me, um, you know, I think we need to expedite access as a priority, and we need to run parallel pathways, whatever they look like, and collect parallel data, but not uh, impede patients from getting access to the treatments they need, because so many of them are timely in the progression of their disease. And so I think that has to be our priority, and then we, we work out all of the other pieces behind the scenes. And I'm, I'm saying that very simplistically, but it's not simple, as everyone on this panel knows. And for me, you know, I think I'm a bit of an optimist. Do I think we're going to get it all right in two years? Absolutely not. I, that's, I don't think that's possible, and I don't think we should set ourselves up for that real, realistic expectation. But I think there will be good progress in two years. Mm -hmm. We've already seen good progress, and no country has got this right. And so I think we have to learn from those countries. And so I think if we do everything right and the stars align, you know, I'm optimistic around a, a six or seven, perhaps, like Suzanne. But there's a lot of things in our way, and we just can't let them be barriers. We have to, to move beyond that. Thanks a lot. Okay, Rudy, you get the last word on yeah. this. <laughs> I would say, you know, things very connected between infrastructure and time to access. You know, if we fix one, you know, we get the, the you know, the other piece. Mm -hmm. So I think these two things very complementary. So on the infrastructure, of course, you know, acceptance, the evidence, reduce the uncertainties. Infrastructure also includes uh, the diagnosis, centers of excellence. So for me, this is kind of, you know, the, the big bucket. And if we get this right, you know, we can uh, accelerate time to access. Uh, I'm also an optimistic, but I also see, you know, in Canada, really a lot of potential. And I really also see that in each province, you know, we almost have pockets of the, the best that we can, you know, build that puzzle to in full transparency. When we look at Alberta with the electrical medical record, mm -hmm. Quebec, you know, just launched the, the first rare disease strategy in Canada. It's really possible. So, and you said it's the rain. We will make it happen. So I will also, you know, I will rate, you know, also as a at an eight. Wow, thank you very much. That's excellent. And I think it is we'll hopefully have more time to talk about Quebec. It's just a policy framework. So let's not sort of do too much of, you know, shooting the fireworks yet. But it is a huge start. And I would just remind everybody that in what was it, 2018, 2017, I can't remember, Ontario actually produced a rare disease strategy. And um, Suzanne, that was before your time, I think, but it was never implemented. But it's still sitting there. It was before my time. It exactly. Was before that I, day. I know, I know. And it's not your fault, so we're not looking at you. <laughs> but you know what? It's there, and it was absolutely brilliant in terms of what was there. And so if we can get it back out of the mothballs, it was never taken away. So what we need to learn the lesson in terms of Quebec as well is that it's one thing to say, here it is. It's another thing to say, and here is the actual implementation of it. And as you say, with the funding, but I'm really thrilled. Thank you so much. What a brilliant panel. You guys have absolutely. So we're sort of sitting, we're somewhere around a seven. So thanks a lot. Okay, that was brilliant. And see, you know, we wanted to get the big thinking out front. And I think we had an opportunity to do that. I'm gonna invite the next panel to come up quickly because we're gonna move very quickly into talking about a very concrete issue on patient registries. And we've got, um, uh, in, in terms of diagnosis. So we've got uh, four speakers in a fairly tight uh, time frame there. Um, we're gonna have uh, Pranish Chakrabarti, who's going to, from the University of Ottawa, CEO, who's gonna to talk to us about the newborn screening and certainly the advances that we've made. Uh, Kim Boycott from CHEO, who's gonna talk not just about genome sequencing, but I think also what is the advances are being made in terms of the uh, clinics, uh, the pilot projects that are in place. Um, Orion Buski, some of you will know, has been long time kind of coming to court and talking about an amazing program that is it's certainly here in Canada, but also available much more, more widely. Uh, Orion Buski from Phenotips, and we're going to end up with Kerr Health, uh, Don Watts, who's going to talk to us about doing and getting diagnosis into the community, into the uh, general practitioners where it's important. So I'm going to start with Pranish, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay, good. I was say, there's no computer. There's, uh... Great. Um, now, I have far too many slides. So I'm going to, I did a virtual talk yesterday, and I realized I speak slowly when I talk. So I'm going to try and speak quickly and see how this goes. All right. 
So um, I'm talking about screening, uh, really newborn screening in the context of rare diseases. Um, and so uh, Dorhain gave me some uh, talking points. I'm going to try and hit them as I go through this. Now, first, I want to talk about what is screening. And I love this slide. I made it like 10 years ago, I think. But uh, screening and diagnosis, I always like to try and um, uh, contrast them. Screening tests are about an asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic population. I want to, you know, when I saw Orion, Orion was going to be speaking here, um, one way to put this is that these are kids, uh, these are individuals without a phenotype, right? Like, so they haven't come to the system with, for any concern. They don't have any, any concerns that you can hang your analysis on. And we have the Windows logo. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, so it's, it's about an, an asymptomatic population. Oh, these are my cues uh, to what to say. Um, and uh, it, 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 it touches a population. So, you know, we're looking at people and we're going to them, right? And we're bringing them into the system as potential patients. They're not patients when they start. They're people that we're now potentially creating a health concern for. And so we're coming to them with an increased or decreased risk. And the whole point is to try and change an outcome. Right? So I was going to start with a news clip some, from CTV Toronto, but I didn't have time around the first baby found in Ontario with SMA screening. Look it up on the CTV Toronto website. They had a nice um, uh, story. That's what we're trying to do. Right Now, what are all the things that we have to think about in doing that? So screening is about testing a population to achieve a better outcome by starting treatment early in the course of disease. Diagnostic tests, on the other hand, are about a defined symptomatic population. People have come to you with a concern and confirming whether or not they have disease and defining an etiology prognosis and treatment, right? Uh, all right, this button. Okay, so to do screening, you need to do this within a system of care by definition. This is a systematic pro uh, process. And uh, Robin Hames and I, with a, with a committee in 2012, we worked together in trying to define both the definition and the system of care. Uh, and these were the five elements that we felt were the priorities, education, enrollment, and consent, screening, the screen test itself and its interpretation, retrieval, which is a really important concept, bringing that person back into the health system, right? So they're, you know, we have to go to them. Uh, diagnosis and treatment, data management and performance measurement, which we heard a little bit on the, on the earlier panel, concepts of learning health systems really come in and how do you make changes around policy setting and governance? Right. So these are all really key parts of any screening system. So I put these numbers uh, quickly together. So 2006 is when I got into the business with uh, NSO in, in Ottawa. And since that time, I went down, we have a dashboard with how many babies we've screened and blah, blah, it's on a monitor in our office. And so it was like 2.332 million yesterday. Um, I looked at my tracking. We've had about 21,000 babies screened positive and about 3,500 who've been diagnosed and treated early. So. If you think about it, we've touched 2.3 million people, and most of them don't know it, won't remember it, shouldn't know it, shouldn't remember. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say shouldn't know it, shouldn't have a memory of this, right? Uh, this should be as opaque as possible. The 21,000 minus 3,500 are the number of false positive screens, right? So say roughly, you know, 17, 18,000. Now this changes over time. I don't want you to think that's the overall PPV, but that's reality. In the last 16 years, that's how many people have had a false positive result. We might put it a different way, people we've potentially harmed. We've given them a false alarm. We may have put them through a diagnostic odyssey. We may have created uncertainty for them, right? Uh, 3,500 babies, I would say, have achieved better outcomes. You know, that's not saying that's, you know, we, we had some talk about promising and language uh, that we use. My, uh, my colleague, Beth Potter, wrote a great article in 2015 looking at uh, the language and different ways of thinking about treatment and you know transformative and incremental benefit was a concept she really teased out there um so uh, but 3500 babies we've changed the outcome in you know either massively or definitely to a significant extent right i'm not doing well am i going really fast okay so all screening programs do harm some do good as well and of these some do good more good than harm at a reasonable cost the first task of any public health service is to identify beneficial programs by appraising the evidence. And this was from Muir Gray with, uh, in Public Health in England. A uh, great book by him and Andrew Raffle. Uh, really easy to read. It's a one or two day read kind of thing. Um, but you know, pointing out that screening is not without harm, but you're, you're doing it with you know, a, a goal of a benefit and you want the benefits to outweigh the harms. 
All right. Nothing is complete in screening without referring back to Wilson and Youngner's uh, uh, treaties from 1968. It's available on the WHO website, and I would encourage everyone to read it. It's still extremely pertinent today. Um, and the 10 principles, I used to have them listed out, but they're too long to read, but you can, you can group them into concepts of the condition, the test, the treatment, and societal considerations. So we were hearing about HDA and CADF and Health Canada, uh, you know, there, you know, these are all societal considerations and we have to take those uh, uh, into account. We have to take the harms and the costs of those harms into account along with the benefits that will accrue to people uh, successfully identified through the system. Within the condition, with each of these, I just wanted to pull out a couple of key concepts. So the ability to predict natural history is massive. So if you have identified someone as being at risk for a given condition, and they have no phenotype, right? Like they have no issues. I was wondering about this when we were first starting in 2006, you know, if I got that kid with MMA and they've never been sick, how do I know they're gonna get sick? How do I predict what their tolerance is gonna be for viral illness? I had parents coming to me saying, my kid's never been sick. Why do I have to do all this stuff? Why do I have to take this synthetic formula, right? It's our ability to predict natural history. The test, a lot of things about the test, but two I wanna really uh, highlight, robustness and throughput. So if you're doing a whole population, you can't have a 5% failure rate. You know, that would be way too high. Kind of, you know, 1% failure rate would be too high. A 0.1% failure rate is too high. Uh, and you have to get the throughput. You have to be able to get this out in a timely way. Screening's all about timely access, right? Uh, access and need for secondary prevention for the treatment. So we're gonna talk a lot about access to treatment in a meeting like this. But also, do you need to start that treatment as a secondary preventative measure? Meaning that before the onset of symptoms, during a latent period, if you start treatment, you change the outcome. If you don't start treatment in that period, you don't change the outcome. That's secondary prevention. You need to know that you need to do that. And often it's hard to get that evidence, but at the same time, a lot of the innovative medicines and approaches we're talking about are going to be secondary preventative medicines, right? So that's where screening really has to be figured out alongside the eff uh, efficacy and effectiveness trials. Okay. And health economics, uh, I think many will talk about that, but also acceptability of the population, right? So are people okay with the test? Are they okay with the types of treatments you're talking about? Do, th do, do the people want this, right? That is massive. Okay. I'm pushing the button. There we go. Okay. So in 2013, we did a horizon scan. I think they're all still relevant about things that are coming. So one is point of care tests. So doing things at the bedside, especially if timeliness is so important. Uh, genomic and metabolic technologies, and we'll hear more about that. Information systems, both around health information, but learning <laughs> about sharing um, uh, decision aids. You know, how do we share information across the system? And then a new industry and health research focus on developing personalized and rare disease treatment. So these transformative treatments that we're talking about, everything from ultra orphan drugs to uh, you know, SMA, right? <laughs> Not an ultra orphan disease, but really transformative stuff has happened over the last couple of years. That's gonna, these are the things that are gonna drive screening. Okay, pushing the button. I think I'll just say next. Oh, back. Okay, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this slide, but I wanted to bring people uh, people's attention to a couple of publications recently. Uh, Don Bailey is a friend and colleague at RTI in North Carolina, and um, there with their center on newborn screening, they've done a lot of work in, over the last year uh, in looking at what are the barriers, what are the themes, uh, what are potential solutions around things that are coming in newborn screening. I participated in some of this work and was really fun, uh, you know, to participate in, and, and the, the papers do a good job of summarizing this. Themes, challenges, and potential solutions. I'll just pull out a couple. One I underlined, the infant's well-being is, is still the focal point, right? So trying to do things with the infant's well-being uh, primarily in mind. I think the promises and risk of genomic approaches, that's something we'll always end up talking about. Um, the, uh, um, the transformative therapy pipeline will challenge newborn screening capacity. So that's the last thing I'll mention on this slide is the capacity of the system to uh, incorporate new ways of testing, 
policy decision making is going to be really hard in this. So if you have a system where every two years you can consider one disease and outcome and intervention kind of you know pairing, well you know if you've got a, a pipeline of uh, uh, therapies that are coming much more quickly than that, how can you adapt? So this is massive stuff on the minds of the Americans. I don't think it's massively on the minds of uh, of Canadians yet. Okay. Um, I just took these slides from this talk I did yesterday for the CCMG meeting. Um, you know, you, you hear what's on the horizon for newborn screening. We'll be genoming every newborn. Uh, I love Gattaca as a movie, and you know, obviously it comes comes up. I'm a sci-fi kind of guy, so uh, so you know, these are just thoughts that came up for me with these. So, for what benefit and what harm? Uh, so, what are the targets, right? Why would you do this? Well, we have rare disease uh, diseases without a biochemical or other biomarker but for which there's transformative secondary prevention treatments. It comes back to the treatment. Can you change the outcome, right? So uh, another area is, or, uh, uh, is that of complex conditions with either primary, meaning you can stop the disease from ever starting. So diabetes is being discussed often in this way, right? Um, or secondary uh, prevention treatments. So how do you target an untargeted technology? And is the untargeted technology the right way to go? I think these are questions that we need to ask. Uh, the concept of diagnostic odyssey, there's always a lot of interest in, you know, genoming every newborn to try and avoid the diagnostic odyssey. But I always wonder, as I was saying with the specificity, the false positives, right? How often are you solving a diagnostic odyssey, but are you also at risk of creating diagnostic odysseys? And we see this right now, you know, we had a kid screen positive last week for citral anemia, they have persistent high citrullines, they, you know, but they're not sick, right? They almost certainly have a disease. Where's their risk? Are they going to get sick in the next day, in the next week, in the next month? Are we going to have to treat or not treat? You know, we may have just created a patient that never was going to be a patient, right? And we have this all the time with across all the diseases that we screen. And with the use of increasing use of genomic technology, we're doing that with diseases for which we're doing sequencing at a later stage of the screening already. Right, so how are we going to deal with uh, you know balancing this? Uh, so specificity is not 100 percent. Sensitivity is also not 100 percent. You're not going to pick up all kids. And newborn screening has always been predicated on an underlying assumption, often unsaid, often spoken, that sensitivity is 100 percent. You're going to pick up all kids who need treatment. And do we want the data to be available for reanalysis and reinterpretation? Uh, you know, others are much more expert on this, but Talking to Peter Ray, who was in Toronto, retired now like 10 years ago, uh, you know, I was saying, you know, Peter, let's genome every kid and let's store the data in these data centers. And then when you need it, the kid comes in, you can access it right away. And he's like, you know, Pranish, yeah, DNA is a great storage da data storage medium. And we're getting better and better at retrieving the data in better detail and really fast. You know, why don't we just use that storage medium, uh, you know? It was, it was like, oh, okay, let's think about it. And there's an increasing literature on the cost and carbon footprint of in silico storage access and computing, whereas we do have a really good way of storing that information and retrieving it. Anyway, things to think about. So the last part, uh, I call it tricorders and the needs for speed. I just can not put this in. So I love Star Trek. Um, and so, you know, if we want to get, if we want to treat, start treatment in a period where we can make a difference, there's really two concepts here, I think. One is, you have a latent period where you, you, know, you can do that secondary prevention treatment and really change an outcome. And can you catch that latent period fast enough? So I mentioned citral anemia. This is a disease, a urea cycle disease where kids can get sick very quickly in the neonatal period, usually the first week or two of life. Um, well, then you have to have a result before they start getting sick. So how can you get a result really quickly? One, I called it tuning the existing system. These are some communication and, and um, you know, um, uh, uh, change management tools. We have to make sure people taking samples and getting, to the, and getting them to us or getting them to us really quickly. The second is you could start thinking about doing point of care screening. These are pictures of my kids uh, getting some, you know, CCHD screening with pulse oximetry and their hearing screening. I think the other is when does the pathology really start? And I think that's a question this room is going to have to really start thinking about. A lot of the diseases we're talking about are probably even before neonatal onset, they're probably fetal onset. So SMA, I think, is an excellent example. Uh, Pompe disease, a kid I have with Pompe disease that we're treating. We actually, you know, we're working with the group in USCSF that's doing in utero enzyme replacement therapy trials. And this kid was actually treated 
uh, in utero is doing way better so far. You know, we don't know the long term. There's a lot of research needed here. But when does the pathology actually start? All right, I'm not going to dwell on the slide, but just saying that advances in any of these boxes will have a major system impact for all the other boxes. Okay, so you have a transformative treatment, you need to figure out how to screen. You have a new technology for screening, you have to figure out how to diagnose, et cetera. So these things are completely interrelated. These are again pictures of my kids. Okay, what is Canada doing together? In, uh, I know we have, um, we're in Ottawa and we have federal government people here. Um, I gave a talk to Health Canada uh, Scientists Symposium a while ago, but the federal government in Canada has not really had a role in the, in the area of screening. There has been effort at provincial cooperation. These are just screen captures from the last major effort. This was when in Ontario we had just started, launched a newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiencies and our health minister at the time, Deb Matthews, I was riding up in the elevator with her for a, you know, announcement and she said, um, why aren't we offering to help other provinces since we've got all this in place and couldn't we just take sample? I said, well, that's all pretty complicated, but we should all be working together to try and move the needle ahead more in sync with one another. So she actually put on the agenda. We had like two good years of work with the um, uh, provincial territorial table. There was a lot of level setting done. Cord was, you know, sent a copy of the final report. And then Justin Trudeau was elected and everyone wanted a new health accord. So the provincial territorial ministers forgot about this work. <laughs> That's my kind of cynical way of looking at it. Um, but I think there is a role for interprovincial cooperation. I think there is a role for uh, the federal government to be able to play. We wrote a paper on this 20 years ago, I think, on ideas uh, on how in a federal system you can do this. Um, I'll just end here. So MDC being Muscular Dystrophy Canada, I don't know if Homira or Stacy are here, but um, you know, uh, when they were asking, how can we in, you know, increase the speed of implementation of SMA screening? Yeah, I'm done on, after this one. Thanks, Terry. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I said, one thing we really need to do is have a better way to share information across the screening programs. It doesn't have to be governmental but even at the level of the screening programs in each province and the policymakers at each province, what can we do? So they actually provided some funding uh, that will help us. And we're having our first meeting next week um, of all the newborn screening programs in the province, uh, in the country, to start talking about how can we do this on our own. Um, I think it's a good first step. And that's it. I'll be next, slides coming up. Excellent, thanks everyone. And thanks to Hain for uh, asking me to speak today. Um, I just have a few slides less than Pranish over here um, to talk about the di diagnosis for all, right? And so we're gonna focus on the genome sequencing that he introduced um, where we're really looking at people who are present or children, uh, youth and adults who are presenting with symptoms for the first time. So clinical genome wide sequencing means two things, either, either sequencing the most important protein coding part or the whole darn thing. Um, and it is a several thousand dollar test. Um, but we have known now for nine years that this is a pretty awesome test. It's the best test genetics has ever seen. Um, and it offers a diagnostic rate anywhere between 25 to 60%. Um, and it is only offered right now in this country to um, children, youth, and, and adults who have very clear symptomatology. So it's not a screening um, test like we just talked about with Greenwich. In 2015, we put out the um, Canadian guidelines on how we should use this. And I want to just tell you how, how it is we got to here. And it's taken a long time, as all things that need an HTA generally take. So in 2020, we put together this slide. And this was looking at, um, you know, the population across the provinces and the territories, as well as in the bottom, you can see, like in Ontario, 800 um, individuals per year were getting this test. Quebec, zero. Uh, you know, 30 in Newfoundland, you can sort of look across. Um, and so there are about 1200 people a year getting this test and all of these were going out to the United States. And this was like this until 2021. 
um, which indicates A, there's an access problem because 1,200 is not enough, and B, we weren't even doing it in the country. <clears throat> so what happened? is that um, Genome Canada came in with um, their uh, uh, genomic application uh, partnership program called GAP and said, we need to start to deliver on the promise of precision medicine for rare disease. And we need to start to enable these ministries of health across the different jurisdictions to do this test for us. Um, and so this is where we've started. Um, now, you can say, okay, that's fairly simple. So we need provinces, we need territories. Um, but within each of those, like look, for example, in Ontario, there are multiple um, health jurisdictions, multiple decision makers. Um, <clears throat> and so across the country, that is a very similar thing, which brings in some of our challenges. Uh, but either way, we have now funded coast to coast, uh, these programs, uh, which probably to collectively represents about 20, $25 million. Um, and all these sites now are trying to deliver this bring this technology into the provinces and deliver it to the right patients. This is Ontario. This is the one I lead with Martin Somerville from SickKids. You can see uh, on the left, all the sites. Uh, CHEO, my institution, is looking after the purple. SickKids is looking after the blue. We have access, you know, it, it is across the, the, the province. We can have existential arguments about whether or not that's everyone. And on the left, or sorry, on the right, you can see we've now sequenced over 2,000 individuals in one year. 97% um, of these are reported in 12 weeks. When we were sending them out of the country, we were waiting six to eight months. And 32% of patients are getting a diagnosis. So one year in, the one in Ontario is the one that's furthest along so far in the country. It's, it's been an exceptional experience. So what we're trying to do now is bring all of these programs across the country under one umbrella. Because as we've Pranish alluded to with newborn screening, as well as many of the other centers of excellence things we're going to talk about today, um, it's, it's a ground up kind of kind of challenge, right? Um, and so we need to do these four things uh, in order to for this test to be excellent everywhere in Canada. Uh, first is quality; it has to be a great test, no matter where you get it. In Canada, we have to share data. As Pranish alluded to, the reason we don't genome all babies is because we don't know what to do with the data. We can't interpret it. We're actually really naive. Um, so even for even in instances where um, the individuals being sequenced have clear things, we can't interpret all of that. So without sharing it across all the places, the test won't be as good. Uh, we need to work with health eco uh, economics and policy so that we are making sure we have access to all Canadians in a fair and equitable way. And finally, no matter where that individual is seen, that person needs to be able to share their data for research if they wish. So it, even if you're like in Timbuktu, if you're interested in research, you should be able to be able to share your data and not just because you're seen at a center where there's a bunch of researchers that would be happy to have your data. So this is the all for one, what we call it now, data sharing and research strategy. This is also a Genome Canada project um, that which is funded. It's for about a million dollars. I lead it from Ottawa, but it includes the entire country. And we have a goal that's twofold, uh, facilitate high quality clinical genome wide sequencing as standard of care for all Canadians and provide access to precision health research for Canadians with rare disease who want to participate in that. So it's a two-pronged solution we're trying to develop. One is um, a Canadian variant database for quality type purposes that the clinical labs all connect to, where we can leverage each other's data in a very safe way. And the second is called Connect. And what that is to do is an opt-in contact registry for REB approved research projects um, for families with rare disease. So that would include um, natural history studies, finding you for clinical trials, sharing your data if you're not, if you don't have a diagnosis, so someone can try to find your gene that might be causing X, Y, Z, all that sort of thing. And how the patient uh, family experience would look like is basically um, outlined on that diagram. Um, so clinical assessment, you access the system, um, you are giving consent to have genome-wide sequencing uh, for you or your family member. And you, at that time, are acknowledging that the data is going to be shared across the clinical system. And if you wish, you're consenting to recontact. Um, and so if you consent to recontact, you end up in the All for One Connect network, which we're going to build over the next couple of years, um, where data is deposited and centralized and you become findable for research studies. 
And as you go through your clinical test, your data, you're acknowledging that your data is going to be shared in a very protected way across the country, um, all coded, of course, but to help the interpretation of the test for, for a child from Vancouver, for example, um, because that's, that's, um, that's a really important contribution, I think, that families can make. Um, and so with that, um, I'll just end on sort of saying, you know, we've got these ideas um, uh, around the, these two platforms. I think they fit into the theme of what we're talking about today is how do we deliver, how do we diagnose people to be able to move them into accessing the appropriate treatments, accessing research, et cetera. And when we think about these centers of, of excellence, how do we take the existing infrastructure we've seen, including what I've just presented, and put it into this overarching concept so that we are then interlocking all of these different parts into something that's much more top down which is always a challenge i think we've had uh, and we tend to be bottom up right but we have to have this overarching concept and this is one of the things that would contribute okay thanks Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Orion Buskey. I'm the CEO of a startup company here in Toronto called Phenotips. I, it's been my pleasure to stand up here or be invited to stand up here uh, in the past. It is great to see people again. This is the first time I've been out to a conference in a couple of years. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure. And also a pleasure to be able to talk to everyone about a topic that's dear and true to my heart, uh, which is around phenotyping. Um, this is the focus of a lot of the work that I spent uh, my PhD working on and then ends up being a focus of what we're doing at the company. So uh, very excited to talk to people a little bit about this. It contrasts with some of the talks that we've just been hearing, which are very much big picture and top down. Um, I think this is we're going to get into the weeds a little bit here um, in terms of focusing on a very particular problem around the delivery here. Um, but ultimately, the goal is around how do we provide a timely and accurate diagnosis here. Uh, genome sequencing, as we've heard and know about, allows us to diagnose thousands of different conditions with a single test. It's really a remarkable uh, technical capability. But the reality is it's not really a single test. It's a whole bunch of them, thousands or millions, all happening in parallel. And it's really, really important for us to know when we're doing diagnostics which of those tests are relevant for the particular patient that is there in front of us at that time. So I think the key message here from, from at least our perspective is that the patient phenotype is what is important for driving genomic diagnostics. And what we've seen over the last you know, decade of rolling out this test from research into clinical practice is that it is part of the standard of care here. This is what is expected. If you are ordering an exome or a genome, you need to have the patient's clinical presentation, their family history and their phenotype coded and available for the actual analysis. It is part of that informatics pipeline that drives our ability to run these tests and interpret the results. And labs, a lot of times, have to go back and ask for more information if it isn't provided. Um, and what we're trying to do is sort of build some of the infrastructure to help, help solve that in practice. So uh, the minions are dear and true to my heart. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what is a phenotype. So technically, a phenotype is the set of observable characteristics. If we had a cute minion in front of us, we might say this one has one eye, it is maybe a little short, uh, it has yellow skin or jaundice, uh, it has maybe some sparse scalp hair and a conspicuously happy disposition. When we're building informatic systems, it's really important for us to be able to have the computers understand what we mean when we say those particular words. And there's a really powerful terminology, what we'd call an ontology, that has now become the standard of use within genomics. It started in genomics research way back in, I guess, 2009. Uh, Peter Robinson started this ontology. Uh, he's now at the Jackson Lab. It has expanded. It's now sort of adopted by the Monarch Initiative and is part of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. It is, I would say, the standard for describing 
a patient's clinical presentation today. And it is what is used at the end of the day when you're doing all of the genomic interpretation, you're writing your algorithms, you're figuring out what in the genome is actually relevant. This is the terminology that ends up getting used. And it's a structure, it's sort of like a tree, but in computer science, we put our trees upside down. So the top of it is just saying, you have something sort of abnormal um, or, or uh, atypical, and then it breaks out into the different sort of biological sort of organ systems, like eye, eye conditions or neurological conditions, and you could break in more and more specific and get to like three, four syndactyly on the right hand is a particular term within this terminology. And the real power comes from the fact that these are associated and there are links that are curated from the literature, from researchers, from mining all of the publications about the associations between these particular clinical presentation features and all of the rare diseases that we know about and all of the common diseases that we know about. And those databases and associations are growing and it increases our ability to use computers to help solve these problems. So this structured data, what we talk about is structured data, where we're using these sort of concepts rather than just text, rather than like messy human language, we're trying to help computers help us. And in particular, when we're talking about phenotyping and we're talking about rare disease diagnosis, this comes in in three main areas. One is the actual diagnosis. There we're leveraging things like the association between, associations between the phenotype, that clinical presentation, and diseases. There's the actual genome analysis, which the labs are doing and a lot of researchers are doing and the clinicians are doing in their interpretation where we're looking at the phenotype associated with the genes. And then there's matchmaking, which is where we're looking for maybe second families who have a similar clinical presentation. And there what we're looking at is the phenotype of one individual with the phenotype of another. And how do, how do we compare those? But having this data in structured ways allows, computer, allows us to teach computers to help us with these problems. So the company that I work with uh, is called Phenotips. So we're trying to build the digital infrastructure for genomic medicine and get this out into the clinic, into hospitals around the world. Um, so we have a platform that integrates with, but sits alongside electronic health record systems and sort of supports genetic counselors and specialists like geneticists in their ability to care for patients, in particular around sort of the interoperability of the data, making sure that we get the structured data uh, into the healthcare system at the point of care so that it can go through to research. Uh, and then the workflow efficiencies around how to actually do that in practice um, while making sure that we're uh, being helping to avoid double entry of data and other sorts of things that introduce errors into the process and ultimately are a risk to patient safety. So just to highlight a couple of the features that we've built out over the years, but broadly, what we're trying to do is build tools into this platform to help doctors actually record these clinical presentations in a way that then computers can use and that can be shared uh, interoperably with other systems. So this includes like just smart search capabilities. There are 13,000 different terms. Uh, clinicians want to be able to find the right ones quickly. Uh, the ability to take measurements that are already being generated and maybe are part of the electronic health record system and actually immediately associating those with the clinical terms so that that can power other suggestions. And actually now more recently, the ability to take text and suggest terms. Um, we're very big, I would say, on the idea that the data needs to be curated by a, a clinician. Um, there are some tools and some research projects out there that are trying to do this totally automated, um, but the state of the technology, I guess I would say, is such that it's really important that a healthcare <laughs> provider actually look at this because it does impact the actual analysis at the end of the day. And so this is sort of what we've these are the things that we've rolled into what is the genomic medicine platform that has this phenotyping at its core. And we started as a research project between Sick Kids Hospital, uh, the Genome Diagnostics Lab, and the University of Toronto, a bunch of computer scientists just across the street um, way back in 2012, um, and have been building this out and expanding it and trying to provide access to this uh, since then. But broadly, we try to roll in this phenotyping with family history, which is incredibly important, uh, as well as the patient's genotype, in order to help suggest diagnoses from different rare disease terminologies and genes that might be implicated in the patient's condition. 
all of that then is helping to build basically an ecosystem where we're collecting at the point of care structured clinical information that can then be used for for actually diagnosing that patient in front of you, as well as then powering this ecosystem as sort of research and matchmaking uh, that ultimately then uh, leads to more diagnoses for more people um, and better understanding the different rare, rare genetic conditions um, that are out there. So I also want to put in a little plug, uh, the May 2020 two special issue on human mutation just came out, uh, which had profiles, uh, the matchmaker exchange and sort of an update on that. Um, and Kim wrote, I think, the, the intro with a few other people. It's a great read to sort of talk about what's going on in that um, matchmaking space. So I would encourage people to check that out. And I think that's it. So thank you uh, to everyone here and to everyone who's helped make this what it is. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Don Watts. I'm the president of Cure Health, uh, another startup, uh, Ontario-based. Uh, really want to thank uh, Drahane and, and Cord for uh, allowing us to be here. It's an, it's an honor to be up here with you guys as well. Um, just uh, to start things off, um, maybe you can put up the first slide. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on the roots and the origins of Cure Health, because um, it's, really, it's really interesting and meaningful, I think, that you'll find that our, one of our founders, um, who at the time was a senior vice president at Shoppers Drug Mart, who had recently acquired QHR, and he was the lead on that, so the Acuro EMR, um, was also at the time going through a diagnostic odyssey that we all know well with his mother. And uh, over the course of about two years, she was finally diagnosed with myelofibrosis. And at the time, with his knowledge of the electronic medical record, um, you know, he and, and his understanding of some of the new technologies that were available, he said, you know, that should not have happened. The data was there. And um, had we had the technology to analyze and interpret the data to support the physicians who were, who were taking care of his mother, and this was you know, five or six specialists over the course of two years, she would have been diagnosed sooner. And um, so uh, you know, that's, that's how CURE started. We, we hired, uh, this is a, a year or so before my time with CURE, I've been at CURE a couple of years now. Um, uh, we hired a, uh, a brilliant uh, artificial intelligence uh, machine learning engineer from, from McMaster and built a platform that could house an algorithm for myelofibrosis. And uh, every physician that we work with now, we're working with uh, almost a thousand physicians now, mainly in primary care, starts with myelofibrosis as their first uh, uh, pathology that they go through. So I just wanted to let you know that. I, I didn't know if you, you all knew our origins. I know Cure Health has presented in the past at CORD. Um, but it's really meaningful, I think, to me and, and uh, to how we started as a company uh, for the right reasons. Um, so if you go to the first slide, I really, you know, I, I, some of these you've seen before. Um, I really want to talk about just the fact that, um, you know, if 50% if, if of rare disease patients are diagnosed, there's 50% that aren't. And I think we need to think about those. I know we're here to talk about a rare disease drug strategy. Um, that mainly serves the people that are already diagnosed. So there's a lot that are suffering. Our goal at Cure Health is to end uh, that suffering and, 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 and with earlier diagnosis with amazing technology. Uh, we've been uh, operating for about four years, two years commercially, and uh, we're off to a great start. We have over 100 rare disease algorithms now on our clinical decision support platform that physicians are using. Um, they're not all perfect. And uh, I think, Drahane, you, you mentioned at our last conference, uh, you'd like to hear about how they're validated. I'll talk a little bit about um, how we create algorithms, but they're not validated. You know, it, it, they're continuously improving. And if you understand, and hopefully after this uh, presentation, you'll understand uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, in particular natural language processing, a little better, um, you'll realize it's in a, constantly in a state of continuous improvement, whether the machine is teaching itself and retraining itself, or we are through a supervised way, which is really what we're doing at Cure Health. Um, so again, that, that data, massive amounts of data, unfortunately on interconnected systems is sitting idle. Um, and, and we help physicians put that data to good use, help them ideally be better physicians ultimately. Rare disease, as you know, is an area that very few physicians are trained on. So we also provide a lot of education for, for physicians. And we're working in specialty as well. And we're starting to develop not only a primary care platform that houses, you know, hopefully someday thousands of algorithms, um, but also working in specialty and creating customized specialist specific platforms, say for cardiology, um, hematology, et cetera. Next. I can control these. Um, 
So AI, I, I'll, I'll use a, a clinical intelligence and clinical decision support interchangeably. We're doing a lot more than just clinical decision support. I, I'll try not to talk too much about the other things because we only have 10 minutes, but I think about clinical trials as well. Very easy for us to write a, a, an algorithm that's very clear on, with inclusion exclusion criteria and push that out to our cloud-based uh, users uh, to identify patients who may be uh, eligible for screening in a clinical trial. Obviously, we, we need to follow uh, privacy regulations appropriately and with consent, et cetera, but, but that capability is there as well. If we talk about imagining five years from now, imagine a fully connected healthcare system with a cloud-based platform that is EMR agnostic, which CureHealth's platform is, connecting everyone from a reporting perspective, from a capability to push algorithms out, updates when new guidelines come out to physicians. Obviously, there's implications beyond rare disease. Um, we, can, we can also obviously write uh, clinical algorithms to support physicians and chronic pathologies and day-to-day -day, uh, um, pathologies that they're encountering. So it's really about identifying potential risk. We're not diagnosing anyone with this technology. I make that clear. Identifying potential risk. We're also trying very hard not to create um, uh, the diagnostic odyssey for, for patients. So we work extremely hard at, at getting the algorithms optimized so they're extremely tight. So we're only putting patients in front of physicians that make sense. They hit and have all the primary criteria of a particular pathology and they need further investigation. And that further investigation may be genetic testing. It may be a panel of, of labs. Um, and our goal is to ultimately get the right patients moving along the care pathway towards the right care. It's interesting, in fact, that a lot of the algorithms we write for certain pathologies, patients end up getting diagnosed for other pathologies that that are very, very similar. And we may just not have written the algorithm for that particular uh, pathology that's close. Uh, a few of the things we do as well are we offer um, streamlined workflows. So if we do encounter a patient that is a candidate for further investigation for, for a particular pathology, we've pre-populated referral forms with the right reasons of why I am referring this patient so the doctor can quickly just check the, the various uh, reasons that are uh, um, apl applicable to that patient, along with pre-populated lab requisitions, because most physicians don't know what labs to order for some of these pathologies, particularly the genetic test, um, but certainly if it's a panel of labs. Along with that, um, they don't know where to send them, so they don't know which specialist to send them to. And you can imagine the waste that's created in the system if they're sending to, say, for a, a, um, a rare form of kidney disease, they're sending the patient to their tried and true nephrologist when it should be going to the one that actually wants to see these patients and has knowledge about those patients. So we're saving patients time, we're creating efficiency in the system. Um, many rare disease patients are likely creating some of the wait list challenges because they're bouncing around the system with this seven to eight times seeing specialists and, and we can help with that as well. And physicians really appreciate that, the knowing who to send the patient to what labs to order, which specific genetic test, where can I get the test done in, in Calgary, or Edmonton, or Vancouver, or Toronto. The other aspect of our business or our, our offering is, is not just the product and the technology, but also a service. So we have clinical specialists who are MDs who support physicians through education of, of pathologies and through understanding patients that are identified and helping them get the patient on the next best step in their care. Um, the the uh, typical approach for us is to work with physicians once a month or once a quarter, uh, looking at five to six uh, pathologies that we've written algorithms for and helping them with the patients that have been identified. We certainly don't expect physicians to go through hundreds of different pathologies on their own that they uh, have not been trained on, so we provide that service as well and it's really appreciated. In terms of the kind of the magic of, of what we do, it's really in the natural language processing. That, so that's the uh, form of machine learning. It's like speech recognition, only using text. And, and Orion talked a bit about uh, um, text. Uh, we are understanding the context of the words, not just the words. We're identifying no or not before the word we're looking for. So we're looking for phenotypes. We're looking for symptomatology. We're looking for clinical manifestations. We can read everything in the EMR. Uh, including specialist reports, which is really, really where there's a great deal of information. It all comes back to primary care. Again, we're not just working in primary care, but primary care is where the data cl uh, clusters. Um, and uh, what we're doing essentially from, a, from an AI perspective is we're identifying the features and patterns of, of, of the particular pathology, and we're writing code to identify those features and patterns if they exist in the electronic medical record. And we're looking at that data over the course of a patient's life 
So imagine the challenge as a physician to think about uh, and, and identify um, a patient that they've just received in their practice with all their medical records and having to go back through all that data to connect the dots to realize that may be a rare disease patient, or even just a physician managing two or 3,000 patients. Really challenging, and um, particularly with insidious and, and diseases that affect multiple systems. So um, this is where AI can really help with that, and, and we are. So in terms of algorithm development, what we, where we start is again that the research literature will will uh, take all the unstructured data that's in the EMR and, and write code to structure it for a specific purpose. Um, we work with specialists to, uh, to analyze our logic of the algorithm that we've created before we code the, the, uh, the algorithm. Um, then we will deploy and test in test data sets, and we try our best to test in multiple data sets that are, that are potentially different from each other in terms of populations or race and ethnicity um, to remove as much bias as we possibly can. And, and then we deploy across our install base of physicians and we continually learn as we go um, uh, and continually retrain the algorithms as we identify false positives and the algorithms get tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, we're currently, we currently have reached into 4 million patient records in Canada. So, and we're growing quite quickly. So the opportunity for us to, to uh, help with patient care is potentially dramatic. So just a quick, quick look at uh, the list of the pathologies we do have. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so we won't leave it up too long, but you can see that we're starting to build uh, as well specialty specific areas. You can see in hematology, we've got over 20 pathologies in that space now. They're designed for primary care. If we were to work in hematology, we would need to design and make some tweaks to them for the particular data and there's usually additional data that specialists would have, as you know. And finally, during <laughs> last slide, I, I wanted to just show you uh, some evidence that's very recent that we presented. And this is for a chronic disease, um, but I think it's very meaningful to show the impact that this technology can have at scale in improving or changing practice at management and potentially outcomes at the end of the day. So this was a, a, a project that we did in chronic kidney disease where we wrote an algorithm to identify five-year risk of end-stage kidney disease. So patients had a greater than 1% chance of progressing to end-stage kidney disease and were not on guideline-directed care. Uh, essentially, in this case, they were missing uh, most likely an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, we screened 182,000 patients in about two months, patients' records. Um, we're now at about 340,000 with this particular project. Um, and the really interesting, and I think we identified 6,500 patients who were potentially at risk in a risk stratified way. We're not saying every patient needs to be analyzed doctor. Um, we generally focus on the high risk patients. Um, and doctors actioned in a 45 minute session with our clinical specialists, almost 30% of those patients immediately actioned along the care pathway. That may have, may have been updated EGFR or UACR. It may have been changing their therapy right then and there because they were missing an important part of the, the, the new guidelines uh, medication. So, just wanted to show you the impact that this can have. Imagine the, the cost savings as well, along with the, the live save that this could have if everyone was using this type of technology, um, if it's done well. So uh, I'll end there. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much. And unfortunately, we don't really have time for Q&A. We actually didn't build it into these first two panels. So it's not like we're not uh, um, aware of it. Hopefully, I think Pranish and uh, Kim are going to be around with us. And we've got some other panels in which they're on. And I know Orion and uh, Don are going to be here. And we'll hope, what I want to say is that uh, we're going to open up in terms of the next sessions for really engaging audience or participants here. We've got uh, people on the chat um, that have already been putting in questions, so the chat line seems to be working there well. So you're going to have an opportunity to bring in people virtually, as well as we've got two mics in which we're going to encourage people to have an opportunity because we're going to change the uh, the setup a little bit here. Some more presentations that are going to take us through patient registries, looking at um, specialty clinics, clinic centers of excellence that are currently working, but also talk a bit about what's happening on the global scale. So hopefully we'll have got a little bit more relaxation in a time frame that will allow us to have some real engagement and participation. Really want to say, when you look at a panel like this and hear this panel, this is what we're talking about in terms of having a smart health system. And I really, you know, you know, these are the basics that we're going to build on. Great from, you know, certainly everything from the genetic uh, testing point. You, you know, 
I don't mind you're taking a while because we've been trying to get Pranish to speak for us for like the last five years. And, <laughs> and he says, keep trying, I will show up eventually. So I'm so grateful and actually to see how much is advanced in terms of the program, but especially the fact that, you know, they said, look, give us a little money, we'll take it on ourselves to try to bring these programs together. That is so essential. And we're seeing that happening globally, we're seeing that happen. And as you know, the EU now is trying to come together to get consistency around newborn screening right across Europe. So it's not just a Canadian problem, but the science and the applications have so far, you know, kind of exceeded what our systems are doing. And certainly when you heard with Kim in terms of genome sequencing, you do know that Kim is probably one of the premier researchers and clinicians in this area. Um, you know, I was listening to the Jubilee and when I was in Europe just now, and they were talking about they had these people in Europe, in, in UK, they're called national treasures. Isn't it amazing to get an official designation of being a national treasure? And I will have to say is that Kim is one of our national treasures. So, you know, if we had a designation, I mean, really people that are breaking ground. So really want to thank, and then we can see what's happening with some of the somewhat private, but also privately towards the public in this initiatives between Cure Health and what's happening with Orion and Phenotips. And we love having Orion speak because Orion is just so engaging. So thank you again very much for a very charming presentation. And we will come back. And unfortunately we do have to come back in like three minutes. So you've got to scramble, okay? <laughs> thank you very much. I'm at the podium. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. I'm sure one of them will work. Unless you put your finger on in front of it. Although I do everything. You do. The sheep, behind the scenes, on all the webinars, the facilitator, the IT, the anything, you name it. It does it all. I started it. So I'm actually Actually, I need a coffee. A real good coffee. How do you think? Yeah, you want to 
I am so sorry, but I need to bring people back. If you need to get coffee, if you need to go to the washrooms, we would invite you to do that individually anyway. So if I can get people to come back to their chairs. you to come back please those of you who are standing up do me a favor and help shepherd people back to their seats Michelle shepherd people you're good at shepherding yeah, you're a sheepdog shepherd people get people back to their seats <laughs> yeah exactly places places shepherding we need people to come back to their seats I need a belt exactly Okay, we're going to get started again and we're going to go into 
the beginning of our a little bit of a transition into actually um, the building blocks in terms of the infrastructure. So we've been talking infrastructure. I'm so thrilled to hear people kind of reinforcing the importance of developing that infrastructure and building on what we have. So the next sessions are actually going to talk a bit about registries and real world data, what exists now, how we're actually collecting that, and how we're actually transforming the data being collected. And then we're going to have a lunch break in which we're going to be able to hopefully network the way we've been doing now, which is really important, as we say, and people getting back together in real life. And then in the afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to really delve, you know, do a deep dive in terms of the, um, the patient program. So we're going to start with, um, if I can, I think Pam is online. Ah, there she is. Hi, Pam. Thank you so much. Pam, I will do the apologies for Pam so she doesn't have to do the apologies. Pam was on schedule, had rearranged her entire life to be able to be with us here today in real life, because she's going to do for us two things, talk about the patient registry, but also coming back to talk about the centers of excellence that uh, NORD has put together in the US. Pam is vice president in uh, of National Organization for Rare Disorders, which is our big sister organization in the US. Unfortunately, Pam was not able to be able to uh, to travel here in person, but is making the big effort to be with us online. So I'm going to turn it over almost immediately. Pam was with us earlier on. Those of you who were at a webinar earlier on know that Pam talked about the program in NORD in terms of setting up patient registries with patient organizations. So Pam, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you so much for being able to, to join us, uh, at least so far. Rahan, thank you so very much. I, I do have slides. I don't know if it uh, makes sense to share them um, or, or just uh, discuss. It's, it's really up to you all. I presume you can hear me okay. We have been doing slides, so Pam, we can show your slides. All righty. So I can either share my screen. Would that work? Yes, that will work. Okay. So goodness gracious, let's see if I can get this right since I've misplaced my passport. Pam didn't actually, I didn't actually say what the reason why she wasn't here. She actually misplaced her passport. She can't travel across the border. So this is the reason why she's doing this virtually. Those of us who have not traveled for a while know how that is. My first trip back over to Europe, at least one of my first trips, I realized I'm going to Barcelona. I'm sitting in the Amsterdam airport in a transition. I had no wallet. I had no credit cards, no other ID. The only thing I had was my passport, which got me to the airport and to Amsterdam, but I had nothing else. So we realized, you know, those of you, we're used to traveling, right? We got everything on hand. We know what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Now we realize that we don't. So here we are, but thank you, Pam. I put it in a safe place mid pandemic saying, why do I need to carry this with me all the time? I'm not going anywhere immediately. And then, Two days ago, I couldn't find it. So I was on, on the horn with Air Canada saying you wouldn't believe what I just did. Um, anyway, so I apologize and thank you so very much for the opportunity to accommodate me remotely. Um, I uh, do miss seeing everyone and I'm, um, uh, I'm watching from afar, I'm anxious for the next time. Now that I have my points in my Air Canada Bank, I have to come and visit as soon as I get my replacement passport. Um, can you all see my slide okay? Yes. In, um, in presentation mode, as many of you know, I can't see anyone, I've lost that capacity, but let's, let's go. Um, really thrilled to be here. Uh, most of you who will work in the community know who NORD is. We're fortunately gonna be celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. So um, a lot of um, uh, history and, and um, the honor to work with our sister organization and under Durhan's leadership at court. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm going to speak a bit, uh, not too much because we have some really exciting panelists that want to share um, what they're doing in the field of registries and real world, world data. But I wanna share with you a little bit about what NORD is working on. Um, we have a program called I Am Rare, and uh, we've been working on this program for um, uh, what, when I count the years, many more years than I originally thought, uh, really to empower uh, 
the rare disease community, especially patient advocacy groups and organizations, PAGs, um, to become research ready and accelerate um, therapy development from their perspective. So some of the priorities um, that were important for us to consider in developing and, and refining and evolving our program over time is that what um, it needs to uniquely be centered around um, the individuals and their families uh, who live with rare conditions, as well as the patient advocacy organizations, um, often disease specific, but not only, um, that support them. One of the other areas of, uh, and I will talk just very briefly about what we mean and how we accomplish those. So for example, you know, to be centered on the individuals and PAGs, we need to make sure that the system has the features and functions that uniquely uh, are uniquely needed by those um, entities. Um, you know, consent modules that are, for example, that are um, configurable and, and patient-centric, if you will, tools and resources that help patient advocacy organizations to pursue this type of work. Um, in addition, it, from the very get-go, we wanted to make sure that any, any tools, any system, software platform, any data um, capture and data extraction really needed to support natural history studies. It really was uh, a part of some of the earlier conversations that NORD had, at least with um, entities in the United States like NIH and FDA. How do we help um, do our part in de-risking the drug development process and understanding the um, characterization and the evolution of these conditions was a key gap that we sought to fill. So being able to capture data longitudinally, whether it be scheduled or episodic um, was really, really important to you know, the core um, elements of our design and program design. It was also important that we recognize the roles that various stakeholders play and that we can support collaboration among stakeholders where possible. So for example, we knew from the get-go that um, there would be different types of study staff with different roles and responsibilities uh, from, from coordinators to curators. Uh, we knew of course from the first bullet that patients, um, their caregivers would be part engaging in the program. And then of course, um, patient advocacy organizations who often um, are, are the source of the study staff as well as clinicians and researchers. This is all about accelerating development of therapies for rare conditions. So the ability to support sub-studies, um, maintaining that cent central focus, but working in collaboration with other parties who are important um, elements of this ecosystem important to getting therapies to market. And then sustainability. This was a really big decision for NORD to make this commitment to invest its resources to the, to, you know, to this notion of rising tides elevates all boats. And so this is a decision that was made um, with NORD's board of directors and has the support of um, its um, governance entity. I mentioned the power of natural history studies. It's for many of you in the audience, if not all of you, um, this is not news. Um, but in many instances, and especially in places where we're working with organizations that are just beginning their um, journey to become research ready, the difference between understanding what a registry may be um, and what a natural history study can accomplish are, are different. Our program has grown um, over the years. I think this particular slide is in the wrong place. It may come up again, so I apologize, but we started this in 2014 and it really was very similar to a lot of patient advocacy organization um, births, as well as the, the, the development of programs, which is around virtual tables and um, with folks at NIH and FDA, as I mentioned earlier, trying to understand how can NORD contribute to de-risking the drug development process. I mentioned in the brief note about the um, various priorities. Here is an example I'm just pulling from some key points that I thought may be relevant to um, this meeting and this group. Um, participants and caregivers are, are play unique roles within the program and um, caregivers can sign up and support those who may be um, 
pediatric or adolescents, or they may be adults who cannot um, care for themselves or need to have legally authorized representatives speak on their behalf. Here's just an example um, where um, I've got a, a, just a quick screenshot that shows I've um, put myself in the system as a caregiver and I have uh, my son Perrin, who's also a participant. So both of us are participating in studies and I have access to both of them. The ability to support languages is really important and we're really excited about that um, e effort. Um, we um, will be launching our new version of the system later on this year and it will support English um, and Spanish and French to start. Here's just an example of a particular um, survey set of questions uh, working in partnership with, this is just a, a sample, it's, it's really dummy data for certain, um, but working with our Canadian MPS registry colleagues and our Inform Rare colleagues, who you'll hear from um, in this present, in this panel discussion later, but just an example of um, a screen in our test environment. Um, there are, as I mentioned, different features and functions for different types of users. Um, study curators can have different areas of responsibility and roles, and their screens would look very different from the screen that myself as a caregiver or another participant such as Perrin would have. It's important to show to those who engage in these kinds of longer term programs and activities, um, graphical representations of um, their experiences. So just a few quick screenshots to show you and, and um, point out that those are very important feedback loops. Of course, for all the um, data folk, we wanna make sure that there's robust access to information both at episodic as well as longitudinal information captured in the system and the ability to export it and use um, favorite tools du jour for further analysis or perhaps com combine it with data from other systems that may not be um, a part of this um, study. Um, here's just a different example of graphic representation, and it's really driven, as I said earlier, by user roles. If I was an administrator, a systems admin dashboard may have very different types of data um, that I am um, have uh, privy to to help me manage my areas of responsibility. Um, governance and compliance. Um, I put a slide in here just to pause and mention how important this is to NORD's program. Um, the ability to transparently develop um, these um, studies and ensure that um, those who are participating, whether they be a caregiver or an individual with a rare condition or any other stakeholder that, especially for those who are contributing information about their experiences and their clinical information, that is very clear who is running these programs um, and that they are fully informed and um, have the voluntary power to determine um, what they're consenting to. Um, so we put a lot of time and energy into it, both from a systems perspective and a feature function perspective, but also um, resources and tools, templates, um, access to well, what is called in the States, um, IRBs instead of REBs, but ethics boards, having those kinds of services available for those who um, uh, work with NORD that are in, have, or have an interest in them if they don't automatically have, or they don't already have access to those kinds of resources. But it's very holistic. Um, just to point that there's lots of great software that's out there, lots of great systems that are out there, but in some cases, if you don't have the wraparound services that require to take them from a concept to reality, um, they don't meet their potential. So we're very mindful of that. and knowing that we work with patient advocacy organizations of limited resources in most instances, we um, wanna make sure we can provide those resources when they're, avail when they're available and people need them. Our um, process that we have um, evolved into is 
um, still a very hands-on um, white glove kind of approach, but we do it in a cohort model now, which is wonderful because people can also learn from each other at the same time. And depending upon where organizations are who want to launch a natural history study or registry, where they are in their journey, in their work with their scientific and medical advisory board members and community members, uh, they may, it may be a shorter time frame than this. It also may be a longer, but on average, anywhere from you know, six to nine months um, is what often it takes. And it's usually a time and a resource limitation more than anything else. Um, I would be remiss in not um, expressing um, the enthusiasm that our team has for working with um, uh, patient advocacy organizations and um, you know, um, community network members on these kinds of programs. Um, our director is uh, Aliza Fink. Uh, she's an epidemiologist that joined NORD last, um, I think fall, uh, late summer. Uh, she was recently at Cystic Fibrosis where she was a senior director of real world research. And she worked there for many years and we're, we were pleased to have her join us. And so this is her team and um, uh, her team's my team. We're all in it together. So um, I think that's it. Uh, I don't wanna spend much more time, but happy to answer questions at some later point. I wanna be able to um, have some time for my colleagues uh, to talk about the Inform Rare program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. That is um, just a great example in terms of the many ways in which NORD is leading and certainly engaging and involving the patient community. We are, as we say, a tiny little sister to NORD, but we're always happy to take advantage of everything NORD is doing. But it is my real privilege to introduce our team in Form Rare. Um, I don't know who all is coming up here, but I think there's a host of people. Uh, Pranish, is back. Pranish is doing triple duty for us today, so we're just thrilled. Um, it, it, are the other members of your team here or other people virtually? I don't know if there are other people here. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll introduce them. They're at that table over there. Oh, and they're what, they're being shy or they're waiting for direction <laughs> or what? Like, what the heck is going on here? Until the boss says yes, the rest of you just kind of lurk in the background. Okay, I'm happy to introduce Pranish, and I'm really delighted because we know that there's a great partnership between Inform Rare and uh, I Am Rare, and I think they're actually making great grounds here for us. So back to Pranish. And, and Durheen, uh, after I speak, will we have time for a little back and forth? Or? We hope to. We hope to, okay. So then maybe I'll ask a couple of people to come up at that point. Great. Um, I have slides. That's a second slide set. Yeah. Thanks, Pam. All right, I'm waving at the screen. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, while we're getting the slides up, I think um, uh, this is actually a bit of a cord story. Uh, the last time, as Durhane said, I. I don't come that often. The last time I attended a court meeting was in Toronto, and I don't remember the year. I, I think it was you know five or six years ago. Uh, but Marshall was speaking, um, uh, Summer, who I've been sitting with over there, and he mentioned the Nord I Am Rare platform, and um, you know it was really the memory of that conversation after and you know his talk and the memory of the conversation that when we started on this project, I emailed Marshall up, and you know got connected uh, you know with our table there behind Marshall, so. Um, Alex Wyatt, Beth Potter, Monica Lamoureux, uh, Allison, I think that's everyone we got there. So, um, you know, and then we started working with uh, NORD. So what I'm going to describe here is really a co-development uh, that we're doing with NORD on their I Am Rare 2 platform. Um, and, you know, talking about all our partners, uh, you know, within the Inform Rare uh, system um, uh, as well. So, um, uh, so here, the, the title is uh, Canadian Metabolic Patient Registries and Building Canada Smart. Oh, yeah, so it's part of this session. Okay. Um, okay, so first I wanted to provide a little bit of an overview. Uh, uh, Alex put these slides together, so uh, I always uh, 
Uh, I'm just realizing my eyes are not as great as I thought they were. Uh, I'll look at that one. Um, okay, so how did we get here? So uh, uh, Beth uh, has been our uh, principal investigator for many years on this Canadian Inherited Metabolic Disease Research Network, which has uh, done a, a fair bit of work in this area. And our most recent uh, project is the Inform Rare uh, project. And the uh, SIMDERN, it was a placeholder acronym that we never replaced, uh, so we still call it SIMDERN, um, was uh, initially funded by a uh, CIHR uh, emerging team uh, grant in 2011. Um, and uh, I remember we got the funding notice when I was in New Zealand with my then almost one year old. Um, and um, uh, uh, and so that really was focused on a large set of inherited diseases, uh, for many of which there were specific treatments. And two big policy areas that were relevant to this work were uh, um, reimbursement for rare, uh, rare disease drugs but, and newborn screening, uh, which ties into you know, how I, I get involved here. Um, so with Simdern, we did a fair bit of work on longitudinal data collection. It was a 10-year cohort focused on pediatric metabolic disease patients uh, born between 2016, uh, 2006 and 2016. Uh, and we learned a lot doing that. Uh, two main areas were around data quality. And so if you're using any sort of, um, uh, even if it's contemporaneous chart abstraction, you know, and, and you know, I think we're getting better at uh, ways of pulling information from charts, but charts also do have a lot of missing information that may be very key for understanding outcomes in natural history. You know, so I may not chart uh, things that are actually, uh, in, you know, important to know from a research perspective or from an understanding natural history perspective, because they may not be relevant to the immediate care of that patient, right? Uh, from that day-to-day, -day, you know, care, uh, treatment point perspective. So a lot of data quality, including data missingness, and then also sustainability of this kind of effort, right? You know, doing it from a grant funding perspective uh, with specific research projects isn't necessarily the way to build information on a, uh, um, a, a group of patients uh, that will be useful for all the different things that we hear about. Um, the other was uh, breadth of data. So what, what is it that we were actually trying to collect? And so, you know, with the SIMDERN cohort, we were going after a very broad set of data and trying to be deep in all of it, which is a recipe for disaster, as everyone knows, with uh, registries, right? You know, so um, uh, maybe I'm being dramatic there, but the, uh, you know, a big focus of work uh, that we undertook uh, learning from this was to develop core outcome sets following uh, the COMET initiative. Uh, and so, again, there, you know, we've got a number of publications and we have ongoing work in this. And the idea there is really to have defined, you know, what are the key measures uh, from a variety of perspectives? I think the three important ones are patients and uh, the healthcare provider team and also policymakers, right? So, you know, what do they need to know about um, uh, the outcomes and the natural history of uh, a given patient in, with a given condition in order to make decisions on drug reimbursement or addition to a newborn screening panel, et cetera. If that evidence isn't there, well, then we haven't got the core outcome set that we need, right? Um, and so uh, Inform Rare uh, was uh, funded, I think a couple of years ago now, it was part of um, the uh, SPORE Innovative Trials um, uh, competition from CIHR. And what we were proposing was to do registry randomized trials as an innovative uh, trial design. And so when you think of natural history and natural history uh, studies and registries to support that, um, you can also think about interventions within that. So a lot of the treatments we're talking about will alter the natural history for the better, right? But then what you're talking about is the treatment altered natural history. So, uh, you know, the, the uh, concept within Inform Rare was to have that registry and then be able to perform registry uh, randomized trials within that registry context. So uh, there's three uh, disease group areas, PKU, um, uh, MPSs, the, the whole set of them, so the mucopolysaccharide storage diseases, uh, and SMA. And for this, we're going to talk about the two inborn errors of, uh, of metabolism uh, context. So we, uh, you know, part of our, our it's not even part, like we're, we're completely integrated with um, uh, patient uh, 
organizations as well as patient researchers, and I'll mention that again later uh, in, in performing this work. So, you know, typically John Adams and Kim Angel, uh, I think Kim's online, hopefully, and John had a conflict, but we would have done this presentation together. So John Adams is with Cam PKU and Kim Angel is with the Canadian MPS Society. Um, and so from the Cam PKU perspective, there were no existing registries for PKU in Canada. They recognized the value of a comprehensive registry that was independent of specific drug development. And so if you think about multi, uh, multimodal therapies or comparative effectiveness um, you know, studies, these are things that we could be, you know, could be supported by this. Uh, Camp PKU was part of Simdern's earlier work, including the PKU Core Outcome Set project. And uh, the registry is to start as a pediatric registry, but it was important to both Kim and John and their organizations that it uh, expand to adults as a high priority. So, you know, similarly with the Canadian MPS Society, there was no existing registry for MPS in Canada. And they actually had it as a strategic goal to develop a comprehensive patient registry uh, for the organization. And so there's also patient organization needs for uh, a longitudinal registry, as well as research needs, as well as, uh, you know, um, uh, policy and supporting policy needs and contacting, for example, for research is something that everyone is interested in. So just to remember that the organizations also have their perspectives and needs uh, for a registry as well. Okay, and so really all of this work is a partnership and, you know, from an organizational point of view, can PKU, Canadian MPS Society, you know, form rare via the CHEO Research Institute. And really we're building this on the Nord IM rare 2 platform as two registries. So the Canadian PKU registry and the Canadian MPS registry. And one of our goals is really to have this to be scalable to other uh, inherited metabolic disease registries and have a lot of the um, background work already done. So overcoming that hump should be easier for subsequent registries. So in terms of what the values are underpinning registry development, so sustainability, uh, this is a slide that builds, um, reminding myself of that. So sustainability um, uh, with long-term use and uh, maintaining relevance uh, over time, uh, including making sure that this can be in existence beyond a particular research team or a particular project, et cetera. Uh, accessibility. So it needs to be accessible to different networks, organizations, and individuals for some of the various reasons I've already alluded to. Scalability, addition of other disease groups. Uh, public benefit. Um, so to commit to using the registry as a public good. Benefits to patients and their family, direct data access, contact for research opportunities, and building research capacity. So patients and clinician informed research capacity. So the, you know, these are a set of shared values. We spent a lot of time on this stuff. And I think that's really important to, uh, to highlight. You know, this slide didn't come out of you know, a one hour, hey, let's chat kind of session. Like this is you know, a lot of conversation over a lot of time to have that shared value set about what we're trying to do here. Okay, so to try and actually translate that into the governance of a registry, right? So, um, you know, build this slide here as well. So as I said, you know, we've got this, um, you know, overall structure of a, of a collaboration between the patient organizations and what we're calling a registry coordinating center. Um, and at this time, that'd be the CHEO Research Institute. Something that we had in mind is what if, you know, Beth and I are both in Ottawa, we're champions for this, but say the champ, you know, we're, not old, but we're getting older. You know, there's you know, there's going to be people in the future who are going to be champions, and they may not be in Ottawa, and their institution may be a di different institution. So to structure things so that that institution could change, but there will be an institution. Okay, um, and the patient organizations to start Camp PKU and Canadian MPS Society working together to build this Canadian Metabolic Patient Registries, where we can add on additional registries and overall having a registry steering committee. So to do this, there has to be a whole set of agreements and we're working very closely with um, uh, legal teams to make sure that these are structured uh, appropriately and, and robustly, but also flexibly. Okay? Uh, so collaborative research and usage agreements between those two organizations. Now, I've already mentioned, you know, we're working with Pam and the team at Nord uh, around the registry platforms. So we've noted them here as the registry platform de developers. 
And the registry coordinating center will have a service agreement with NORD. Right? So we'll have that legal agreement there and the uses and um, uh, other parts of the relationships between CAMPKU and CHIORI will be handled there. And this is actually something important for the patient organizations as well in terms of uh, their capacity and risk uh, tolerance to be able to have these types of agreements, right? Okay, so then with the hospitals and clinics, we'll have data sharing agreements. There are funding partners and they're broad, you know, so it's, uh, you know, this is a, a community, right? And I think the community is in this room, right? CIHR, industry, patient organizations, a lot of different funding partners here. Um, and so then you need fund transfer agreements. Uh, and, you know, there will also be some who are funding CAMPKU for their work. And then if there needs to be funds to the, so this all looks really complicated, but once you start breaking it down as I'm building it, you can see the relevance and the importance of each piece. It's actually important to get down properly, but in the end, it has to be simple uh, to, to understand. And then in terms of getting data, there will be data from patients and family, right? So direct patient uh, reported outcomes and patient reported uh, information. Uh, that will be going directly into the into the Nord platform, and then there will be clinic reported information as well. And so, you know, def and who's consenting in the end, right? It's the patients and families consenting, which is why we put that, you know, there. Pam alluded to this. There's a lot of work going into how to provide the appropriate choices for what people want to consent to or not, to make it understandable and make it meaningful, uh, and also follow all the legal obligations for this. So this has been a lot of work uh, going in. Um, but is, uh, I'd say, you know, going extremely well. So the participants will be recruited through patient organizations, social media, and eventually through metabolic clinics as well. There'll be a consent and assent process based on age um, to enroll and contribute data to the registry, to be contacted about the related research. Uh, there will be options for the sharing of de-identified data. And in terms of the eligibility criteria for now, confirmed diagnosis of inherited metabolic disease, PKU for the PKU registry, MPS for the MPS registry, children at this point, so age 18 or younger, and receiving disease-specific health care in Canada. For the data collection, storage, and timelines, for the variables in collection, it'll be informed by those core outcome sets that I mentioned. So there is a core outcome set and that's published for PKU from our work a couple of years ago. And there's one being developed now for MPS. Uh, you, many of you here may be uh, in this area, might be participating in that, but it's going through the Delphi process right now. Uh, data collection will be the patient and caregiver reported outcomes in phase one uh, with a plan to start that uh, this summer. And the uh, clinician contributed information will be in phase two. The data storage will be on the Nord platform and stored on Canadian servers. And so the data will be residing in Canada. Um, you know, John has brought up, uh, you know, we, law is never static, right? And so you also have to keep an eye on the dynamic, um, you know, changes in the landscape. So, you know, there are some changes to American law that John uh, has been poking at, and we're having great discussions with Nord uh, also to figure out uh, having data on Canadian servers there's a question, for example, can Ameri if the data, if the pr service provider is American, can there still be an access by American government for some of that data? So we're sorting through that right now. It's a changing landscape thing. Um, Children's Hospital Eastern Ontario Research Institute will be the data custodian. So in terms of patient and family engagement, uh, we have a research team. There is a co-PI for patient engagement. That's Maureen Smith, I think, who would be familiar to many in this audience. We have patient partner co-investigators. So John, Kim, I think are key amongst them. A parent advisory group, a youth advisory group, and um, you know, a youth facilitator and a special advisor. So patients are fully embedded within this entire concept, right? I think that's really what I wanna stress in this slide is this, I wouldn't even think about it as co-development, like this is just, it's part of one team, right? And I think that's a very important way to think of it. Okay, I feel like I'm going long, so I'm just gonna finish up. So summary of key messages. Uh, the registries are being co-developed and operated through the partnership of patient organizations and academic clinical researchers. Registries that respond to patient and family priorities. Sustainability is a key thing and some of the structure that I've described, I think is, are part of our solutions to that sustainability. 
the data custodianship in a hospital research institute with capacity for integration of patient, family, and clinician contributed data. The NORD platform and making sure that it works for Canada and for Canadian law and respects Canadian laws and patients. And strong patient and family engagement strategy is really important for building the capacity and ongoing relevance to the community. So that's really on behalf of that table there. And if we have a discussion, we'll include all of them in the discussion. Thank you very much. That was in very, very comprehensive. And I think it really does show also the challenges. You know, we think, okay, we need patient registries. And so therefore we're gonna set up patient registries. And what we recognize is of course, there's a lot more. So we've got three presentations here and I'm going to really put pressure on these three participants to really keep their comments as concise as possible. Cause we would really love to have some time for everybody who's been presenting on this area to be able to talk about. And Pranish opened it up very nicely in terms of talking about sources of information and patient data. So I'm gonna invite maybe all three of you to come up together if you don't mind um, in this next panel. So we've got um, uh, from NMR Strategies, VP um, Sandra Anderson, who I just wanna do a quick shout out to Sandra. Sandra has been the chair coach of our advisory group for the Canadian Rare Disease Drug Strategy, and she has been absolutely phenomenal in terms of working with us, in terms of keeping us on track, in terms of making sure that we're able to bring everybody together and to keep that advisory council going. So really want to do a huge, huge acknowledgement to Sandra for this. Um, Aaron Leipkick, oh, there he is, right, who's going to talk to us about what I think is phenomenal in terms of when we heard, you know, earlier Don talking about AI and the importance of it, we talked about being smart, is it going to give us a little bit deeper dive in terms of the use of AI in terms of transforming what is patient information and uh, clinician information into, into usable data, and then also uh, Lori, who who's almost here, okay, <laughs> uh, who heads up the Real World Evidence uh, Consortium there. Do you want to come back up? Hey, let's let them finish first, and then you can come back up, okay? God, I, for a shy guy who never wanted to show up, all of a sudden he's kind of here. You have one more... Uh, you have one more stint later on, so don't get too excited yet, okay? You're coming back up one more time. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me today and for Cord for inviting me to speak. I do have some slides. I was wondering if you could put them up. Just a brief um, introduction before. Today, my focus is really on real world evidence. Um, in our strategies, we do design and run a number of patient support programs um, on behalf of manufacturers. These are manufacturer funded programs, which are really meant to help the patients navigate the ecosystem, get access to their specialty products, and we do a lot of work specifically in rare disease. And what we found over the last years of doing a number of these programs is really the amount of rich evidence that we can um, collect, mine, and really tell a story of the patient journey um, as they access their medications. And so the first slide here is a pictorial that I just want to walk through when we're enrolling patients in patient support programs. Um, we go through a lot of data collection on their past, on the history of how they got diagnosed um, and all the different characteristics and data that, that come along with that diagnosis. And so when we collect and enroll a patient into a patient support program, um, there's usually a consent process uh, where we're allowed to collect the data. And these are some examples at the bottom here of the different types of uh, data that we can collect across that journey, starting from patient enrollment, baseline characteristics, treatment patterns, as we then you know, help the patient access their therapy, coordinate insurance. We're then looking at following throughout their journey. So treatment updates, delivery of the drug to them, uh, collecting adherence data, et cetera. Um, and then outcomes data. A lot of the drugs that we're dealing with and the products we're dealing with, these patients are on drugs for these products, obviously for years. And so how can we collect and follow them throughout that journey, even when they discontinue? reasons for discontinuation, and then of course safety data. So this just gives you an idea of how we're collecting data. One of the questions uh, you know, also to consider is the protection of the data, right? Following patient privacy laws, and we do a lot of that, PAPITA, et cetera, 
um, also investing in the validation of the actual database. So when we store this data, uh, we've invested a lot on the state protection of the data, the validation of the systems, and even we've, we've now uh, created this thing called RWE Connect, which is a portal that plugs in not only to the PSP database, but can also plug into external systems, pharmacy systems, EMR, uh, claims databases to allow us to pool that data and tell that patient story. So this is a more detailed diagram, and I, I just want to point out a few points. The purple steps it really represent the data that we can collect through the program, including the labs and the diagnostic testing. And then the blue box underneath is how we can complement it. So if we don't get the full picture, if we don't get the full data set, how can we then uh, you know, work in tandem with EMR data, public pl database data, you know, et cetera, um, and really, if you just follow the journey, you see the, all the types of data that we're collecting along that journey, in, including uh, coordinating that patient to the clinic. We do have in, drugs that we work with, we're infusing them in private clinics. We actually collect post-infusion reports where we're able to collect the adverse event, the coordination of that data with the hospitals, and then coordinate it into one system. The other unique thing about patient support program is the amount of data you can collect through the pharmacy and the wholesale. A lot of times when we're working with expensive rare disease products, um, you know, every time we ship out a drug to a clinic, uh, that's a lot of value of that product and the time of dispense, how it was dispensed. And so there's different data that we can collect throughout that journey can, that can then be pulled to really tell. And when the payer is asking, did that drug reach the patient? Did they actually take it? Well, we actually have evidence of that. And that becomes really important when we're dealing with tracking, for example, a product listing agreement or working with a manufacturer who's trying to tell the story of how this drug has helped that patient. So really, I'm gonna keep it concise. I only did three slides, Dirhan. And really, the, the point that I wanted to make is that patient support programs, especially as part of the larger rare disease strategy, can really play a role in how we can leverage real world evidence. We talked about registries. Um, patient support pro programs are one piece of that but they can collect data and we can manage it and even link it to registry data. And we've done that. We've published studies where we've collected the data from the program and worked with patient advocacy groups, worked with patient registry organizations to pool that data to really tell that full story. Um, patient support programs, again, investment in different types of mediums like the consent. We are also doing some innovations on digital platforms of how we can automate the enrollment through digital systems, collecting the data automatically from the EMR when we enroll the patient into the program. There's huge amounts of opportunity to pool that data um, and then look at how we can balance that with different data sources. And I've listed a few there um, of how you can complement and aggregate that data. And then how do we use the data? So today we're, we're talking a lot about registries and real world evidence and how we can support the rare disease strategy. So far to date, we have done a lot of publications, outcome studies where we've collect quality of life, uh, done burden of illness studies where we've complemented market access strategies for manufacturers. But I think when we're looking at the larger picture here of the rare, you know, the rare disease strategy, there's a huge opportunity to take this data, the real world that we're collecting and use it to help with how we can, you know, complement um, real world registries, et cetera, and talk about that journey of the patient. So these are just some examples, current state, and I'd love to, you know, if I had more time, I would give you a lot of examples, but just to give you an, uh, a snapshot of how we can leverage the real world evidence from patient support programs, I think over time can play a big role in the rare disease strategy. Thank you. See if this works. Well, as my slides are coming up, my name's Aaron Leaptag, and I'm the CEO of Pentavir. And just want to thank Doreen for inviting us, and uh, really excited uh, to be here, and looking forward to meeting many people in this room. Perfect. Wonderful. So Pentavir is an AI discovery company. And what that means is we've developed and validated an AI engine that accelerates discovery and accelerates insights, unlocks evidence from the huge amounts of clinical documentation, clinical text, electronic health records that exists in the real world. Um, you know, to build off of uh, my dear colleague from Phenotips, we deal with that messy real world language that clinicians 
document and um, every single day. Our technology has been validated. And what our North Star is, is we believe that an environment where 80% of the health information we create isn't used to improve health outcomes. There's a lot of literature around all of the data we have in the random control trial frameworks really only represents around 10% of that real world population. The ability to unlock this data can have as much impact possibly as the identification of a new molecule, even more so in the work that we're doing with rare diseases. One of the things that we're very happy about and privileged is the testimonials and the work that we are doing in the Canadian system with KOLs across therapeutic areas where our AI is deployed with EMR hospitals, not just in Canada, but around the world. What I thought I would do is the reason we're all here is that quote around the one in 12 Canadians that suffer from rare diseases. The fact that it takes five to seven years to get that right diagnosis, right access to treatment, uh, and the cost in the Canadian healthcare system. For the next few minutes, I'd like to reframe that problem as a data processing and data management problem. All of us are living through right now this transformation around real world evidence, real world data. We saw just in late 2021, uh, the FDA approved uh, PROGRAPH for a new indication based entirely on a non-interventional real world evidence study. But we have a significant data void when we think about real world evidence, when we think about real world data. And that's really what we're passionate about, what we, we, uh, we work on every day at Pentavir in terms of organizing that data, cataloging that data, making that data fit for purpose, making that data structured in such a way where regulators and different types of bodies actually trust the data that's being generated around uh, from our AI engine. Uh, Ontario MD and the University of Toronto did this study titled Ontario's Health Data Landscape for Implementing Precision Medicine. And we know a lot of the muscles we need to build in the area of rare disease is really around precision medicine. This is just Ontario. Each other province it looks entirely different. And what their conclusion was around lack of data governments, lack of data sharing, complexity of privacy rules, lack of uh, record linkages. But when we think about utilizing data in the real world, this is the environment that we need to acknowledge, that we need to design for, and that we need to build upon for real solutions with patients. So I thought this was a really good slide just to reflect on both the challenges and opportunities that we have in front of us. There's been a tremendous amount of talk in the literature around the electronic health record, the potential to transform medicine. There's equally as much literature around doctors are spending more time administratively inputting into the electronic health record than they are visiting patients. The whole you know, promise around big data, are we unlocking that data? You know, I, I walk around when I speak and we have a data sharing agreement that I'm able to do this. This is an extract of a single patient's electronic health record with cancer from University Health Network. Only five years history from four separate siloed systems. It's 156 pages of text. But in this 156 patients is the information that we need both to understand their natural history, to understand treatments and outcomes, and to structure data to build unbiased AI that can actually accelerate diagnosis, diagnosis of, uh, of rare disease. So interrogating and working with documentation like this is what we do at Pentavir. So what I'd like to do is, you know, start off as I start giving a few examples of solutions around the work we do and how we can build solutions together as a community is, is really a quote from our leader, Duran, who said, for rare disease, the ability to use the whole of their experience and clinical observations to inform diagnosis and best management is a game changer and can prove as impactful as decoding the human genome. And if we can turn seven years to five years to four years in terms of time to diagnosis, transforms people's lives and can really move some of those statistics that we share. So what is the solution space? 
Now, the solution space isn't technology alone. And that's one of the key messages that I really want and we really want to share. You can have the best AI technology in the world, the most validated algorithms, and we do have validated algorithms. We just had a major publication in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology validating our AI's capability to extract at scale and speed the most complex clinical features that are needed for oncology. But that's not enough. The solution space is that intersection between data privacy and governance, between clinical knowledge and expertise, and of course, between patient centricity. So no one organization can crack this and solve this problem alone. But within that Venn diagram, we're seeing incredible traction that looking forward to sharing with you. We've spoken a lot about different data sources. Now, if you think about the patient, and how we collect data. Registries is one form of data collection, but there's electronic health records, there's patient support program data, and actually in the public domain within Amar, we have examples where through our technology, finding unknown endpoints and publishing those endpoints in forums like United European Gastroenterology and uh, the Crohn's and Colitis conferences. But each data set is different and we need to recognize those differences. What do they have and what do they not have in context to the problems that we are trying to solve? We know, for example, clinical trial data is rich, it's complete, it's fit for purpose and it's validated, but it only represents a very small sliver of that patient experience. Electronic health records might have the whole experience, but there may be significant missing data pieces, and it's a mix between structured and unstructured and documentation, uh, patient support programs, very rich data, and really applaud companies like Inamar in terms of the investments that they are making, but also has holes and incomplete. So the idea is how do you bring these data sources together by understanding them in order to accelerate and unleash AI? And each data source has different rules, different legislations in terms of data access, data analysis, and data sharing. So the first step in terms of data registry, unlocking technology for fit for purpose, real world evidence is getting governance right at the start. A lot of talk around FAIR, that data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And what we're finding is building a foundation around understanding the authorities, what ability do you have to access the data, to use the data, what's the legislation, the governance, what agreements are in place, relevancy, so that's protocols, that's data management plans, reliability, so that's both quality assurance from people and processes, but also validation, and that validation needs to be both clinical and algorithmic. We just presented data in February at the American Association of Clinical Research, where they compared data points extracted from our AI engine to existing registries that have been used for submissions. And 98% overlap, but of the uh, examples where there are differences, over 50% were a result of human error. Very difficult to go back to the source document to be able to adjudicate that. So one of the things that we did it as an organization, is you said, if we're building an AI technology that can organize, catalog, structure data, Let's build privacy and governance principles in at the foundational level. So every single data point extracted can be connected to any of the pieces within this particular framework. And what we have found in the discussions we've had with manufacturers and various stakeholders is by providing that documentation, our data and data extracted through the engine is in fact fair. The next uh, piece, and this is data that was shared by us with, with one of our clients. Now you'll see I have a quote from the CEO of Novartis uh, below. This is not Novartis, this is another client. They gave me permission to share this table, but what they did internally was a study around what is the life and how long does it take to do an AI data science project within their organization. And what's astonishing is 11% of the time was spent finding insights, and it's those insights that have the impact for patients. Um, so being able to unlock that, and based on one of our validations, is what the technology can actually do is flip that, where all of the sudden, if you can scale the curation, the cleaning with the governance I shared, 50% of the time is spent on insight. And in that insight generation is how we are gonna discover algorithms for early diagnosis. So really using technology to accelerate speed of insight. The last piece that we've learned is 
that idea around in order that there's not bias in your algorithms, in order that there's the right context in the data based on the various data sources you are curating, you need that partnership between that clinician when appropriate, the patient or the patient advisory groups and the data scientists to work together to really understand the different data sources and how do different pieces of those various data sources come together as a, uh, a training set or a data set to be able to train models in order to be able to get that particular outcome. And it's foundational. It starts with data governance and privacy, data clinical expertise, then you can add in the, uh, the breakthrough AI, and then all of a sudden what you start getting is that idea of closing the loop. And there's some data gonna be coming out around learning health system implementation. We have it a major system in Ontario, 11 hospitals, prospective, Registry, registry curation that's fit for purpose and validated that's going to be presented at a major conference in the next few months. That was only possible by building on that foundation of governance, clinical expertise, then breakthrough AI. And once you can close the loop, then you can start seeing and sharing and celebrating the various impacts to patients. And the best uh, analogy or visual to leave is, especially in AI, where it's exciting and it's shiny and we seem to gravitate only to what we see above the surface, that algorithm, that prediction, that big story. What's required in the early days of AI is everything beneath the surface. And that's the work we're really looking forward to engaging with this community and building with Doreen and others uh, over the, uh, the weeks and months ahead. So thank you so much. And you know, lastly, you know, in the, the same slogan when we were in the sort of grip of COVID, you know, no one partner, no one organization can achieve this alone. We're really all in this together. Thank you so much. So I guess my job is to try and go from a three out of a 10 to up to something a little bit higher. <laughs> um, I've got some slides and gonna try and be quick, but I guess um, uh, you can go to the next slide. So I'm the lead of Real World Evidence and just to give you a bit of background about me, um, I worked at, I, I was actually in Australia for 20 years and then I worked at Ines for 16 years and there I was with uh, particularly in cardiovascular disease and the whole program was brought about by clinicians who were tired of wanted change. And I was there to generate real world evidence. So I know I can do it. It was really hard. Um, and now I've been at Cadith for almost two years and you know, climbing that hill um, starting up. So just to start, what does Cadith think? What is real world data is, is we're just saying it's data collected from outside clinical trials. We're saying, you know, and real world evidence is if we believe it's evidence, not at, not all data would be considered evidence, but some data can be used as evidence and it's collect sided outside of trials. And right now, Kenneth considers it complementary to real uh, RCTs and not a replacement. And it could be data from all these different sources. Next slide. So just wanted to say we announced we are in a learning period. So I really, you know, what Michelle said, and I can tell you this, it, it's hard to get people to change how we do things, right? So we, we are in a learning period, and I say that every day, we're in a learning period, right? We're trying to do things in a different way. We're trying new ways, and that is frightening. And, and that's what we all have to deal with together. And so we have to accept it might not always work. And again, I've been through that. I have been spat on. I've, you know, I can tell you stories. So it's, it's hard to change, but we are, we've announced it. We're in a learning period and we're really pushing to, to learn. Next slide. So the goals, we want to support Health Canada in a national rare disease strategy. So again, even for me, it's on two levels. We're thinking big, but also working within Cadith, right, to try and change. RWE is not going to be, I've told Nicole, there will be no little RWE team. RWE has to be, right, it's all the way through Cadith. It has to be in everything we do. That's big change. Next slide. So, um, uh, Durhane was there and helped co Cord co-hosted. So we had a best brains exchange and probably a lot of you were there. Like I, you know, I sort of remember faces and names 
And we really learned a lot from that and we spent a lot of time, we took the transcript, we used natural language processing to analyze it and you know, really try and maximize out of it. And really from that, we thought there's four key areas that we need to work. So one is multi-stakeholder engagement and dialogue, right? And so actually talking together, it's having some guidance of how are we gonna use real world evidence? How is it gonna be accepted? We know everyone wants to have that. That was a clear message. We need data, right? We need data to be generated and we need it to be accessible and how do we do that well? And we need to have partnerships. So next slide. So our vision, you know, we are not there yet. Our vision for rare disease is that we will be able to have dialogue right through the life cycle. So we want to have early dialogue to even inform RCTs and so on. We want to have a dialogue after RCTs to say, okay, what are the gaps that are left? Can real world evidence fill those gaps to inform decision making? Go and make sure that data gets collected after um, HTA makes its recommendations, what are the uncertainties that left? So we've been learning recently, right? The trial only includes adults, it doesn't include children. Met someone today, the RCT included children, it didn't include older people. So then we know there's uncertainties, well then we should do something about that and measure what happens in the real world. And I can tell you from my experience, what happens in the real world is often nothing like what happened in the trials. And then, so what happened? We need to measure that to know what happened. Next slide, and then post-market, right? So once it's out there, reassess. So progress report. So for multi-stakeholder dialogue, there's a link that's it's up now on, we have an RWE website, and we've done a, a lit review of multi-stakeholder engagement of how is it done out there? How do we do it? Like, how do you do it? And so we've got a literature review that is open for feedback. So we want to hear from you. We've, we've had, um, you know, which was new for Cadiz. They It was for dementia just because it was timely, but we got patients together and actually spoke to them and wrote a report about that. And we learned a lot. We've had a meeting, uh, two meetings actually, with patients and caregivers with lived experience for pediatric glioma recently. We've had meetings with just clinicians and now we're going to have our first multi-stakeholder meeting, uh, and that's going to be in the next few weeks, probably, or in the next couple of months. So, so we are learning by doing. You know, we're doing it, and the idea is by learning and doing. And I'm getting in trouble every day. I can tell you. And okay, sorry, you know, whatever. But we're going to learn and then have. Okay, this is how we think we should do it. Okay, so we're trying to. We're forcing everyone to be brave enough to try it, to make mistakes, to learn, and then have a policy. Next slide. So guidance, right? So we translated the Ines did a lit review with no recommendations or anything, but um, you know, I was an external reviewer, but we said, let's translate that for you so that everybody can read it. So we got, right, there's so much out there for guidance right now, and it just keeps coming. We're now, if we've updated that literature review, we've established an expert panel, and that's gonna be meeting in the next few weeks. We've got representatives from Health Canada, Chi High, Stats Canada, Ines, IHE, FDA, NICE, Harvard, Oxford, like, you know, so a lot of work got in. There's a panel there. They're gonna talk, and let's try and get some consensus on RWE guidance, and we should have a preliminary document in the fall for guidance. Next slide. Partnerships, so for partnerships, we ha actually have a memorandum of understanding now with Kai High. So Kai High has, uh, you know, that's our national level uh, database with, you know, very strong with hospital data, NP Duis and so on. So we have a memorandum of understanding to finally have more direct access. We're testing it, we're piloting it. How do we do this? How much is it gonna cost? What's happening? We're working closely with Statistics Canada. We've got one project. We're working with a CNDR, a national registry. So we're also working with Statistics Canada. We're working with uh, Health Data Research Network Canada. So that's in progress. And I'm also now on the steering committee for RWE for Decisions. So I'm getting to meet people internationally. I'm co-authoring a paper about real world data. So, you know, we're trying to make those international connections as well. Next slide. And we do have our, an RWE steering committee. And 
bringing these people together and it's creating relationships, right? It's once you know each other, that's when things start happening. So we're meeting regularly with Cadet Health Canada, uh, Durhain's there, Inest, PCPA, CIHR, IMC Biotech, Statistics Canada, Kai Hai, HDRN, and, and then invited experts for projects. Next slide. And then for real world data generation, like, and so we've talked a lot about data and, you know, so the people at Cadet have to sit and how it's so important for them, they have to be consistent and standard, right? How are they going to appraise the data that comes in? So there is the request tool, which was created by over 20 HTA agencies in Europe. I think it's a pretty good tool and I think it could be applied. And what I would like is all of you to go back and appraise your registry, your data with that tool. And we want to hear from you. Was this no way? Like we're already hearing, this was really hard to do. This took time to do. So we're providing support to registries to give you some money to pay someone to do the work, to do this request tool. But then we want to know this is too hard or this doesn't fit for us because of what? But we need a way to be standardized in appraising the data that's coming in. And so everyone gets treated in the same way. And we say, yes, this is good quality or not, does it fit the purpose? And what are those standards gonna be? That's gonna be really hard, but we're starting. Um, we've got an inventory, so we're, we're meeting with registries. And so, you know, I'm learning more registries today. So we wanna speak to you and we are looking for, and I'm hearing lots of case studies today where we wanna publish that in the Cadeth Journal and put it out there for everyone else to read. What are some success stories? So we've got two lined up, but we're looking for more and we can provide support for you and you know, just to, to help you write a paper, even if you're smaller, but we wanna know something important to learn, which I've heard so much today already, and we wanna put it out there. Next slide. And then we, you know, we have now, it's recently been announced. So Cadeth is now gonna be the host of post-market drug evaluation. So I don't see any reason why that can't also apply to rare disease. So that's supposed to be starting in uh, September. So we're supporting them because that's gonna be real world data, right? It's post-market, it's data that's already out there. So my, what my role, right? We're trying to, well, here's where data is. This is how we're gonna appraise it, um, all those sorts of things. So that's starting in September. Next slide. And, oh yeah, so there is um, an environmental scan was done just for things. These are all things that are available on the website, but there, a framework was done to see what other countries, what do they do for rare disease? and. You know, I sent a note already go, oh, guys, we're three out of 10, you know? Um, so tell us, we're open, the doors are open, tell us what you want. Like, I'm letting you know, it's open for feedback. Tell us what's wrong, we can take it, I certainly can. We have a new scientific advice program now for RWE, okay? So that's open for business. Working with literature review, how do we review the literature to include RWE? That's new for CADF. And there, it's an open consultation right now for non-sponsored reimbursement reviews. So you guys have your chance, lay it out there, send it in, and uh, you're, you will be heard. I can guarantee that. Next slide. I think that's my last one. Yeah, so everyone knows that. But we did a, we did a plain language primer, but, you know, that's... I mean, we've said that a million times today. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. I know that we're right up against um, lunchtime, but I'm hoping that maybe we can just get a few questions. Is that okay, Bill? I, I don't know. If we can get an indulgence there, I know lunch is being set up, but um, if we can get it, I think Marshall raised his hand. All right, Marshall, jump up here and you know, uh, give us a question here. And if Pranish, maybe this is your cue to get back up here if you want to, I don't know. real world evidence and trying to apply Delphi criteria and the standards is simply the denominator problem. Uh, you know, that your A, B, C, and D level of evidence, you never get A, meta-analysis of large studies, you never get B. 
The problem with C is published studies after the initial description tend to actually teach to the margins. You get the unusual variation there. So one thing I'd love for you to consider, you want to have standard application of doing that, but you can't take something that impacts a million people yeah. and apply it to something that impacts yeah. five. Yeah. It's a very different set yeah. of data. Yep. So when you're making decisions around funding and things like that, do keep that in mind. That would be yep. a lesson I've learned and have the scars to prove it. <laughs> So it gets us back in, as you say, the rear space there and what it is that really is relevant to. And I think that's, you know, kind of the challenge is why so gets excited about things like um, Aaron's program. You know, how do we take stuff that is really loose out there and how do we put it back into the individual? OK, Bill, I think you had a couple questions or online that we might want to bring in as well. Yeah, I've been tracking the Zoom. So uh, thanks for contributing your questions and, and participating even from afar. Um, there were two questions, one on uh, data um, security in terms of privacy issues. How do we make sure that, that patients know how their data is being used? Uh, and then the second question is about quality assurance. Uh, this is from Thierry uh, Lacaz. If, if all of this is coming in, if, if you're waving this, this hundreds of pages uh, above you about, you know, we're going to mine this data, how are we sure that that's actually of reasonable quality that AI can actually get in there and, and you make it useful? Okay, so let's start with the first, because I know it came from one of our patient listeners here who may be on the whole issue around security and privacy. Um, I know that everybody alluded to it and everybody talked about it a bit, but maybe I'll toss it back over to you, to anybody, I suppose, in terms of, you know. Go ahead. I can talk a little bit of, I don't know if it's microphone. I can talk a little bit about uh, patient consent and privacy. Um, you know, we talked, and I think, Erin, you mentioned it as well, people, follow PEPIDA, but we do have an informed consent process where we really talk to the patient so they understand how their data is going to be used. Um, and they have access, they own their data. If they need their data back, if they want it deleted, if they want it destroyed, they have the right to do that. So we follow that standard, work with the manufacturers to design those consents. On the storage of the data too, we invest a lot in the systems that we're storing the data to protect it. Um, quality assurance, validation of the systems, and backup systems to ensure that we're protecting the data at all, at all costs. Also, if we are transporting the data out of Canada, we do store everything in Canada on Canadian servers. In some cases, when we're doing part of a global study, we're working with a global manufacturer, um, we do have to honour different types of international data laws, like GDPR, for example, or CCPA, um, you know, in, in the US, and so our teams are all trained. Um, you know, everybody at NMR has to follow that training to protect the data. And again, if the patient wants their data destroyed or back or doesn't want their data to be shared, they have the right to not have their data shared. So it's continue informed consent from the yeah, point correct. of view of the patient. The patient at the end of the day continues to own that data and has control over it. Can I raise the reverse of this is that I'm on so many meetings about data and patients, what we're told, patients think their data can be shared, especially for rare disease, so we can use it for decision makings. And we've got industry here, often patient support programs, there's no consent to share that data. So we can't look at it, you know? And, and but even if patients, I have other examples where there is informed consent, that's gonna be published in an international manual, but then the provinces, because of those laws, still wouldn't just say, was the patient alive or dead? Sorry, we're not allowed to tell you, but the patient consented. So we got to look from both sides, you know? It's really getting our systems to catch up with where the reality is, and I yeah. think that's a huge challenge. Pam, I'm going to ask you, because I know you're still online, hopefully. You know, what do you, what do you hear from the patient organizations, and what do you guys train and tell them in terms of setting up these registries? What do they need to be aware of? And I know U.S. laws are not that different in some respect from the Canadian or international laws. Um. Well, believe it or not, there are some folks who don't recognize that the, the study design, including the consent components, should be reviewed by an ethics board. And so that is one thing out of the gate um, that we offer. And we offer um, you know, templates for consent. I think the key thing is to ensure the flexibility, ensure transparency, ensure that people on the platform really understand what they're consenting to and know exactly how to change it if they wanna change it and what the implications of changing it are. 
I think it's it's really a matter of educating and empowering people, not only educating them about the concepts, but empowering them um, to understand what their rights are and how they take action if they wanna take action. Um, we also spend a lot of time on data sharing agreements and data sharing terms, uh, whether the data be identifiable or de-identifiable data. And it's important for those who patient advocacy organizations who are you know, developing these um, studies and potentially sharing data um, with rate researchers and those developing therapies, um, that they understand what their rights are as well. Uh, I know from the US perspective, we've been um, talking um, a lot lately with the FDA who see people coming to them with perhaps different levels of knowledge, around what the roles and responsibilities are and what rights people have. And so we're talking with them about how do we ensure that we can, people are well-informed and well-educated, what kinds of resources can we put out there that are publicly available to people so that they all you know, under, interpret um, these rules and these laws um, correctly. Thanks a lot, Pam. And I really wanted to bring that in because I know as you're working with the patient groups, patients are really keen to kind of get in there, collect the data because they want to have the information. And I think sometimes they're a little bit stupefied when you actually have to do all the legal work in, in, ahead of time. But it's so important, as you say. Pranish, I think you wanted to. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't uh, repeat anything that was already said, but I, um, I think many good things there were covered. I think uh, for the informed rear work, we do have an ethics uh, um, pillar, you know, really in terms of the work being done. And a lot of the issues do center around these types of uh, conversations that we're having. I think, uh, you know, the question about do patients know that their information may not travel mm -hmm. to and, and may not be shared or shareable is just as important. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the contexts that we're looking at in terms of clinic shared and um, patient shared information is, is there an expectation for either, you know, for the other to see? So if a patient has reported, uh, a patient reported outcome into a research data set, uh, there has to be clarity as to whether or not a clinician may or may not see that. And, you know, one of the ethical issues is what if there's a, something actionable or something where the patient may feel they have communicated that to someone, but actually hasn't gone to their care team. So I, I think, you know, there's an ethics layer yeah. on top of a privacy layer, on top of a threat layer, you know, in terms of thinking about all of these things. So I just wanted to voice that. Yeah, and we'll come back to it. I think for industry, of course, there's another whole set of responsibilities that are in there as well in terms of when you hear and get information, what do you need to do with it? But I think the opposite point, I think is Lori and you both raised is sometimes patients believe that in fact I'm contributing this yeah. I want it to benefit exactly. and oh my gosh David I see you're still online maybe we can close with you I know people need to get to lunch but from a patient perspective and hemophilia has been doing patient registries like forever so we're one of the communities that has a lot of experience in terms of patients what do you feel in terms of you know where the patient sits in this in terms of data security and privacy but also the sharing of the information well, I think, you know, all of the great things you're talking about need to be in place and, you know, needs to be informed consent. We all agree to that. I would say that most patients don't have a clue uh, once they've signed it, they've, they forget what, what they've agreed to. Um, and it becomes a question of trust. Um, do they trust the people who have built that system? Uh, in our case, it's, it's a network of, of clinicians. And I think there is probably a lot more trust there than there would be for um, a system which is you know, go through a patient support program and a, and a company that's supplying a product. Um, so uh, it's 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 not just the you know the nuts and bolts of the of, of the rules and whether people agree to them. It's 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 do I trust the people who are running this? Thank you so much, David. I knew you'd bring in a, an important nuance in there. You know, and I mean, listen to people like Aaron, and we're talking about, you know, Orion and other people that are actually manipulating the data, right? I have not a clue as to what you're doing with it, actually. I have no idea in terms of technology, though I will say, if you ever want to hear a wowing experience, you need to have Aaron's team take you through a translation of an EMR into something that becomes data points and actually see it in real time. It'll blow your mind in terms of, at least if you're not part of that world, certainly did for me. Uh, but I think beyond that, as David says, I don't know what 
the nuances and the details of much of it, right? But if I trust you and we have a partnership or a relationship where I know that we can be trusted, but also back to what um, I think Sandra says, and that is I have the right at any time to either see or to know what's being done or to actually have the right to say no more. There's a lot of other issues on here that we can talk about, and we won't necessarily hear. We can talk about parents consenting for children, what happens when children become of age, and what happens to that information. So there's huge issues here. It's not trivial, it's a big deal. But I just wanted us to be able to know that in Canada, we have such amazing resources, we have such amazing experience, and we are actually building systems that are going to be fit for purpose. But maybe what Lori says is that we're gonna do it, learning, learning together, and we're gonna to have to take some risks and we may screw up sometimes, hopefully not in any way that's gonna harm people really, but we have to take those chances. And it's good to hear that that is what's taking place. And Cadiz is not what we would call risk-taking enterprise. So we need to make, <laughs> and they're getting pushes on all sides, right? Yeah. And absolutely so, but we need to. And even as much as you're saying, I think a lot of us are saying also, can we get out of the process and get the outcomes in terms of what that system is? And I know Lori, you're the one, the first that said, we just have to do it. So thanks so much to our amazing panel. Really, you, can you believe it's just been this morning? Is, this is one quarter of what it is that we're going to get out of this conference. So if you feel overwhelmed already, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, so enjoy lunch. We will be back. We have to do it properly. Yeah, pro uh, yeah. Promptly at one.
Hmm. <laughs>
Yeah. Yes. Uh, so do we, we, we not yet. Well, not yet. Yes. Us. You're in the second half. Oh, okay, so we're so, doing separate halves. Okay, perfect. We got these ones first. Okay. So it's the patients. Yeah. So okay. But they're all patients. Not this one. Yeah. Well. Yes. But then here. Okay, we have Catherine coming first. Come, come, come this way, darling. Thank you. Sir Hahn? The new WHL. What? The first, uh, what am I doing? The 
patient experience panel. So, no, what am I doing with this microphone? What am I doing with this microphone? Tell them to come up. Oh. Beth and Stephanie are up there. Already. Oh, yeah. Hello, we're going to get started. Those of you who have not finished eating, you may continue to eat, but we do have to get started again. I need my, my agenda. If I can get um, the rest of our patient panels up here, I would be really appreciative. I think I've got um, Beth and Stephanie are here, as usual, always way ahead of time and leading the way. <laughs> um, we're gonna have Ed and Marlene and Michael and Marguerite are unfortunately not able to be here in person, but they'll be online. Catherine is already here and cute, so we're ready there. Um, Carrie is online, oh, great, okay. Anne, Anna Man. Anna Man, Tyler, and Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, I saw earlier as well. If we can get you to come up here, that'd be great. All right, this is working. I said Tyler, right? I said Tyler. Okay, cool. Yeah. Up here. Yeah. Up here. Brilliant. Okay, we've got it. Okay. Um, we're really starting into what is going to be the core of where we wanting to go in terms of a rare disease strategy, and that is building the infrastructure. So you heard this morning around the patient registries, which is a huge component of it. What we wanted to do was start off back to, I think, what everybody's talking about, and that is how do we ensure that we've got the optimal patient experience. And I think what you will hear is that, in fact, we're far from the optimal patient experience. I think the thing that Susanna Graf said this morning, she's not here, but we're gonna hold her to it, and that is she does not want patients to have to go through spending their entire time from a diagnosis to knowing there's a treatment to trying to fight for that treatment. And I'm looking at people who know exactly what the hell I'm talking about. We also have a number of patients here or representatives from a patient community, which are looking forward in terms of the next therapies. And we really want to say, we do not want you to hand your legacy on to the others. We want people to be able to learn from what it is that we're doing and to make sure we can build that system, as we say, so that people who finally do have the opportunity to have access to a treatment are not spending their entire lives trying to get access to that treatment as opposed to living it. So this is amazing. I will also say that this is an amazing panel. And certainly to Marlene and Ed and to uh, Michael and Marguerite who are online, these are people who've actually gotten access to treatment. And same with Stephanie and same with um, Beth on behalf of her daughter and who have said, we're not done fighting. We're not ready to walk away. We're not just going back and saying, okay, you know, and Catherine, who I think has been a huge representative of the ongoing challenges in terms of, yes, we can do it here, maybe, in, well, we're not in Quebec, but in Quebec, but we need to be able to do it broadly. I think that's what we're talking about here. So this is so important. So what I'm gonna do is just immediately turn it over to, and we'll hear from each person in turn. I've asked them to keep it to five minutes only because we've got so many people we want to get on here. And we really want you just to provide us with what was it that was important key for you and where do you think this needs to go next so i'm going to ask you to try to do as best as you can to condense what is a lifetime of work into a few chris statements here. so we're going to start with marlene i think you're online for us i am okay introduce yourself ed and marlene are really one of some of our long long standing um patient advocates and marlene 
And Ed, I'll let you introduce yourself and the scenario. Ed and Marlene from Fabrice. Hi, I'm Marlene. I'm married to Ed. Uh, he's not on this uh, today. He, um, we've had COVID and uh, he's had the extreme headache post COVID. So uh, he's not functioning real well. So uh, anyway, we're hoping the headaches go away shortly. So I'm gonna do my best um, to um, share with you our journey on Fabry's disease. Um, I just gotta see if I can read my slides. Um, just hold on. I practiced this, but you know how it is with technology. It makes me nervous. Okay. So Ed uh, was diagnosed in 2001 with uh, Fabry's disease. It's an X-linked, um, life-threatening lysosomal storage disease caused by a deficiency of a key enzyme, alpha-gal. It accumulates uh, in all the cells and tissues. It's an ultra orphid disease. It's one in 40,000 to uh, one in 117,000. Uh, the diagnosis is difficult. It can take an average of 17 years. Uh, for Ed, it, he was 43 years old when um, he was diagnosed because he had total kidney failure. Life expectancies for males at the time was between 40 and 50. Uh, and in the Conan family, once we uh, did some family history, uh, it was anywhere from the age of 32 to 48. Um, Fabry's disease symptoms are stroke, hearing loss, vertigo, uh, Ed's had those. Heart failure, um, he has heart issues. Uh, we were diagnosed through the kidney failure. Uh, he's never been able to sweat and is quite intolerant of extreme cold or extreme heat gastrointestinal uh, angiochromas, uh, extreme pains in the hands and feet. These were all the things that we... Um, so treatment available is 20 plus years, uh, enzyme replacement uh, therapy and um, Fabrizyme and Replegal are the two. Uh, we started treatment in May of 2001. And after 20 years, um, of initially fighting to get the drug. And Ed, here in Alberta, we got it fairly quickly. Uh, my memory is going across the country um, advocating for all of the other Fabry patients to be able to get treatment in their province. Um, so it's just very sad to hear that other um, rare disease patients are having to go through that same journey. So science has proved its effectiveness. Uh, one, Ed is still alive. Uh, so we know that. And um, really, he should have been dead at 50. So he'll be 64. And he's, um, I guess he's, yeah, he just keeps plugging away one foot in front of the other. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I guess I just want to say it's one thing uh, for the person with the rare disease, and it's quite another for those who are journeying beside them. Uh, so there's lots that uh, it's quite a journey, <laughs> to put it mildly. But uh, we're plugging away, and um, yeah, he's he's not a well man, and yet he lives his life well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene. And I think that's kind of the statement that we want, right? And we do know that, you know, this was one of those first treatments that came out, which really shook the drug plans. And uh, Marlene kind of condensed the access journey to a few statements, but indeed it was a huge fight. And I hate to say it, we know that there are some therapies coming through that are going through those same fights today. So thank you very much. And thank you for staying in there. I'm going to flip over then to, um, I think, Marguerite, you're going to speak on behalf of you and Michael, or maybe both of you. Oh, no, you're both there. Okay, go. All right. Yeah, we'll share the duties. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, apologies for not being there in person. Uh, we've had to deal with uh, quite a bit of uh, medical setbacks over the last month, so... Um, but we're glad that we're able to uh, participate. So Michael will uh, share what he has and then I'll take over from there. Anyways, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm Michael Eigenram. 
I have atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, also known for short acronym AHUS. It's an ultra rare chronic life-threatening disease that affects about two in a million people each year. Part of the immune system known as the complement system becomes uncontrolled, causing infl inflammation and blood clots in small blood vessels. The clots can lead to sudden serious medical problems like heart attack, stroke, hemolytic anemia, low platelets, and organ failure. I had acute kidney failure, was on dialysis for 17 years, and I'm unable to work due to chronic fatigue. When I became sick in 2002, I was misdiagnosed for over eight years with another rare blood disease, and the only therapies available were blood plasma treatments and dialysis, which are very burdensome. I was finally diagnosed properly with AHUS in 2011. Health Canada approved eclizumab in 2013. It was the first and only treatment that controlled the complement system in AHUS patients. It prevents organ damage and gives those on dialysis a chance for a successful kidney transplant. This gave us new hope since my first kidney transplant, which was donated by my wife beside me here, uh, back in 2006, it began failing immediately because of the underlying disease. This was devastating and I was not eligible for another kidney transplant unless supported by eculizumab to prevent a relapse of my AHUS. I finally got access to eculizumab after a second kidney transplant this past October. This meant finally getting off dialysis after 17 years and giving us opportunities we did not have for many years like improved health, more energy, ability to work and travel and participate in normal life activities. And I just want to give a shout out to, before I give it over to Marguerite, to Suzanne McGurn for her statements this morning and the changes she's making at Cadiz. She was also a part of the, uh, the whole process of us getting access and helped us make it possible. Of course, there's a lot of work on our part, but she was facilitating it. So I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, we were... We uh, were asked by uh, Durhan, uh, you know, what our main barriers were to get access to the drug and um, just uh, wanted to let you know that, uh, you know, what we went through as an uh, organization and also just personally. Um, the main barriers were that the, the uh, negative common drug review from CADF, uh, not to list eculizumab, uh, was a big barrier. And uh, because of that negative uh, recommendation, uh, all the provinces except Quebec I decided not to fund the treatments. Um, we were told that there was not enough evidence, um, which is hard to get if you're uh, dealing with a rare disease. But um, even though the trials were small, the results were absolutely life-changing. And the treatment was hailed by experts around the world as a breakthrough treatment. Um, lack of randomized control trials was an issue, but experts shared it would be ha have been unethical to do a placebo due to the life-threatening condition of this disease. And um, for us, um, I guess the biggest barrier was uh, the cost of treatment. Uh, we were told on many occasions that the per, per person cost of the treatment was too expensive, um, but we didn't think that the cost was always judged fairly because the significant healthcare cost of old therapies being replaced should be considered when looking at new therapy costs, not to mention the improved quality of life for patients. And just an example, like the cost of dialysis for all these years, was never uh, taken into account when they were looking at the cost of uh, eclizumab. Uh, you know, we obviously uh, think that it should not be a price being put on uh, people's lives and people do not choose to have a rare disease and they should have access to treatment regardless of cost. Um, you know, in order to get, uh, in order to get funding, uh, we are part of uh, patient group AHS Canada. And we were very frustrated that even though eclizumab was approved by Health Canada, that's the provinces were not willing to fund it, and which meant that most patients were left without access. And knowing that there is a life-changing and life-saving treatment available, but not having access was extremely frustrating to say the least. Um, it took our organization of volunteers many hours of advocating for over four years to get public funding. Uh, we had many meetings with uh, provincial health ministries, bureaucrats, MPPs and MPs, to educate them with uh, about AHRS and often we were accompanied by expert physicians to convince them how important it was for patients to have access to this life-changing treatment. 
Um, fortunately, we had to do a lot of media interviews, um, TV and newspaper. Uh, they were done by patients and families to raise awareness in different parts of Canada to get funding, as there were sick patients that were desperate of treatments, some of them in life-threatening condition. And it's very sad that not only do you have to fight for your life, but then you also have to fight your own government to get access to treatment. Um, we also uh, send a lot of um, thousands of petitions uh, were gathered and presented to uh, several provincial health ministers. Um, since we live in Ontario and most of our board members are in Ontario, um, most of the meetings we had were in Ontario because that's where we live. But the hope was that once we had public funding in Ontario, that other provinces would follow. And eventually our hard work paid off. And as far as we know, um, since 2017, most provinces in Canada have some public funding of the clues map. However, it's still limited and only available on a case by case basis. And Ontario is probably the only province that has written public criteria. So it's very hard to figure out what criteria each um, province has. And even though we were successful in getting uh, funding, there is still uncertainty about the length of treatment since renewals have to be made every six to 12 months. And sometimes patients are taken off treatment against specialists' strong recommendations. So, and then if you're... I think we've just <clears throat> lost the actual live feed, but I think we got the most of that. And I think what you're getting very strongly, of course, is that message again. You know, it takes a great deal. I, it breaks my heart whenever I, and I will have um, both um, Beth and Stephanie speak to it in terms of the cystic fibrosis scenario. And many years, you know, after the first Fabrice, Oh my goodness.
deterioration of motor neurons and loss of function. And yet, we still don't have systematic newborn screening for SMA across the country. It's still a work in progress. So two years later, there are still babies being born in Canada with undetected SMA um, and uh, who are losing the opportunity of a normal development because they're diagnosed too much to benefit from the full effectiveness of the therapy. Um, in my opinion, uh, newborn screening should have been automatic for a condition like SMA when we know that there are treatments on the way and the SMA community of patients knew that this was on the way for a very long time. Um, so Is this no used for the, the counter the listing? I'm not sure. I wasn't sure what the use was. So I'm speaking from a place of privilege today uh, because I have access to my instructions what to make. was the first treatment for SMA to be approved by Health Canada in 2017. Spinoza was approved by Health Canada you know to treat all SMA patients of all ages and disease states. Um, to this day, Quebec remains the only province that has recognized the therapeutic value based on therapeutic promise of this treatment for patients of all ages, in spite of the uncertainty of clinical data. I was lucky to gain access at a time when I could feel a decline in my condition, uh, losing strength and function, and developing chronic pain issues. Today, I can say that I've stabilized, I've regained some of my strength, uh, which is giving me the ability to speak to you today, and I no longer have pain issues. So we have growing uh, real-world evidence, including published studies from countries in Europe and lived experience right here in Canada in Quebec that supports the effectiveness and safety of Spinraza in adults for SMA type 2 and 3. And yet, CADIS has recently uh, reiterated its recommendation not to reimburse Spinraza for adults over 18. Cadiz and others have said that they want to support and expand the use of real-world evidence, and I applaud that. And yet they're requiring more randomized control trials at a juncture when it's unethical to do so for adults with SMA. Adults with SMA in Canada 
are now suffering from rampant, rampant decline in mental health, knowing that if they lived in Quebec, they would have the chance to stabilize the progression of their condition and maintain the precious function that they have left. Spinraza should be seen as an opportunity to advance real world evidence in Canada, not divide our community into the haves and have nots. Um, in my opinion, uh, a rare, a smart, uh, rare drug and rare disease strategy should see these innovative therapies as opportunities to modernize our approach to healthcare and would recognize the transformative outcomes that research and innovation are bringing to our doorstep. Thank you. Hello, Catherine, that was brilliant. Thank you so very much for your courage, for your continuing advocacy. Um, I think this is what we see from our community. Right? So this is the past, sort of the past, sort of the future as well. I mean, quite frankly, Stephanie should never have been in the position of needing to advocate based on what we already learned, you know, with Kaleidico in terms of what the benefits could be and what the international experience was, quite frankly. And quite frankly, as you say, when we look at the rest of the world in terms of, you know, the approvals for adults and most recently in other European countries, the UK and Germany and France, where SMA for adults or SMA for all ages has been approved on the basis of real world evidence. We heard the talks about real world evidence and I think what you're hearing here is, let's see it in action. If we really mean it, that speech should not have been necessary. And I think that's what we're talking about, even with the newborn screening. You know, we did a couple pilot projects and kudos to the industry and to muscular dystrophy and the SMA community for getting those pilots done so that we can get agreements to have newborn screening in some of the provinces, but that never needed to be done. And I think most of us know from the patient side, the evidence and the proof you're looking for is already there if you're willing to accept it. So now we get to do a turn a little of corner here. And we're going to introduce several patient patient representatives who are going to talk to us about therapies that are right now coming into Canada. And I think our challenge out there to the system is, are we going to see a different trajectory? Or are these patients going to go through, you know, what we heard in terms of Fabrice, what we heard in terms of AHUS, what we heard in terms of, you know, cystic fibrosis and an SMA? Are we going to give these patients a different pathway to go, you know? If we don't do anything different, they're gonna go the same pathway. And I've already had some of these patients come to me and say, what can we do to do a GoFundMe? What can we do to have an advocacy campaign? How do we set up our letters of appeal? And I'm saying, oh my God, that is not what we should be about. But unless we get some changes, you know, what you heard, right, is buckle up. So anyway, I don't mean to mean that broad and badly. I think Carrie's online and she's gonna be the first up here. Carrie, Carrie Connell, who's with the Canadian FOP Network. If you can introduce yourself and kind of where we are right now in terms of a therapy and what you're hoping for. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm coming in from London. Thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel at this important event. I wish I could be there in person. I'm gonna apologize in advance if you hear barking because I have a dog. Um, the condition that I'm representing is fibrodysplasia syphagans progressiva. It's FOP for short. FOP is a disabling orthopedic condition. The FOP gene uses the skeletal muscles and connective tissues as scaffolding and builds a second skeleton. Bone forms in muscles, tendons, and connective tissues progressively restricting movement and locking joints, including jaws, shoulders, elbows, hips, knees, etc. Um, FOP is unpredictable, uh, but physical and viral trauma cause progression. Pattern of progression is upper body in childhood, lower body in adolescence, with most being in a wheelchair by the second decade of life. The diaphragm, tongue muscles, eyes, and heart are generally not affected. It's unpredictable and also impacts other systems in the body less studied, such as the GI system. There's evidence of calcification on the brain causing seizures. Skeletal differences, arthritis, spinal deformity, cardiopulmonary pulmon function, and respiratory health issues, limb swelling, dislocations, as well as kidney stones, etc. Um, lifespan is also shortened. Intelligence and cognitive abilities are normal. 
So a healthy mind locked inside a frozen body. The prevalence was thought to be one in 2 million, but newer information um, estimates it is actually one in 1 million. The drug therapy that we are seeking, ultimately we're seeking a therapy that will impact the gene expression upstream and prevent the catastrophic metamorphosis of muscle death and ossification. Currently, we're seeking access to the first drug that prevents and lessens HO um, heterotopic ossification form during and after a flare-up. Health Canada has approved Sahonos, um, which was known by the name of Pelaveritine, as the first treatment for um, FOP that reduces the amount of HO taken chronically and or episodically for flare-ups. Um, it is the first approval for this drug worldwide. Um, a drug therapy um, that would benefit children and adults. So hormones prevents um, and lessens the amount of heterotopic ossification accumulated during and after a flare-up. This can lessen the disability. The hope is that in the future, there's gonna be a cocktail of drugs that will allow for surgery. The surgery will remove excess bone and restore more range of motion. The less bone, the better the outcome. A lot of the times we talk about saving the FOP kids. Better health um, from a treatment means less HO um, for better circulation as muscles with HO don't move blood through the body as easily and there is more edema, wounds, and neuropathy. Um, potential impact on calcium spots that can form in the brain that is responsible for seizure disorders in some of the FOP patients. We hope that this treatment will improve the quality of living, will give hope for a better life, will increase the independence and keep independence longer in these kids and these adults. Um, we're also hoping that we can get potential for future surgeries. Surgeries are contraindicated as well as intramuscular injections because they can cause trauma and FOP flare-ups and progression of the disease. Surgery could free patients from being stuck in unnatural and painful positions that are permanent. Jaw surgery would allow access for better nutrition. So instead of pulling teeth at the side of the mouth to allow space to get food into somebody's mouth um, and to alleviate anxiety, um, there's a lot of anxiety in somebody who has a fused jaw that um, if they get sick, they can't clear the vomit. Um, and it also allows for better dental care as well and heads off a lot of difficulties there. The main barriers, um, for us to begin with, we're getting pharma interested in having them come to Canada, despite um, the cap on spending for drugs that Canada has set, the lack of orphan drug framework, and the cost and effort to meeting the filing requirements for each province, as well as finding patients for clinical trials from a small pool of candidates in vast geography. We feel very fortunate. Cost will be an issue. Not everyone will have insurance. Families will need access to patient support programs offered by pharma, private and provincial drug benefit plans, Health Canada Special Access Program, Trillium, and their other grants. They will pay out of pocket, do fundraising, and will have to enroll in clinical trials. Um, lack of orphan drug framework uh, plan across the provinces leaves families unsure if they are gonna be able to get the financial support and the same access to the drug equally in each province. Um, another barrier is finding the undiagnosed and ensuring that they know and that their doctors know about the treatment and how to access it, which is something that um, we're actively involved in right now, finding patients. Um, as far as achieving access to the drug, we don't yet have access um, other than those who are in clinical trials. Health Canada did approve uh, Sohonos earlier this year um, as the first approved treatment in adults and female children eight years and up and male children 10 years and up with FOP. Um, again, this marks the first approval for Sohonos worldwide. And this drug was actually a retooled drug that was developed out of Canada. Um, Ipsen has been working with patient groups and doctors to find the best methods for distribution and will help support the families to navigate the funding system and facilitate access along with our specialists. At this point in time, we don't know the cost of the drug for the patient yet or the distribution plan. Um, but again, it's a good problem to have because we're just grateful um, to have something that's been approved. Thank you. I mean, I think as Carrie indicated, there are numerous barriers. So it has been approved by Health Canada. Yes. It has not yet gone into 
the application at Cadiz yet, but I think it will do that. We can imagine what might be the reaction. It's not going to be life-saving. It's not going to be, at the end of the day, probably the last therapy for this community. But as we all know, incremental is what we're looking for, and certainly to be able to, as Carrie indicated, to stave off the effects of flare-ups, to be able to keep the child or the adult even from having further calcification is hugely important, even if we anticipate that there will be the need for more therapies or, as you say, cocktail therapies coming forward. So here's our quick chance. The drug is just coming in. Are we going to see it going through the same route as AHUS? Are we going to see it going through the same kinds of challenges as the cystic fibrosis drugs, or can we take a different path here? Thank you very much, Carrie. I know you're waiting in your own family for access to the therapy, so we appreciate very much your story and your taking the time. So let me move quickly to Anna Mann, <laughs> I know. Um, who's going to talk to us about a, a new therapy that's coming in for a um, for porphyria, and um, again, maybe a little bit of the background into it, where we are now, and what you might hope is going to happen in terms of access to this therapy. Okay, thank you, Darhane. Um, thank you, everyone else who's up here. It's just so inspiring to hear your stories, and I feel very out of place because I am not a patient, but we have some patients here who are afraid to come up, so I'm talking. <laughs> um, so um, I uh, am working with the Canadian Association for Porphyria, and porphyria is a group of genetic disorders. Um, it's a rare disease that is associated with the way your body makes heme, which is an important protein in your body. Um, and one group of the porphyrias is called the acute hepatic porphyrias. And um, that type of porphyria is characterized by attacks in which you have really, really intense, overwhelming abdominal pain. Um, people describe it as being stabbed by like a thousand flaming swords. Um, it causes nausea and vomiting. It attacks your nerves. You can end up um, becoming paralyzed, losing your limb function, having organ damage. It can cause seizures um, and in some cases death. And so I think it's really important to emphasize that like every time you have an attack, it could be the attack that kills you, it could be the, the attack that leaves you paralyzed. Um, up till very recently, there were no treatments that would prevent attacks from happening. You could lessen the impacts, but once they were in progress, um, you were just trying to minimize their impact. You couldn't really stop them. Um, in kind of desperation, there were a few treatments trying to induce menopause in women in their teens and 20s to try to prevent the attacks or lessen them, um, or liver transplants in livers that are actually healthy but won't stop producing this particular porphyrin. Um, and those aren't great options. So a few years ago, a new treatment came out. It's called Givoseran. Um, and it has been fairly effective in preventing attacks. Uh, it was submitted to Health Canada, it was approved, it went to Cadith, it got a positive recommendation at Cadith last August, um, and now we're just waiting. So um, some patients were able to get um, the treatment through compassionate access or because they participated in the trials, um, but for patients who maybe didn't have a diagnosis at that time or weren't having re recurring attacks kind of before it got approved, they're in this kind of limbo. The treatment is too expensive to kind of pay for on their own. There are a few private providers who are already insuring it, but most people don't have access to that. And so you're in the situation where you know this treatment is there. There actually already are people in Canada who are receiving it, but unless you're kind of in those fortunate groups, um, you're just kind of waiting. And, and you know, that's a terrible feeling. <laughs> so um, I, our understanding is it's now being negotiated with the PCPA and we're just looking towards kind of the next step, which is, you know, every province needing to, to take it and, and it being a bit of a battle. Um, and um, also, you know, I mentioned this is one type of porphyria. There are other kinds of porphyria that, in one case, a treatment exists, um, but it hasn't been submitted to Health Canada. There are other treatments that are being developed, and we're kind of looking at this being something that we're going to have to go through again. Um, and so, you know, we hope that it will be better and smoother, and it sounds like it's been a bit easier for us than um, some other conditions, but I, I hope it's something that um, just in general improves for everyone. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Thank you very much, Anna. And I know the patient community really appreciates the work that you're doing on, on the behalf of. I mean, and again, you know, we're talking about maybe the first of many therapies coming up, not necessarily going to be the definitive treatment in terms of being able to say, okay. And it's really difficult, as we know, for approvals and for negotiations for conditions that are not just constant, but are, as you say, episodic. 
this is really a big challenge in terms of the health service, in terms of our negotiation systems being able to recognize that. And, pre and treatments that are somewhat considered preventive, right? So we will prevent a flare up. We will prevent, you know, an attack. And the system has a hard time appreciating kind of what that really means. It's sort of like, what? It doesn't stop it. It doesn't cure it. It doesn't absolutely. So these are challenges, right, in terms of getting the right endpoints there. I mean, in, in, in an ideal world, what you would do is that you would give the clinicians the opportunity to prescribe the therapy at the minute it is actually approved, quite frankly. And in many countries, like in France, you have early access programs. Patients would get access. They would actually then, in the background, the negotiations go on. In the background, the other you know, assessments go on. In the background, we collect the real world evidence to really be able to document as we go down the road in terms of what the benefits are. And this is not something that's going to be easy to demonstrate the benefits are, because again, we're talking about episodic. You know, so if we reduce one episode, is that good? Is it not? If we have episodes that patients are experiencing maybe only a few times a year, what does that mean? I think those are really difficult measures. But in the meantime, you're letting patients wonder, am I going to have another attack? And I think that's, you know, the challenges that we're talking about. We don't have a system that actually is set up, as David was saying earlier, we do not have an assessment system that is actually designed for these types of therapies. But most importantly, we have not got a system that says, treat the patients first. I mean, and when we hear people say, well, we can get a, you know, get a liver transplant, you know, that is not what you call an optimal. I remember back, way back to Fabrice, we were sitting down with a health minister in a province where there were a lot of patients with Fabrice, and sitting at the table. I think I've told this story before. There was like half a dozen, maybe eight guys, and me at this table with the health minister. And the health minister, in all of his innocence, says to the patient next to him, you know, we can't fund the therapy for you. You know, it's not approved by, you know, it wasn't recommended. We can't afford to fund it. He says, but if you have kidney failure, we will pay for your kidney transplant. And the patient sitting there next to the minister said without batting an eye, and minister, will you give me your kidney? <laughs> I mean, it was like uh, not understanding. What are you saying here? What's, you know, it was like, okay, we got stuff for you. We got a backup for you, right? And that's kind of where we need to change the system. And yet we laugh at it, right? But how many of you feel like we're still in that kind of a system where there's a lack of understanding and awareness of the huge impact it has on the patient and the family? And if we could prevent that, that is so much better than if we get to the end and say, okay, I can kind of off you, you know, a rescue. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to turn now to Tyler, who is here with Alter Renix, and maybe you can talk, tell us about this, again, a very, very rare condition, but where, which a treatment has been approved, and kind of where we are on that access trajectory. Sure, happy to do it, and first, thanks very much for including me in the panel, and I'd just like to echo Anna's comments and uh, thank our co-panelists for sharing their very touching stories today. Um, so we had a recent uh, very collaborative interaction with TADIF, which we thought we could highlight and maybe perhaps serve as a positive precedent, where uh, I know understand a lot of DRDs are still facing an uphill challenge. Um, we were essentially able to secure a final um, recommendation that was positive after an initial draft recommendation of do not reimburse. And we thought that this case really highlighted um, some really key considerations as we move forward to a broader rare disease drug strategy in Canada. Um, first, the need to look at non-standard adaptive clinical trial design for rare disease drugs. And secondly, the very central role that clinician and patient voices should play in making funding decisions. Um, so the drug uh, in question is called triheptanoin um, that Ultragenics has developed for a condition called long-chain long fatty acid oxidation disorder, a bit of a mouthful. Um, and these are a group of rare inherited um, um, genetic mutations in enzymes that uh, are required to metabolize long-chain fats. And long-chain fats are, of course, an essential um, energy source for skeletal and cardiac muscle as well as uh, in times of metabolic stress. So a very serious disease. Um, these patients uh, suffer acute metabolic crises and can be hospitalized, and there's, there's quite a high mortality rate in this patient population. Um, so triheptanoin um, basically has the ability to um, bypass this enzymatic defect and allow patients to metabolize long-chain fats and restore metabolic function, um, and has been shown to reduce hospitalizations in both uh, frequency and duration, so, uh, so potentially a promising therapy for, for some patients. 
Um, and in this case, of course, like many drugs for rare disease, uh, triheptanoin is not um, supported by pivotal trials that are the, the preferred um, you know, head-to-head uh, -head randomized control trial design. Uh, they implement a, a more adaptive trial design that is uh, quite appropriate in this case. Um, but CADET's initial read was that uh, because of the trial design and questions that it raised, that they were not able to uh, come to any conclusions about clinical benefit. Um, through their reconsideration process, however, we were given the opportunity to have a lot more back and forth with them, uh, really explain the clinical development program and the, uh, the rationale behind the pivotal trial designs, um, as well we were able to uh, provide additional data in both uh, real-world evidence and uh, some additional data cuts from our, our pivotal study. Um, and most importantly, there was very strong clinician support and consensus around place and therapy for triheptanoin and a strong patient community voice. Um, and what Ultragenics did was uh, support clinical criteria that were aligned with clinician consensus about where the drug should be used. So um, all in all, we, we hope that this is a, a case that demonstrates, you know, that it's possible uh, for CADETH that they have shown this willingness to look at adaptive trial designs and to really put uh, patient and clinician voices very central in their process. And uh, we hope it serves as a, pro a positive precedent going forward. I was so excited when I heard that because we do know that oftentimes in a reconsideration, almost all the time in a reconsideration, we actually don't get a different decision. So the fact, and as you say, the recognition in terms of some non-traditional, non-standardized uh, trial design. So this could be a good science to move forward. Of course, you still now have to go through all the other in terms nope, of negotiations. The fight continues. <laughs> in the fight continues. So yeah, is this is you know, uh, you know, it's it's really as you say the opportunity for us to look at, again, the a real answers for patients to get access right away. Mm -hmm. And to go back to the clinician who says, you know, is this valid? Should the patient be on it? And we'll collect the information as we go forth while we're negotiating. I mean, there's no God-given reason why we should be holding on to keeping patients from getting access while the negotiations are going on. I mean, at some point, it does get negotiated. We believe that. In m most cases, it gets to some negotiation. And even if the exact price isn't the price you're going to end up with, I don't think any company would ever say, we're not willing to renegotiate on the price. You know, if you've paid too much, fine. We'll give you some money back. If you haven't paid me enough, well, then fine. You know, come and give me some more money, right? <laughs> and quite frankly, you know how these payment schemes work. By the time you actually get the money received, it's going to be a long way down the road. So let's not pretend that we're cutting checks and handing them over tomorrow. So it's not working that way. So. I think it really is an opportunity. And now I'm going to turn to Jennifer Adams, who had the misfortune of writing to me about a month ago and said, I have this issue. And, or she was introduced to me by somebody else who says, go talk to Durhan. But I have this issue. She gets an ex with me. Meanwhile, she did manage to solve her intermediate issue through the company in the time. But I said, hey, how would you like to come and tell your story here? <laughs> And Jennifer says, I just happen to be in Ottawa. I said, that's even better. You can come in person. <laughs> so here we have, you know, the unwitten, you know, patient advocate who's now has coming forward. But really appreciate very much everything you're saying. And actually, Jennifer actually comes with a great deal of the medical community support. We were really pleased in terms of what you're bringing forward. So Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi. So I'm at the end because I think I am the last edition here. Uh, so um, my daughter, Abigail, is two and a half. And she was diagnosed with primary hyperoxaluria type 1 just about a year ago. Uh, she developed symptoms very early age. She definitely was now, in retrospect, looking back, she was a failure to thrive. She was 0.1 percentile for weight, 1 percentile for height. Um, she also had uh, like some kidney changes that they were, didn't really know exactly what was going on. So primary hyperoxaluria is from a rare genetic condition that causes an uh, enzyme defect in the liver that has an, uh, uh, the liver accumulates oxalate. The oxalate then combines with calcium that f forms toxic crystals and they get deposited throughout the body, primarily in the kidney, it leads to nephrocalcinosis, it leads to kidney stones, um, leads to renal failure, and eventual end-stage kidney disease. Um, the kind of supportive treatment that existed previously was increasing fluids, um, using B6 as trying to activate more of the enzyme production, uh, and then event, uh, some medications try and help preventing stone formation. 
and then eventually dialysis and liver kidney transplant. However, fortunately, um, when Abigail was diagnosed, I like did a whole bunch of research and found out that just recently in the States, there had been a medication that was approved called Lumacerin, or brand name is Oxlumo. And this is a small interfering RNA medication that is very novel in its technology. Um, so I brought this forward to our physicians and they actually were able to advocate and got special access um, and the company actually funded from a compassionate program for her. So she received her first dose in the end, at the end of August just last year and has been receiving doses since then. Since, um, since that time, just recently in March of this year, Health Canada did approve Lumacerin or Oxlumo um, as a medication and right now is going through the CADF process. This medication for us has been absolutely life altering. Um, she was like a tiny little sick girl. Um, she still was very happy. She's always still very personable, but now she's a thriving two and a half year old. Um, my husband has taken time off work to help care for her. She had a million different doctor's appointments kind of going through this. And like the plan is now like she's going to, he's going to go back to work and um, our life just seems so much more settled. It's been absolutely life altering for us. She is now the 75th percentile for weight and the 50th percentile for height. So huge, huge change. Uh, we, I mean, the standard medication and the diagnosis, the standard medications, but also we think that this medication has made a huge impact in her life and her life trajectory moving forwards as well. Um, can't say enough good things about how things are going so far, but obviously hearing everybody here, we're worried about what's coming down the pipe a little bit with um, CADETH and funding. Um, and that's where we're at and we're happy to be, I'm happy to be here and happy to present uh, what we're looking forward to moving forward. I think one of the things you came to me was the concern was that um, under the special access program, of course, is once the drug is approved, yes. you know, Health Canada does not necessarily continue, and the company has no obligation because the child was not in a clinical trial per se, right? She was just being given the drug on a compassionate basis. And what has been the outcome of your oh, conversation? So yeah, we've had really good back and forth with um, El Nylum, which is the company that makes Lumacerin or Oxlimo, and they are doing a bridging program at this point in time, so she's continuing to fund it. Wonderful, thank you. I mean, let me also mention that it is a bridging program, which means that the company's expecting that it's going to actually get an approval, and I think that's important for us to know. And certainly, companies have you know, to do these kinds of programs. Otherwise, they're funding patients for life, which is probably not what the company was setting up to do. So it is a bridging program. And we are really grateful, of course, that they have put it out there and not necessarily with a time limit on the bridge, but we do have to get the drug funded. And of course, there are other children that are not necessarily as fortunate in terms of already being started and probably unlikely to get started you know, with a compassionate access, given that the drug has now been approved. So this is again, those big gaps that we fall into. Many countries have early access programs once the drug is approved and they have early access labels. And I've had companies come to me and say, we would like to bring in an early access program. And I have to say, we have no provisions in Canada for early access programs. And it's like this shock of, we don't have early access programs here. No, we don't. We do not have it. And that has to be part of what we've got, right? That we have to have officially early access programs in order to expedite, especially in these situations, as you say. I mean, for her to be off therapy for another year and a half while we're negotiating. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's not what we're looking for. Okay. I want to just give a huge shout out to our panel. I know it's taking a little longer than we anticipated, but obviously the patient stories are so important. The patient lived experience is so important, but even more important are the patient voices and their continuing advocacy. And what we heard from Suzanne McGurn is, we never want to see this panel again. You got it? <laughs> we do not want to have next year coming up with another iteration and maybe you guys will be the first fold and we'll have another fold. We do not want that to happen. So that's our goal. We've got to find ways in which we don't have to keep doing this. Thank you so very much to all of us.
So we're going to do a very quick switch, and I'm going to invite up um, um, Alex Chambers from Novartis, and um, maybe I'll maybe I'll let you start, Alex, first, and then we'll. Um, I think we're going to go to Nigel online. Hopefully, he's there, and then we're going to invite up. Uh, uh, Jessica Brickle and uh, Lizanne Freelock-Chuck from uh, the um, from Sun Life and Candlelight. But we'll start with uh, Alex. And Alex, um, I've known for many years. Alex, as some of you know, was originally at Caddis and has now moved over to Novartis. But she's going to give us the uh, presentation on a drug study that was done, um, you know, under I think the banner of Novartis with a number of uh, stakeholders as well. So. A little bit like a movie set, right? Yeah, yeah. You watch the screen being recreated here. Okay, over to you, Alex. Great. So, uh, it's really great to be here. It's a little unsettling to be in a room of, of people, but it's it's wonderful at the same time. So I I think I've got some slides to come up and uh, and just, um, I was going to come up, I, I, well, and I will, uh, the CORD conference always brings together the most powerful patient voices and the patient stories and so, okay, <laughs> anyway, and it's just, it's hard to follow that act because it's just, it's so impactful what they have to say and so what I'm going to say is a little, little more uh, data focused and, and maybe uh, maybe a little little less uh, um, sympathetic, but I think I think this really does provide a big picture. And so before I get into it, I just want to thank Durhan, and I see Dr. Craig Campbell here, and I think uh, Dr. Leanne Ward was meant to be here as well. So they all worked. We all worked together on uh, on this study that we did. But what we were really trying to do and demonstrate is look at access uh, to rare diseases in Canada and compare it to Europe, and really try to understand. You know, what are what are we really talking about? We hear all the anecdotes, but can we actually put some some numbers around it? So what we did, and this work actually started about. Uh, two years ago, more than two years ago now. And so what we did was we wanted to look at all of the orphan drugs that had been approved by the EMA and look at how they had come into Canada and, and sort of do that contrast and compare between Europe and Canada. So there were three uh, key factors that we were looking at. So number one, the volume, the number of drugs coming in, just very sort of hard numbers, what's coming in. Next, we were looking at the rate of access, so what proportion of those drugs were actually publicly reimbursed. And so I will make the caveat and say that this is all about public reimbursement and what is on a public formulary. Obviously, there's a big private component in Canada, but so we really only focused on, on the public. And then thirdly, looking at timelines. Timeline. So those three key factors were what we were really looking at, and that was from January of 2015 to March of 2020. So this is what we found. So in that time period from January of 2015 to, uh, to March of 2020, there were 63 drugs with orphan drug status approved by the EMA. From that list of 63 drugs, 41 drugs had Health Canada approval. So already about a third have been, have been lost and not even coming into Canada for approval. Of those, 30 had a positive recommendation from Cadith, 20 from Ines in Quebec, and then of those, 24 had completed a negotiation uh, with the PCPA. So you can see, you know, the how the impact of that of starting with 63 and then having 24 of those actually get to the point of a PCPA uh, completed negotiation. It's a little bit of a busy slide, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. So on the left side is. Um, is the EMA uh, approval in the red bar and the European countries in terms of public reimbursement. You can see the countries along the bottom. Not surprisingly, we're all well aware that Germany has a very robust system and so, and they have a high level of public reimbursement of, of, of those, uh, those drugs approved by the EMA. 
In contrast, on the right, you've got the drugs with Health Canada approval. So keeping in mind that's, the, that's already the lower list of, uh, of number of drugs with Health Canada approval, and then provincial reimbursement across, across the provinces. And again, like I said before, this doesn't account for case-by-case -case access or private reimbursement. This is really what's on the public formulary. But as Durhan and I were talking about this study, this is, you know, we are talking about this morning about predictability and can we see the system. You know, case by case is, is maybe not the best way to go. I think, you know, we all need to be able to see what is available and how is it available. And thirdly, uh, looking at the timelines. And so again, a little difficult to see, but I'll let you, like, the, the orange bars are the Canadian provinces. So you can see that for Canada, most provinces, it takes between one and two years between, regula between regulatory approval to the point of public reimbursement, which again, and you know, listening, just listening to the stories here, that's a really long time for a lot of, a lot of these patients to wait while, while they're, while they're um, going through all the other challenges that they've got uh, dealing with this, uh, with their rare disease. And so I actually had the opportunity to present this uh, a few months ago at a CORD webinar, and someone asked me during that meeting uh, how many of the drugs that had gone into Health Canada were priority reviews. So I thought in advance of this meeting I would take a, I would take a look. So I actually updated the analysis. So now it's January 15 to December 2020, but just trying to figure out how many of those drugs were actually priority review drugs versus the standard review. It's a pretty even split. Probably there's more priority reviews, but it's not, um, it's not that different. And then um, flowing from that, at a recent CADETH information session, there was a comment made about the pre-NOC submissions and how there aren't as many pre-NOC submissions and how that's an opportunity that uh, the pharmaceutical industry should be taking advantage of. So I wanted to have a look and see, and you can see it's a, most are coming in with a pre-NOC submission, so that's so before they've got Health Canada approval, you can actually go into CADETH. And so you can see the breakdown breakdown there as well. And then I've got one more slide. And these are timelines. And so, and again, just going back to the, the, um, the panel previously, looking how much time it takes. So this is the mean days from Health Canada approval to the CADETH recommendation or to the PCPA negotiation. So, you know, looking at the post-NOC, 747 days is more than two years to go from a Health Canada approval to a PCPA negotiation. And then even beyond the PC, PCPA negotiation, a province still has to make a decision to fund. So it can be even longer than that. But I do want to point out one thing. 91 days. So this, you, there is a case where it's been 91 days from the Health Canada approval to the PCPA negotiation. I think that's very aspirational. I think it's, it can be done. This has been done in the rare disease space. And so, you know, again, going back to the comments earlier this morning, we have to think about how we can change the system and look for the opportunities. And the opportunity, opportunity exists. 91 days is, is, a, is a lot better than, uh, than two years. So I, I think it's uh, definitely something that we can, we can work towards. And so with that, I think it's just time for a, a national disease, a rare disease strategy, and I'm happy to be here today. And uh, I'll stop right there. Thanks, Durhan. Thanks so much, Alex. I always love it when Alex presents. She is so absolutely clear. She's actually very factual. But she's also very concise in terms of what she's doing. So love it. Okay, we now are going to invite, um, hopefully he's online with us, Nigel Rawson. Nigel, anybody who actually follows, you know, the literature and the uh, reports out on rare diseases um, has obviously run across the writings that Nigel has done, oftentimes in conjunction with John Adams, who's here with us. And I think this paper is actually a joint project as well. And they have done some of the most thorough, insightful, and really, really hard-hitting work with regard to not only just rare disease drugs, but certainly a lot of focus on rare disease drugs and the access. Uh, and I was going to talk to us about um, last year uh, through um, the International Research Consortium on Rare Diseases, we published a paper that um, 
identified the list of what we call essential medicines for rare diseases based on FDA, EMA, and in, and in China, uh, a list of approved drugs. And we came up with 204 drugs that did not include the rare cancers. And the question was, how many of these drugs are actually available in, in countries? You know, um, and what we put it out as a paper, hoping that, that our next iteration now, and we're working through another working group to start to look at where are these drugs approved, what do different countries do, and also what are the barriers in terms of access, with the goal of being able to get access. And Nigel and John turned around on a dime and produced a report for Canada, which I found absolutely astonishing. And uh, so I really want to be able to have Nigel, who is um, in Saskatchewan, who's going to give us a a, 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 a brief um, a, you know, introduction also in terms of the methodology because it really is, there's not a whole lot to compare to because not many other countries have done this. So I do want to link you up with our New Zealand um, researcher who's done it for about three other countries, including New Zealand, and he references the Canadian study. So I think we're on the right trend here, Nigel. So over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I think you're sharing the slides, Nigel? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Um, actually, this should, the slides should be with you. You should have my slides. I send them to uh, Hillary. Nigel, you have to share on your end if you want to. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Can you do that? Um, it says I can't share while well, somebody else is sharing. We just won't be able to see you, so we can share it, but we will be able to hear you but not see you. Okay. So, those are my slides. Um, I was asked to talk about which drugs in the list of essential drugs for rare disorders are funded in Canada. Um, the, and again, I want to emphasize as the previous speaker that we're focusing on uh, drugs um, with listing in the uh, government dr drug plans. Um, so, as Dohan said, the Rare Disease Treatment Access Working Group um, produced this uh, article uh, last year, um, and uh, it included, I think, 202 medicines from some 140 disorders. Um, as she said, uh, drugs for rare cancers were deliberately excluded. Um, and one of the things I found was that medicines were unlikely to be, there were several medicines unlikely to be covered by government drug plans, um, such as those that would only ever be used in the specialty area or um, the blood products that would be covered by the Canadian blood services. So they, they were excluded. Um, there were some medicines with multiple indications um, and you'll see those in a moment, I concluded them only once because I didn't want to bias it. So there were basically 170 medicines that remained, um, we should, uh, which uh, we should compare with the US, which there was 138 um, available there. Um, I looked at listing in formerly or special access lists at the end of uh, August 2021. Um, I didn't include case by case coverage. Um, and I didn't, uh, there's, I want to emphasize there's no account taken of access conditions. Uh, I was interested in um, categorizing the medicines by the prevalence of the disorder being treated and I divided them into three groups, as you can see here. Um, first being ultra rare diseases, the next uh, somewhat less rare, but, uh, and then uh, the final group of, uh, if there's a rare, one case, but then thousand. Next slide, please. Okay. So the next few slides list um, the medicines approved. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. The slides, I believe, will be shared afterwards. Um, but the, the, the disorders are divided into some groups. Um, you can see here metabolic. Next slide. Um, neurologic, um, as you can see here. So several drugs that people are familiar with. Next slide. Uh, hematologic, um, these would be uh, generally listed in formularies, um, not necessarily provided by the, the CBS. 
um, inf inflammatory diseases. And as you can see, low at the bottom of the slide, you can see that adalimumab and infliximab um, are there. And we'll see them on the next slide, please. Um, so I said that they would be, they are some drugs with multiple indications. Um, and so the final groups are endocrine, probably, and, uh, and a miscellaneous group at the end, which is what the screening categories. So you can see the drugs, um, and you can see the kind of indications that they're for. Um, uh, in the cystic fibrosis, um, um, the, the uh, multiple drug that came out recently uh, uh, is not on the list, so it's not, it doesn't appear here. So on the next slide, um, this looks at the listing status of these 117 unique medicines by government. They divide them into whether they're available in open access or conditional access, and then the total. So um, in open or, or conditional access, you can see that um, some provinces, it's 60% uh, or more, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, um, and just out in Nova Scotia. Well, but you can see that also that uh, some provinces are somewhat lower, and particularly Manitoba. So on the next slide, I excluded drugs for common indications, and I mentioned infliximab um, and some other drugs. They're available for common indications as well as uh, rare diseases. And if you take those out, um, because if a drug has uh, a common indication, it may uh, be more likely to be um, um, covered for a, a rarer dis rare disorder. Um, you can see that the figure is not too dissimilar, but you can see there's a, there's a drop, um, particularly in, uh, again, in Manitoba, and to some extent in the EI, as we know. But you can see that uh, the um, NIHB uh, plan um, is not, it's consistent with some of the others, which you know, is somewhat surprising to me, as there's often been a lot of complaints about that plan. And the next slide, <coughs> excuse me. I was interested in the average listing rate by disorder prevalence. I have a particular focus on prevalence. I've been interested in that for some time. And you can see on open access that uh, um, the drugs for ultra rare disorders are uh, particularly low proportion. In the other two categories, um, fairly similar, not too bad. Um, and you can see that uh, again, in uh, the two uh, uh, prevalence categories that, that the coverage is, uh, the listing is somewhat better. Um, so on the last slide, I think. So 85% of the medicines approved in the US were approved in Canada, or I should, perhaps I should say listed in Canada. I was surprised by that, um, but it's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a, a good surprise. Um, the considerable differences in listing rate between government drug plans. Um, the listing rate of ultra rare disorders is much lower than the rate for the other rare disorder drugs, particularly low in BC, Manitoba, PEI, and Newfoundland, as, as, one, as the previous speaker showed anyway. Um, it may be that these ultra rare disorder drugs tend to be more expensive, and so that's what's putting them off. And again, I want to emphasize that. This is a listing, it's not, um, it's not looking at actual access, and the access criteria, to, as you well know, will mean that the, uh, the drug may be listed, but access is pretty poor. Um, as I said, the slides will be available at, uh, later, um, but anybody who's interested in the article uh, can see it at this, uh, this uh, address. Um, it's on open access, so uh, it's freely available. Thank you for your attention. Huge thanks to Nigel. That was a considerable amount of work and certainly done, I think, with a great deal of detail. Um, so it gives us a little bit of picture. And I mean, I don't know how you feel about it. I was actually quite surprised that we had as many number one approved drugs in Canada as approved in the US. So that was good to see. I mean, we're not quite as high, but and we don't know what kind of where some of the opens are. 
Um, and I think the issue of open access and conditional access. I mean, many of these drugs, we may not want to have all open access, which means that anybody could prescribe, right? Then we really don't expect these to be prescribed by just anybody. So a conditional access, now the question is sometimes is how conditional? And also, how clear are the criteria in terms of the conditions? So I think that also varies province by province in terms of whether or not it's easy for the physician to be able to identify kind of what the criteria are and to make that, uh, um, that application and then what the response will be. So there's a lot to, you know, kind of devil in that detail. But it was, you know, interesting to see. And of course, as we can imagine, the more prevalent the uh, condition, the more likely it was to be on an open access. I was really excited as well that uh, Nigel, you know, excluded, right, those drugs that we also know are used commonly. So, um, Nigel, is there an, a, a next step on this in terms of the research? Is there a further iteration? Do we need to drill down further in terms of what those access or listings actually mean? Um, I think that um, the access conditions are important. Um, I have been looking at uh, rare disease drugs in Canada um, who have approved over the last few years and looking at some of the access conditions for those. Um, I think that there's probably a, a case for a reiteration of this in, uh, in a couple of years' time. Um, as I said, some of the, um, some of the drugs that are on the essential list, um, for example, it doesn't include trikafta. Um, which uh, I'm sure that cystic fibrosis uh, sufferers would regard as an essential medicine. You know. So, you know, it depends if there's a reiteration of the list as well. Um, but uh, you know, it's something that should be kept an eye on this. Thank you. Yeah, we are planning to continue to update the list. I think that's really important. We were doing this really from a global perspective as well to look across countries, right? What are the various types of barriers, including in some cases regulatory barriers, so just getting them approved. But um, it does have to be a living list, as you say. I'm not sure Trikafta was approved yet by FDA or EMA at the time the list was made, so it's a bit of a lag. I will tell you something very startling for us is that when we completed the list, and we compared it to, there is such thing as a WHO list of essential medicines. It is a list that they have compiled over the years to say to every country, you should, these are essential medicines. And so if you're providing healthcare, you should have these drugs listed. They also have another list, which is um, also what they call essential medicines, but they require special conditions in terms of being able to prescribe or also be able to monitor and or more complex drugs. And so they're saying, we believe these are essential, but we are not going to say to every single jurisdiction, you should be providing these. It was illustrative to us that when we completed our list of 204 essential medicines, only 25 of them were on the WHO list. So. What that means, I think, is very interesting because some of the drugs that are not on that WHO list are actually older drugs. They're generic drugs. They're drugs that really should be, you know, available, you know, and it's certainly not based on pricing. So it's very interesting. Our first cut in terms of looking at where the barriers are, we're recognizing pricing is not the biggest barrier in many countries. I mean, I'm not saying pricing is not a barrier. We're saying that there's many other conditions, and it go back to what we're talking about. You've got to have the infrastructure in order to be able to diagnose, to be able to prescribe, and to also be able to monitor. I think the other thing we're learning is that once a drug actually gets developed and it's out there, we actually have a lot more patients than we originally thought. So that's a very interesting, and, you know, and sometimes there's this bit of thing, oh gosh, you know, are you as a company hiding from us the fact that the prevalence was actually a lot higher than But the truth of the answer is that no, people weren't diagnosing these patients, you know. One, they weren't aware that they existed because they didn't have any criteria. Number two, in some cases, you know, and in many countries, we don't diagnose unless there's something we can do about it. So now that we can do something about it, we should be diagnosing and we should be actually able to. So I think these are interesting related kind of phenomena. Thank you again very, very much, Nigel. And uh, we may have an opportunity to have some additional questions. Now I'd like to invite up Jennifer Brecko and, um, and I've lost my list, so Lizanne, whatever your last name is. <laughs> I'm sure you can fill in the rest of the party. We are so truly delighted to have both of them here from Sun Life and from Canada Life, because as we all know, in Canada, 
a large portion of our population is in fact covered under private insurance plans. And we do know that the private drug plans do make a significant contribution in terms of coverage of rare disease drugs. And in some cases, of course, they may be able to provide that coverage a lot more completely and a lot quicker than they would under the public plan. So this is really important for us to ha also have as much as we talk about you know, the access through the HTA and through the public plans. This is a hugely important component of our healthcare system. And I think what we can see, and again reiterated in that first panel, we're not gonna look for a whole scale change in the healthcare system, nor are we actually champion with a rare disease drug strategy the need for a whole scale change in terms of the drug access programs, but how do we make sure that we have equity, that we have timely access? So really important for us to, I think we're gonna get a snapshot of what the uh, private drug plans are doing for us today, and maybe your wish in terms of how you sure. would participate in a rare disease drug strategy. Sounds good, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Lizanne Freed Lobchuk. Um, <laughs> we, we both have quite challenging last names, so yeah, d don't blame you for uh, <laughs> not remembering. Um, but here from from Canada Life, and and thanks so much for having us here mm -hmm. today, um, and and for getting to participate, you know, all day and, and listen. I just want to thank also the, the patients in particular mm -hmm. for sharing personal experiences because that's. That's a tough thing to do, but it, it's really educational, and I I definitely learned a lot from listening in today and and the panels this morning too. You know, diagnosis and uh, those are aspects that that our companies don't usually have a great line of sight into. Um, so that was really helpful as mm -hmm. well. Um, so just as we were preparing for this, we were thinking a little bit about how we got to this point of of considering the national strategy, and I know we heard a lot about this this morning. But I think it is helpful to remember that, um, you know, the federal government were working on national pharmacare, and there were a lot of different views about that. Um, there, there didn't seem to be a lot of alignment on how they should start and, and how it could work and how it would be funded. Um, and meanwhile, we felt like we could build on work that CORD and, and other patient groups have been doing for many years in the rare disease space. You know, patients weren't getting what they needed. Um, plans, uh, private plans and, and provinces were, were struggling and we sort of came together and said to the federal government, uh, we all actually are pretty aligned in this space. Like, could you focus on the rare disease space if, if you're going to be really keen and, and do something um, about drug coverage in Canada? And so we were really pleased, you know, when in 2019, as we talked about, they, they put some focus and resources in that area. But I, I think it really is helpful to, to remember, and I, I think we've seen this from so many different people today, that there is a fair bit of alignment in this space that we, we need a new approach. Um, so in terms of the, the landscape uh, of private plan coverage today, um, I'm, I'm sure no one in this room would disagree that, that rare, disease, uh, uh, rare diseases and rare disease treatments are, are unique. Um, of course, there's, there's many different definitions of rare disease, but at the same time, uh, the illnesses have things in common, right? They're often misunderstood, as, as we've heard so, so much today. Patients can be poorly served. Uh, they can be severe and begin in childhood, so then those unmet needs um, are, are particularly pressing. Um, the treatments themselves are also unique because, of course, they're, they're offering hope and th that opportunity to, to change and save lives. But at the same time, we have the small patient populations, um, which result in the uncertainty in clinical trials that we've been talking about, and, and high drug prices that just make it impossible for, for families to pay for these drugs on their own without coverage. You know, there are other drugs that you might be able to cover, even, um, even if you didn't have a private plan or public plan, but but in this space, it's just a whole different ball game. Um, so for for all of these reasons and more, you know, we do health technology assessments um, in the private plans, much like Cadith does, um, and, and we know those are an important tool for our drug plans overall. But when we talk about the rare disease space, it, it's a very imperfect tool. And, and we do think that we need a, a unique approach given the unique attributes in this space. 
Um, and, and that's really why we need a strategy. We need a national strategy where everyone is working together on this um, to, to help chart that new course and, and support better data and decision making. It, it was really helpful to hear about you know, the real world evidence and everything that Cadith is, is working on as well. Um, at the same time, we, we have a pharmacist at Canada Life who, who always reminds me the data is really important, but data doesn't make decisions at the end of the day, people do. And so we also, in terms of the strategy, think it's really important to have diverse expertise when you're making those decisions. We try to do that as much as we can within companies when we're you know, evaluating coverage for our plans. And, and here we have this opportunity to bring patients right into the decision-making process with the national strategy and think that that'll be really important. Um, we know, of course, there are gaps in coverage. I think uh, the panels we've heard from so far today have made that really clear. Um, but as, as Jaran mentioned, we, we do need a strategy also to protect the coverage where it does exist. Um, so today, uh, across our industry, you know, we're just here at Canada Life and Sun Life, but we do have numbers for across the industry. And private plans um, cover rare disease treatments today for about 13,000 Canadians, uh, about 8,000 people here in Ontario, uh, and uh, that totals $650 million annually. Um, so, you know, ob obviously that's, that's significant, and, and we know how crucial that coverage can be for families. At, at our companies, I know there, there really is a philosophy of providing comprehensive coverage where we can. Um, and I have heard from our president to our <laughs> senior execs and our drug teams, like they really do want to get people access um, to the drugs they need and are hopeful that, that the strategy will help you know, improve coverage for everyone, that no one's going to end up with something worse than they have today, that we're not going to see declines, um, and that this can be a way towards improving that coverage. Um, there is this misconception that uh, most private plans today have a lifetime or annual maximum or cap, and those are actually still relatively rare if you look at our entire blocks of business. But you know, they, they are a reality as well. And so we, we need the strategy to help manage sort of that unpredictability of, of some of these treatments and, and their costs. And we do believe that, that good drug plan management can prevent um, seeing more and more of those caps and allow for things like managed access programs um, instead of uh, seeing movement towards more caps and things like that. Um, so for, for in terms of a little bit of our process, I, I don't want to go on too long today, but we had talked internally about you know the decision-making factors that go into it. And obviously, you can never make uh, a decision like this as, on something as simplistic as cost. And I think the patients who spoke today made it really clear why and, and, and how can you put um, a price on some of these things. But even beyond that, we, we try and look at, you know, we were talking uh, with, again, some of my pharmacy team, and they were saying if, if drug A and B both cover the same rare disease, but drug A is an infusion and drug B is oral, you have to consider how getting an infusion impacts somebody's life, how they could require time off work for that. Um, that's also something that Cadith might not normally consider, like how it impacts their um, productivity or, or absence from work, um, but it's something that we definitely do want to consider. So um, that all goes into to our process, and, and we think that, that taking that nuanced view is the only way we're, we're going to improve coverage. Um, so yeah, I, I'll turn it over to Jessica, but I think for us, collaboration on this strategy and, and making sure that, that we bring the existing um, private funding and, and expertise to the table is the only way we're going to get to faster access, consistent access, you know, better data um, so that we can have informed decision making. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let Jessica speak a little more to that. 
So as Doreen and I have been chatting about this over the last little while, um, I think what became really clear is that we have a lot of areas of alignment um, in our sort of objectives in this strategy. And Lizanne has touched on a lot of them already, um, but I will hit them home one more time. Um, I think the most important is sort of the role that we've played in the space to date, uh, the amount of funding that you know is available, the number of lives that are attached through our plans. It's really important that that remains in the system um, as we as we go forward. Um, the reality that we're seeing, um, you know, we always like to clarify for people that what we're really talking about here is it's not, you know, Sun Life and Canada Life or any other insurer for that matter. Um, it's employers making decisions about their, their drug plans. So, you know, Canadians just like everyone in this room um, and looking at the cost of some of these drugs and the things that we hear are, you know, depending on the size of the employer, it can be really challenging um, if some of these drugs hit, hit your plan. Uh, and so why, why do we care about this? It's mostly because our, these employers, our clients, they're really concerned about their ability to remain in the space. And I think it's important to acknowledge that for the most part, employers really do want their employees to be healthy. Um, they want to help them and provide what they can where possible. Um, but we all know, uh, you know, the economy isn't great, inflation, there's a lot of sort of pressures and employers are feeling those and having to make some tough decisions. Uh, and, you know, we don't want it to end up that this is the place where they make those decisions. And so the strategy is really important to help get us to a place where that money and contribution stays in the system um, and helps people uh, in this particular population group. And so that's something we always like to clarify is you know why we're why we're so involved uh, and, and why we think this is so important. Uh, and to many of the points that Lizanne made, you know, the data and the evidence and all of those other pieces that come with the strategy. So of course it's about getting you know patients the treatments they need, but it's also about the sustainability. Um, and including data from sort of our side of, of this world is important um, as we think about decisions around drugs and coverage and all of those things going forward. So if you you know were to take out those 13,000 patients from, from your data, you're not really getting a picture of what's working um, and how things are um, actually happening in the real world. And so you know having that experience involved as part of the strategy is, is we think, critical um, to, to long-term success. And so we continue to work, you know, with Health Canada, with the government to really, you know, make that case. And I think, you know, through our conversations, it's it's clear that we all sort of see that the value of all players is really there. And it's it's important for us to, to sort of hold hands, if you will, <laughs> around some of this. So um, did I miss anything there? That's everything. Yeah. Are you going to quiz us now? No. <laughs> Should we go? I'm ready. Sit down or? <laughs> Not quizzing anybody. First of all, I think I keep calling you Jennifer. For you do, reason. but a lot of people do that, so don't worry I know, about it. And I do it badly enough that sometimes when I'm trying to write an email to Jessica, I start off with Jennifer. You know how it pops up automatically. I'm going very frustrated. Like, why is her name coming up? Like, where the hell is this? And then I have to go all the way back to yeah. it. But I appreciate it very much. And. Um, you know, we've had these conversations, and it's a conversation we will need to continue to have, right? What is the role that we anticipate in the future for having the private plans and the public plans? How do we expect them to work together? And what we're looking for, as we can all imagine, is equity right across. And we, um, this is not the time to go into that deep discussion. So what I'm really delighted is that, you know, there's a willingness for us to sit down together to talk about how we want to be able to move this forward. I mean, because a national rare disease drug strategy should be a national rare disease drug strategy. It doesn't mean a national rare disease drug strategy for some of the people who may be covered in one way and some of the people who cover another way. And it doesn't mean that, okay, we'll have re f faster access or more complete access in one way and not another. At the end of the day, of course, what we do want is the most efficient, effective plan. We want to get all of our patients getting access to therapy as soon as possible. We want, at the end of the day, it's all one bucket of money, right? There ain't no other monies. It's all our money. And whether it's being going through employers and then it's going through premiums and it's going through you know that system or whether it's going into the governments and it's going into those public plans, it's all our money. And we, I think, as you know, contributors to that money would like to see that not only are we going to be able to get the most for that money collectively, but that people will actually be fairly treated throughout that. And I think that's what we're aiming for. So we need to have those discussions. And we have not actually drilled down that far yet in terms of those discussions, but we need to do it soon. 
And so I would like, I really want to appreciate very much your coming mm -hmm. and speaking to us and giving us that overall big picture. We need to look more specifically in terms of that picture, but I think there's certainly a commitment on our part to say, how do we have that conversation going forward? And how do we end up with an overall strategy that actually does cover all of the players in the system? So thank you so very, very much. Okay, and with that, what you will recognize is that you've all missed the break. Don't jump up collectively, because there is no collective break. However, we do encourage that if you need to take a break, there's still more coffee. I think there's cookies. Somebody said, oh, there's some cookies in the back. Um, probably not enough for everybody here to have one, so don't make a mad grab for it right away. <laughs> I think there are cookies there. there. There's lots of coffee and tea, though. But we do want to be able to move forward if we can, because I think there's a really important part of the agenda that's coming up that we would like to talk, to talk about. And we're going to be moving into the discussion in terms of talking about centers of excellence, clinical centers of excellence. It also means that you should not digress into table conversation at this point, OK? So individually, you may get up and you may do whatever you need to do, but collectively, I need your attention just a little bit longer. Well, that really worked. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna invite up the panel. Is Pranish back? Is Pranish actually going to present? He's out. Okay. I'm going to invite back our panel for the afternoon. Um, Pranish Chakrati, whom all of you know really well now. Uh, Liam Ward, who is with the Ottawa Pediatric Bone Health Research Group and the Canadian Consortium for Children's Bone Health, Canadian Alliance for Rare Disorders of the Skeleton. For a very small person, she has the biggest title group I know and the Canadian Neuromuscular Network, Western University, Craig Campbell. So I'm going to invite the three of you to come up, and hopefully we'll be able to get people to attention. down to a minimum here, we're going to get started. So we're going to start moving more and more into terms of talking about the infrastructure we need in order to actually establish this rare disease program, rare disease strategy, rare disease framework, whatever we want to talk about it, but the infrastructure that's going to be essential to ensuring that patients are going to be able to get diagnosed, that they get referred to the right specialist, and absolutely are able to be prescribed the right medication and to be monitored on the ongoing access. So the important thing that we all know is that we don't actually have a network of centers of excellence in rare diseases at this point. We don't actually have a true research network in terms of rare diseases research, not the same as other countries. But what we do have are amazing building blocks for that. And we certainly have amazing specialty clinics and amazing pediatric centers and adult centers that are actually serving in that capacity. So what we believe in, as we're talking about the proposal for what we need in order to be able to assure that we're gonna be able to optimize the effective prescribing, monitoring, and the ongoing evaluation of these therapies, much of it exists. It doesn't exist the way we need to at the end of the day, it doesn't yet exist in terms of when we talked about data this morning, how we're able to collect and share that data. That's a huge part of it. It doesn't necessarily exist yet in terms of how do we assure that there's the ability to have across the country the same 
criteria in terms of access, but a lot of it does exist. And I think as Pranish said to us this morning, which I thought was important, I know that you're sick of seeing Pranish, but he has once more <laughs> agreed to come up <laughs> and slow talk our way through. <laughs> yeah, he is a national treasure, isn't he? Yeah, we forgot about that. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's actually three different people. You do know he's actually triplets, right? This is not the same person you're seeing over and over again. Like, so, come to these meetings more often. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, or he'll never come again. I mean, I think one of the two will actually happen. But no, we really are delighted because we do know that many of these essential building blocks that we're talking about, and you're gonna hear you know, more about what's happening in terms of the US and globally, but really recognizing that Canada is well positioned to be able to have the implementation of a rare disease drug, a rare disease program, rare disease framework, and certainly set focused around centers of excellence. So this is really exciting for me. So without much further ado, I'm going to actually turn it back over to Pranish, who's going to talk to us about the Inherit Metabolic Diseases Program, followed by Leanne, who's going to talk to us about the Bone Program, and then Craig, who many of you will know. Craig does triple duty. I'm even surprised Craig's here, because Craig wears so many hats in terms of his work, in terms of um, at the University of Western Ontario on the pediatric site, that uh, people say to me, he's going to come in person? I say, yeah, I think he's coming. So we're delighted to have him here. So I'm going to start with Pranish. Over to you. Thanks, Doreen. And uh, I think in this case, I'm actually Andreas Schulze, because I think <laughs> Andreas was going to speak about this today. Um, and he's our uh, outgoing president of the Garrett Association, which is our Canadian, it actually used to be called the Canadian Association of Centers for the Management of Hereditary Metabolic Disorders. But that was too long, and so we called it the Garrett Association. And uh, Garrett, uh, Sir Archibald Garrett was a, a British internist who really first described inborn errors in metabolism. And so that's why uh, we, we chose that. Um, so uh, I'm here speaking, uh, see me as Andreas Schulze, who is a pediatric metabolic physician at, um, at SickKids. Unfortunately, I did not have a chance to connect with Andreas. We tried um, to find out what he was going to say. So you're stuck with what I'm going to say. Um, and, uh, uh, and before I go on, I, I actually met Leanne in September 1990. She was in my medical school class, and we were in the same first six-person unit one group yep. at McMaster. And I met Craig in 1998 July. When I showed up, I decided I wanted to do a pediatric residency. And uh, Craig was one of my fellow residents uh, at that time. So I'm, I'm in very comfortable company up, uh, up here. <laughs> So uh, what I decided to do is, um, you know, I liked Dorhain's um, uh, description. We don't have a formal network, uh, but we have actually exceedingly strong informal networks of um, uh, inherited metabolic disease uh, treatment centers uh, across Canada. And even with uh, health being in provincial jurisdiction, we have a large amount of crosstalk, primarily nationally, but also internationally, right? So we, none of us hesitate to pick up the phone and call a colleague anywhere in the world if we know that that colleague is the colleague we need to talk to, right? So, um, you know, what I thought I would first start with that concept, right? You know, in rare disease world, and I think we can say that for many of the rare disease treatment centers, right? So where patients are going for ongoing care and, uh, and treatment. So uh, these are uh, a set of images that we had in a, a paper uh, that Monica Lamoureux and uh, Kylie Tingley uh, wrote in 2015, I think, 15 or 16. But it was when we were starting that Canadian Inherited Metabolic Disease Research Network, which was meant to be practice-based observational research is what we were really trying to go after. Uh, we started with a survey of what exactly is in place in terms of the treatment centers in Canada for uh, patients with inherited metabolic diseases. So on this diagram, the, uh, it's a map of Canada, the, the shading is the population density, and the red dots are uh, the centers which replied to our survey, and the um, uh, blue dots are the ones that didn't. So you just get a sense of you know, where, uh, what data is being represented here. 
And, you know, we have that dense population corridor between Quebec City and Windsor. Uh, and so that's the, uh, the blow, up, blow out there. There we go. Um, and uh, it was actually fun for me yesterday when I was trying to decide what I should be saying today uh, to reread the paper. And what jumped out at me was the description of interprofessional care. Right? And so the, uh, uh, pretty much all the clinics, but you know, uh, were striving for prov providing interprofessional care, but not all clinics felt they could provide interprofessional care. And I think that's something important to call out. Now, this is a bit old, right? We did the survey in the mid 2010s. Um, and I think there's been some change, mainly change for the better, uh, but I think there are some of the gaps that are still important to note. So, you know, we defined at that time into professional care as an integrated approach to healthcare delivery in which collaboration amongst practitioners of different disciplines or with different skills and knowledge allow for the delivery of patient health by the most appropriate healthcare practitioner. And in inherited metabolic diseases, uh, the role of the dietitian is actually uh, extremely um, significant. And it's, you know, uh, John and I were talking a little bit that, you know, at, uh, at this meeting, you know, we we're talking a lot about uh, pharmaceuticals, but we have to remember all the, the breadth of treatment. Um, so if we're looking at the inherited metabolic diseases, there's a large number of them that are still treated by nutraceuticals, which are not regulated as drugs, which are not necessarily regulated as natural health products. And I think the uh, Abbott, um, uh, you know, factory closure uh, is, uh, was, was and is an opportunity to highlight, you know, a really potentially vulnerable patient population uh, where uh, access because of that plant closure was, became very tenuous. Um, you know, in the last month we had, uh, not the last month, really since March, it feels, <laughs> it feels like a lot longer than that. Uh, but we did reconnect our pan-Canadian network very quickly, connected with Health Canada, connected with the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, so they have to allow these products to cross the border. Health Canada has some products that they allow across the border, other, others that they haven't. Uh, but we got emergency access in uh, working with them to get all of these products across the border. The dietitian network, these are about 15 dietitians in the country. We had three lead dietitians. Uh, in different provinces, and three lead physicians, uh, and me, because I'm, I don't know, I, anyway, uh, I was also involved somehow. Um, and um, uh, with that, we were actually able to take, uh, make a national inventory within two weeks, um, and be able to be ready to distribute between these treatment centers that I've just shown, should there be a need. And we actually had that, there were two patients diagnosed, uh, new, new babies diagnosed with urea cycle defects where there was a shortage of the Abbott product and we used a uh, product from Europe, uh, never been imported in Canada before, but we were able to redistribute the supply so that we could get the two patients together. So interprofessional care on many levels, I think, but none of this is formalized in any sort of disease centers of excellence or networks of excellence, right? Uh, so I've left this slide up long enough. You can see, you know, the uh, healthcare providers that are there. I mean, I think the main thing here is that not all clinics have all relevant healthcare providers represented within there. And sometimes that is where you tend to refer patients one to another or where they can get the best care. What are some of the additional clinical services? So specialized pharmacy, I think, I don't have to talk too much about that in this room, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, but you need a pharmacy skill set, both the pharmacists and the pharmacy to be able to uh, uh, handle these things uh, appropriately and well. Uh, a dispensary for medical foods and supplements, just coming back, not all these things are drugs, and the nutraceuticals fall through cracks in many ways. Uh, stem cell and solid organ transplant, so both bone marrow transplant and inc increasingly I think we're gonna be moving to other ty types of stem cell transplant. These things are organized on regional, sometimes provincial, sometimes cross-provincial regional bases, and we work very closely amongst those groups. Uh, social work complex care teams are something that have evolved significantly over the last 10 years, and we work closely with them now. I think there's transition to adult care where you have standalone children treatment centers and standalone adult treatment centers, but I think it's also important to remember that, you know, in London Health Sciences Center, for example, where uh, you have a, uh, a clinic that can see both adults and patients within the same healthcare institution, the need is different. Uh, than if you have uh, sick kids where you can't see a patient over a certain age, right? 
Um, uh, genetic counseling and prenatal and genetic diagnostic care is something we work closely with uh, colleagues in genetics. Laboratory is huge, and I think that's increasingly the case for other specialty areas. It's always been the case for inherited metabolic diseases, and we've always been extremely tightly linked. We always think about diagnosis, and in the morning we talked about diagnosis, but I think it's really important to think about the monitoring of treatment and of natural history and the laboratory services that are needed for that. We're lucky in the IMD world. Many of us wear hats on both sides, and our communities have been extremely well linked, but not in all rare disease worlds does that exist. Uh, and research. I won't go into there just other than to mention it. You know, we talked about Simder and Inform Rare this morning. Uh, clinical trials and access to clinical trials and working together to allow, have an infrastructure in place for our patients to access those trials from wherever they live in the country and having them in Canada is something that we're increasingly networking about to make sure that that's in place. Uh, virtual, so family, patient and family workshops and support groups, some centers do this better than others. I'm always inspired by the one, you know, it just happens to me that Craig's sitting here. I'm not trying to butter him up or anything. But in, in London, Chitra Prasad and her group have done an incredible job creating, you know, a family network and they have an annual family day and they invite people from the different clinics in Canada to come. I think partially to share our knowledge, but mainly for us to say, to see what we should be doing uh, in, in the rest of the... Um, clinics. And virtual visits, I think, uh, you know, it's a one real silver lining of the, um, of the pandemic. You can't do everything by virtual visit, but the ability to get second opinions on a virtual visit. So, you know, I may have a patient who's like, you know, you really should be seeing this person in Canada. They're the world expert. You know, you don't have to actually go and see them, but maybe you can ask your questions, right? And so that is something that's becoming increasingly possible. Uh, I'm just going to skip over that. Um, and the uh, so, provincial systems, national cooperation, we'll hear in the afternoon about, or next, I guess, about the international cooperation. Um, just, uh, the National Food Distribution Centre in Montreal, originally founded by Steinberg, for those of you who remember, Steinberg is the grocery store, yeah. Uh, so as a non-profit, to be able to import these nutraceuticals into, into Canada, and they were extremely key in helping us deal with the Abbott uh, plant closure here. Um, the Garrett Association, which I mentioned, uh, it's really too small there, but if you look on the he header, um, in the last couple of years, uh, we've started a guidelines and uh, a guidelines committee that's being chaired by uh, Mikhail Inbarg Feigenberg in uh, Toronto, uh, and a liaison relationships committee that's uh, being chaired by Cheryl Greenberg. Uh, I think the guidelines committee is really going to be key. Uh, our our desire is to have another layer of trying to standardize how we provide care, or at least communicate what we feel in Canada is um, uh, care that should be provided. I'm looking at John because we had a lot of discussions about patient involvement in the development of those guidelines as well. Uh, and the, the thing about the Ontario IMD Association, that's brand new. That website went up like three days ago. Uh, just good timing. Uh, but I had a colleague, I, I have a one day a week where I consult with for the Ministry of Health and I was like, you know, if you guys really want to do, you know, raise the, the profile, you, you need to write a letter. Right? And the letter often gets a policy process in place. And so I suggested, you know, write a letter. And so they actually, some colleagues put together uh, 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 an association very quickly and, you know, are going to be sending in a letter. I would suggest you um, look at it. I looked at it yesterday and it's actually really good. Um, uh, and, um, you know, against, I think these are the seeds of uh, a network of uh, excellence uh, and uh, clinics. So that's what I figured out I maybe should say today. <laughs> All right, thanks so much everyone for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm just delighted to be here. It's the first time I've been out since the pandemic, so it feels very special. And um, Pranesh has actually talked about a number of things that are relevant to what I'm going to speak about, so I'm happy to hear what you had to say and sort of seg from there. I'll just get the slides up if that's all right. What I wanted to talk about today is building a center of excellence in pediatric rare bone disease from the ground up in an academic setting. And Durhain asked me to really provide you with a snapshot of what that journey's been like, what we learned from it, what the challenges have been, and how we can use that to inform the path forward as we think about building formal centers of excellence that have good backbone in terms of financial underpinnings. Next slide. I can do that myself. We go. 
I just want to contextualize my portion of the talk for you, and I don't think I have to say too much about these images to impress on you that this is serious bone morbidity. This is the prototypic osteoporosis condition of childhood called osteogenesis imperfecta. This is a condition that we have some rudimentary therapy for, bisphosphonates. This is intensely studied now, and there's an anti-sclerostin antibody that's undergoing an international trial to try to make the fracture rates and pain and growth better in these children. So this is one of the areas that we're working on and taking care of children in this space. We also take care of children with rickets, inherited forms of rickets, and you can just like in the other slide appreciate how these children would have pain, need for multiple orthopedic surgeries, not grow very well, have frequent fractures. And so overall, rare bone disease is very debilitating. It certainly impacts the child's ability to grow up, have a normal life, playing and doing all the things kids should be doing. This child has a condition called X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, which is caused by an overproduction of a hormone called FGF23. When you have a disease that is largely responsible because of one hormone or one molecule gone awry, it becomes a target for a monoclonal antibody therapy. And we participated in the pivotal phase three trial of borosumab, which is anti-FGF23 antibody to improve the phenotype in these children, and it was successful. It was approved by Health Canada in 2018. Cadeth subsequently came up with the reimbursement criteria, and we are now uh, prescribing this medication to children across Canada. The adults, though, are unattended in this space, and that's a frequent theme in rare disease, and certainly is the narrative in rare bone disease, that in the kids, we're doing, I think, a reasonable job, certainly pushing the envelope, but the adults are unattended. They don't have the basic infrastructure for their care, let alone access to the medications that really target the pathobiology of their diseases. So when I think about um, how we built a center of excellence from the ground up. I go back to the beginnings in 2001 when I came to CHEO. I had just been freshly minted off my rare bone disease fellowship at the Shriners. Came to CHEO and the University of Ottawa I had fantastic mentorship from the likes of David Moore, who's a research methodologist. And he said to me, you've got to go national. Like you've got small numbers of patients. You can't just do a CHEO based study. You've got to go national. And I just said, okay, not really knowing what I was getting myself into. And so applied for a CIHR grant early on in my first faculty appointment, and it was successful. And I'm really grateful to CIHR for that funding because it launched the research program that went on to expand, and it also gave me insights in the clinic that I would not have otherwise had if I hadn't had that kind of funding. So we set up a national research program that at the time was called the Steroid-Induced Osteoporosis in the Pediatric Population, or STOP program. This was in children with uh, leukemia, rheumatic disorders, nephrotic syndrome, all whacked hard with steroids to treat their disease and all getting into significant problems with bone morbidity due to osteoporosis. So in the course of doing that, we had the ability to set up, because of the funding, a wonderful network of clinicians and radiologists, subspecialists, research methodologists, statisticians, et cetera, et cetera. And that empowered us to then go forward with other trials in other disease spaces. In Ottawa, we were the STOP headquarters, and because we were studying bone disease, we had to have bone density scans and x-rays come from across the country for careful standardized central reading. And as part of that, we really learned how to empower sites to take good x-rays. We talked about the importance of the diagnosis, and we empowered sites to care for children with rare bone diseases. So in the course of running research studies, you empower routine clinical care because you're optimizing diagnostic strategies and you're narrating about the diseases that you're seeing. Over time, you know, grants run out, so you have to write more grants, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but there were times when um, the funding was getting lean because things always take longer than you think they're going to, and there were uh, hospitals that stepped up and provided some um, funding in order to keep STOP going, and I'm forever appreciative of that. And there were other agencies as well, like the Canadian Child Health Clinician Scientist Program that provided funding uh, for, for me to have the time to 
orchestrate this initiative. And these are really important components of building centers of excellence. So then what are you going to do when you've built something, you want to keep it going, but you don't have stable infrastructure from the government or the province or anywhere? So you write grants and you spend a lot of time writing grants. When I look back at my career, I think about about 40% of them were successful. So I spent about 60% of my grant writing time writing unsuccessful grants. If I had to count up the number of hours, I think I'd cry, so I won't count up the number of hours. But you know, it, it's important to write grants because it sharpens you. You have to be uh, very strong going into the competition. So I believe in grant writing because I think it makes us better clinicians and better scientists. At the same time though, very demanding to be seeing patients operationalizing studies and grant writing at the same time. And I think a method to have stable infrastructure in order to keep vibrant programs alive is really important. And I'm hopeful that the Center of Excellences will meet that need. So we did go on to write other grants that were ultimately successful sometimes after a few tries and uh, build a local team and build national and international partnerships. So as we gained experience in conducting trials and caring for children with rare bone diseases, we became of interest to academic partners around the world and also to industry. So industry has moved into rare pediatric bone diseases, osteogenesis imperfecta, XLH, hypophosphatasia, fibrodysplasia, FOP. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, industry needs us because they don't necessarily have that intimate clinical lens. They need assistance in designing their trials. They need assistance in understanding how best to analyze their x-rays and bone densities. So our group is now partnering with industry on therapeutic trials based on the experience that we had over the years. And I'm really enjoying that partnership. Certainly it's not me that's going to be able to develop drugs for children. So that academic industry partnership is absolutely essential in the therapeutic space. These are some of the hubs and spokes concepts that have come out of our work over the years. So we're considered now a clinical and research training focus point for national and international fellows. We have fellows coming from all over the world, many from impoverished countries actually, coming to get some expertise to take care of children with these rare diseases. We have contributed to national and international training schools for physicians. We've got a nice multidisciplinary setup as part of our group. We provide the kind of consultant services that Pranesh mentioned, that somebody from around the world has a rare disease and just needs to speak to somebody who's seen that disease before. And so that's going on enabled by the virtual setup. And then we're working on therapeutic trials in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, in OI, XLH, the calcification syndromes, achondroplasia, et cetera. The rare bone disease space has really burgeoned in terms of therapeutic interest, given that we understand the genetic basis now. <coughs> One of the things that I'm most excited about is bonescanada.org. So that's a website that we've built. Prior to the pandemic, we had initiated the Canadian Consortium for Children's Bone Health on the understanding that we needed a Canadian rare bone disease narrative. There's lots of things going on around the world, but doctors were saying to us, we wanna be able to have a forum to talk about the Canadian specific issues because we have our own issues with respect to the tools we have to diagnose and monitor. We have our own issues with respect to reimbursement plans. So the Triple CBH is an initiative that empowers health professionals in the care of patients with childhood onset bone disorders. Right before the pandemic, I was starting to think about how I could get patients together for weekends to talk about their condition and have experts talk and have them talk and teach us about what's on their minds. And then the pandemic happened. I was actually writing a grant to try to fund such a family forum over the weekend. And then we thought, well, let's pivot this to virtual. And that's been amazing. So we've started the Canadian Alliance for Rare Disorders of the Skeleton, or CARDS. And we hold webinars every few months. The patients are a big part of the panel. We hear from them what their unmet needs are. And the theme that comes out in every single webinar that we do is that the adults are unattended, which I 
spoke to earlier. So for us in our bonescanada.org realm, we're really uh, pushing to see how we can elevate basic infrastructural care for adults with childhood onset bone disorders. So I'm talking about XLH, hypophosphatasia, osteogenesis imperfecta, et cetera. This has been a wonderful journey. I, you know, as a physician, I see patients one on one, but to hear them talk among themselves and reflect on each other's journey and experiences has been so empowering. I feel like I'm a much better physician for it, and I'm just really enjoying the engagement that we have with the patient advocacy groups across Canada. And this is just some of them. I see Joanne. Where is Joanne from Rarezies? Rural is here too with Olier's disease. So this has been just wonderful. So you've got your specialized clinics and you've built your multidisciplinary team of experts in clinical care and in research. And so then where do you go from there? So to finish up, I just wanna go through what I see as the challenges that need to be overcome. And I think the centers of excellence will be an enabler in this regard are the following, not an exhaustive list. Human resourcing is huge. It goes without saying that to sit down and take care of a patient with a rare disease, you need time. You need more time than you need to take care of a patient with a common disease, typically. So that's on the physician side. Tons of allied health professionals, and Pranesh had a long list on one of his slides, so I'm not going to go through that, but suffice to say, we have a lot of partners in the care of children and adults. And then Pranesh also talked about the lab and diagnostic issues. Space. I've had many, uh, can, I don't know if you're laughing because this has happened to you too. Yeah, where, you know, I need to see a patient. It's not my dedicated clinic day and I need to see a patient or a patient is on a research study and I need to take care of them in that context and there's nowhere to see the patient. And uh, so, yeah, that's a, that's a big issue. And then the research associates, when they're doing trials, they're often doing very special tests like timed functional tests like Craig would do for patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other tests that take time and they take space. And if you're in a really clinically driven hospital, the word on the street will be, well, that's for the clinical patients, but the research patients really should not be thought of differently. They're still patients. When my patients come in to see me and they're on a research study, they don't come in and say, I'm off to see Dr. Ward for my research visit. They come in and they say, I'm off to see Dr. Ward for my care. And the research is woven in there. So that was my next point. We really need to maximize support to clinical trial investigators to facilitate the health authority regulatory documentation and process. Who's ever been inspected by Health Canada in the room? Right? You're still, you're still here. There you go. <laughs> now listen, I believe in documentation and process and rigor. That makes us good doctors. That keeps kids safe. That keeps adults safe on trials. However, it is, it is amazing what you have to do and invest in to have that good, strong backbone to do clinical trials. And we need to help our investigators be inspection ready. We need good technology, obviously, to rapidly collect, collate, and output, output data. I need a booster seat to get to the bottom here. Um, we need a centralized REB process. When I set up the STOP study, I had 10 centers. I had to negotiate 10 different budgets, 10 different contracts, 10 different REBs. So we absolutely need a single REB for studies to facilitate that, including the contractual processing. And then I think there was a long discussion about registries this morning with Pranesh and others, and I think that's essential. We can't do everything in the clinical trial space. We need some freedom to be understanding patients as they move through their routine clinical care and collect data in a meaningful way. I just got a call from Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy about three weeks ago, and they want to partially fund a registry to understand endocrine and bone complications of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I'm really excited about that and now need to go out and figure out how to supplement that funding and get that off the ground. That could be enabled by a center of excellence. So that is it. I guess the final thing to say here is that when we think of these centers of excellence, which I envision will be at, you know, strategically placed locations across Canada so that, you know, coast to coast to coast, kids have access to those and adults have access to those centers of excellence. We also need to think about how we can empower local care for individuals with rare bone disorders. 
I think these centers of excellence need a strong research and knowledge translation backbone. I think that the patient um, knowledge translators should be a big part of that. And we need to think about these centers of excellence as training ground for future clinicians and researchers. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and thank everyone who's been, you know, on board and excited and passionate about this focus on rare bone disease in Canada. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks. Craig Campbell. Uh, my slides are being pulled up, I suspect, at some point. But I'd um, like to thank uh, Durhain and the crew for having me here again at CORD Conference. It's great. Great to share the stage with, uh, with these folks who I've had long um, friendships and clinical collaborations and research work with. Um, and and Durhain, don't get rid of the patient panel ever. Uh, I know you don't want, but we need those inspiring stories. And thank you, folks. I just hope that, that if we do have have that next year it, it it isn't full of words like we have to fight and you know and reflect all the pain <laughs> that if stories of victory that's what we want to hear so anyways thank you all for having me here i'm going to talk today just about the canadian neuromuscular centers and and you know and hopefully what you'll see in this is you know is elements of of what a you know as a centers of excellence network uh can can be so um so uh, I'm hoping, you know, just to reflect to you, uh, you know, the work that the Canadian neuromuscular community is doing uh, to aspire to be a model uh, rare disease center of excellence network. And hopefully we can take some of our experiences and our work uh, out to, to other areas. Uh, I'm going to try and show some of the cost credit cutting structures and activities that, that we've done to support success uh, amongst our neuromuscular centers and then and uh, talk a little bit about some of the work I'm, I'm doing more recently on clinical trial facilitation. And I, I usually get slotted into the rare disease registry section of the CORD things. But today, uh, this is great to be a part of this. And, and I want to show you some work uh, just to finish off that, that, that I think has been helpful in smoothing some of the obstacles around clinical trial work. And I'm going to do that through talking about NMD4C. Uh, I'm going to talk about the cross-cutting structures that I've uh, been involved with, including the Care and Trial Site Registry, the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry. I'm going to sneak those registry things in just in case. And, uh, and then, and then um, talk to you about this concept of a clinical trial concierge in the neuromuscular space. This is a, um, a graphic of NMD4C. This is a CIHR supported and Muscular Dystrophy Canada supported, thank you to those uh, sponsors network that brings together really all the stakeholders in our Canadian neuromuscular community. And the goal um, with NMD4C was to train and educate new um, a generation of stakeholders, raise the standard of care and strengthen the biomedical and clinical infrastructure to build research capacity. So this is a busy slide, but it shows all the different activities we're involved with, some of the resources that are part of the network, and then the, the outcomes. And, um, you know, really, I'm just one small part, really small part of, of, of such a big team that's led by Hans Lockmuller, James Dowling, Jim, who's, I believe I saw him on the, on the uh, call earlier, um, Jody Warman, uh, Rashmi Kathari, and Stacey Lynn. Turn and then, of course, there's excellent project management uh, going on. And um, I just want to say directly around Bonnie Wooten, who's who works uh, to support the clinical trials working group, which is the the area that I'm involved with. And so that's, you know, really my role in this network was to to uh, create this outcome, more clinical trials, uh, and and so we're working on that. But what I want to uh, suggest is that you know a lot of the work, and I'm going to show you a little bit of this. That, that was to achieve you know, more clinical trials also helps in many of the other outcomes. So sustaining a community of, of 
patients and professionals. That's so important when we work together. Uh, more public and private investment, improved access to therapies, uh, improved information and advocacy, um, uh, and sustainable re resources for future research. So I'm going to talk about those. But I'm not going to dive into the work. I, I mean, we can't do anything. And this is, you know, so foundational. I know it's, this isn't lost on anyone in the, in the audience. But we need, uh, you know, we need our, our partnership with our patient organizations. And I just wanted to specifically call out MDC and defeat uh, Duchenne Canada, who've been so um, such strong partners, uh, it, specifically in the work that I'm doing as part of this larger uh, network, but uh, but really, uh, you know, throughout all the activities of NMD4C, and and really even before NMD4C three years ago, so instrumental uh, in in I think how we've been able to be successful as as a, a neuromuscular community, having such close you know close partners. So a, a couple of network tools that we put in place. I'll start with the care and trial site registry. And just to be clear, this is, this is different than a patient registry, which I'm going to show you next. This is actually a uh, registry of clinical trial and care sites. Uh, and, and this was actually a, a brainchild of my uh, close colleague, Jan Kirschner, in uh, Germany back in 2007, uh, and, and, and grew up as part of the Treat NMD neuromuscular uh, network. And, and this is, a, is actually a repository of neuromuscular centers of excellence. And, and uh, there are now um, over uh, 380 registered sites worldwide, largely in Europe. But when we started our network, uh, an NMD4C, we really felt that we needed a, a repository of, of Canadian neuromuscular sites to line up against our really amazing um, and robust uh, neuromuscular registry of patients. Uh, and so we adopted the CTSR um, uh, software and and worked with them to to add a Canadian administrative function and so now we uh, have have entered 15 Canadian neuromuscular sites in there we're working to onboard uh, more but this uh, this you know serves as a way to um, understand where there are viable locations for clinical trial sites including those that you know may not be in the regular kind of circle of contact with our industry partners all the time and the other nice thing we can do is is line up the trial sites to uh, where CNDR registrants, so where patients are, um, and and sort of you know look where ideally the best trial sites are uh, for patient numbers and for. Um, uh, you know, clinical trial activity. And, and so that's what we've been uh, working on as one tool. Of course, many of you will also know, and I've presented here before about the CNDR, and this is um, really a gem for us in Canada, I think amongst rare disease registries in the world, certainly, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, neuromuscular registries in the world, and we now have uh, close to 5,000 patients enrolled, and I want to just obviously pause and thank all those people for allowing us to, uh, to steward their data. Um, there's 36 sites across Canada and 62 investigators who are involved in the CNDR. And this is obviously an important piece of the work we do um, to uh, facilitate clinical trials. And this, uh, these graphs sort of show the um, number of, of projects, if you will, or activities that have come out of the CNDR since its inception in, in 2011. Um, and just to let you know, although the principal activity is obviously clinical trial planning and recruitment, I've been encouraged in recent years to see things like surveys, advocacy, notices for education, um, which uh, sort of is uh, those, those gray bars you see uh, in the bar charts growing over time. And so I think we're using, starting to use the CNDR to its fullest capacity for some of those other aspects of, um, you know, what, what, what is needed to pull, uh, uh, you know, to have a community of people pushing together.
And I'd like to finish with talking about the clinical trial concierge. This is a, a new concept for it. It was part of this uh, NMD, a, a novel part of this NMD4C uh, activities. And basically what the clinical trial concierge does is act as a broker for all Canadian clinical trial sites uh, that are working in the neuromuscular space. And it really supports coordination and exchange of information between those sites. It also serves as a, as a resource an impartial resource for all neuromuscular stakeholders. So if you're trying to navigate this, this often complicated clinical trial space, uh, one of your first calls can be to the clinical trial concierge. And this is a person who's, well, it's actually Bonnie Wooten, who I mentioned earlier, who, who has built relationships now and connections with all the sites across Canada and can quickly get people or other stakeholders, uh, patients, where they, where they need to be uh, if they're looking for clinical clinical trial opportunities. And then, of course, uh, you know, she works and we work as a working group to develop solutions uh, for, for realizing neuromuscular trials in Canada. So uh, again, the four real work packages that come out of this is responsiveness to patients and other stakeholders that are looking or wondering about clinical trial opportunities. Uh, second, she uh, administers the CTSR, so this trial site registry, liaises with the CNDR to make sure that our patient registry is used as a tool to facilitate clinical trial. And then, you know, as all we've all heard today, this, you know, some of the challenges around clinical trials um, milestones. So we're tracking all that within the network. Um, the CTC also uh, works in each study that's launched in Canada to develop a roadmap to optimize uh, clinical trial engagement and recruitment. And then finally, uh, one of our latest and, and actually um, uh, you know, really pleasantly uh, a successful situation is reaching out to other industry partners to identify clinical trial possibilities that are going on outside Canada and to uh, facilitate meeting with those partners uh, and, and give them a picture of the clinical trial assets that we have here in Canada. And, um, and, and those have been really great meetings and, and I think eye-opening for, you know, for, for some industry partners who weren't, di didn't necessarily so have Canada on their um, on their radar. Uh, so with that, I'll I'll, I'll stop and hopefully um, uh, some of the things I've talked about will will make us think about uh, you know some of these activities being um, effective in other rare disease spaces. So thank you. I can say is good grief we have a lot of national treasures <laughs> thank you folks so very much hopefully we will actually still be able to have a little time in terms of discussion and wrap up but as you can see there is such a wealth in terms of what we're doing we're going to switch then into our next panel almost immediately so those of you who feel restless who need to get up please do so um, you know on your own we're going to kind of leave it to you to kind of adopt that I'm absolutely blown away by, as we say, what we actually do have in place. So huge thanks again. Oh, thanks. OK, I'm going to call up then. Um, maybe I'll invite everybody, if you don't mind, to come up. Um, we're going to start, though, with one virtual presentation. And then we'll end with a virtual presentation. So you folks will. So we're going to switch then in terms of looking at networks and really the potential for a rare disease network in Canada. Um, but also then we're going to talk about what actually exists in, uh, in the United States. And I think, oh, I think we'll be preceded with a vision of a global network, which some of you have heard from some of the previous discussions we've had. But I think a great opportunity to bring it back into the fold and really think about you know, how do we fit into this? Where can we go for it? What are we going to learn? And how do we become a member of this? And then look at what is also taking place in the United States, both from a research perspective and a clinical perspective. But we are going to start. I'm really happy to start with Apollo Robeson, who I think is online here, and who's going to talk to us about our own pediatric um, network in Canada Children's Healthcare Canada, 
Ah, there you are. Thank you so much. I know this was a bit of a last minute to kind of drag you guys in, and I know you guys are already in Halifax, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate, Paula, your putting together the presentation and joining us here online. I don't know if you had a chance to hear some of the other uh, presentations that were taking place, but you're coming at a great time when we really are talking about what are the networks, how do we build these networks, and certainly I think the Children's Healthcare uh, Canada is that backbone that we have along with Mycerin in terms of, uh, of a, be it for the uh, Centers of Excellence for Rare Diseases. So Paula, I'm gonna, uh, I think Paula's title is knowledge, I wanna say knowledge transfer, but it's more than that, I apologize. Paula, Don't I'm gonna you worry. Hi, um, and I'll, as I'm talking, I'll get you to just pull up the slides. Um, I have been listening uh, in, and I have a colleague who's in the audience as well. Hello, Corey. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you today. Um, I'm going to just present on uh, Children's Healthcare Canada, our experience with a few networks of centers of excellence, and some uh, resources that we offer that might be of interest to the network. Um, you can let me know when the slides are ready. While you're, I can, I can get started even if you're pulling up your slides and that's fine too. So I kind of titled this talk towards a national rare centers, uh, rare disease network of centers of excellence, exploring potential collaborations. And again, delighted to be here. I'll tell you in just a moment about us, but here are some um, measures that sort of give you the state of child health in Canada and of course the intersection with the uh, children and families that you work with in ter terms of the rare disorder community. Um, I personally am affected by uh, rare disorders in that um, I have a young lady in my family who um, we still don't know what her diagnosis is but um, she is uh, thriving with a lot of support from Shriners and other organizations. So our members, uh, Children's Healthcare Canada is a member-driven organization and 375,000 inpatient visits each year. 25% of those admissions are for children under the age of one. 20% are from uh, neonatal ICU and pediatric ICU. And we're seeing the complexity of admissions increasing, both physical and mental um, health issues and their complexity. 1.8 million children in Canada have a diagnosed rare disorder and up to 80% of all medications pre prescribed to children are off label or fall outside of Health Canada's approved use. And um, an abacus poll we did in 2019 suggested that 88% of the families surveyed had not gotten or had stopped their prescription medications because of the cost of those. So that has huge implications for a drug strategy. Um, 15 to 20% of young people live with a chronic illness or disability that limits their ability to participate in daily activities. And 8% of those experience chronic pain severe enough to inter interfere with their um, work-life play. Um, I'm not sure if the slides got up, but I'll continue. So I'll tell you a little bit about us now. Children's Healthcare Canada, as I mentioned, is a member-based organization celebrating about 55 years of history. In 1968, it was called CAF um, and was created by the leadership of the six then children's hospitals. In 2001, we embraced a cross continuum of care approach so that it is not just the pediatric academic centers, but all health services serving children, youth, and their families. In October of 2018, we launched uh, the new Children's Healthcare Canada, which was a reimagining of the former CAFC. And we have 45 members representing 250 individual health delivery organizations. In um, 2021, we also refreshed our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program, and I'm the senior advisor uh, sort of providing some leadership to that program. Our vision, like most of those in the room, is for healthy, vibrant children and youth. 
and we do so through purposeful partnerships and the networks of centers of excellence would certainly um, help us achieve that goal and uh, enable us to work with others uh, to help them achieve theirs. Um, from a strategic directions or priorities point of view, our first is informing the development of innovative and integrated systems of care. And we do that in a variety of ways, not the least of which is the uh, inclusion of patient partners at um, various stages through all of our um, activities. Uh, we have a family network that um, is uh, made up of families who interact with the healthcare system in a variety of different ways and tend to be those with more complex issues or rare conditions. Um, we have something we call value networks that are a member benefit and practice networks in particular are driven by our strategy. So you just heard about the first uh, piece of that strategy. I just spoke about the family networks. Child health hubs are more driven by the members and they we provide sort of space and facilitation to help those um, networks thrive more on their own. And executive circles where our child health leaders um, meet to discuss uh, wicked problems in the child health sphere, as well as challenges that they're facing. And it became particularly important throughout the COVID pandemic that um, we had a space for folks uh, to come together and support each other. Some examples of our work in this regard are a leadership summit series on child and youth mental health. Um, and we have follow-up con consultation sessions that are happening between now and the end of uh, June or July. Um, with regard to child and youth mental health. Um, Corey, who's in the room, is leading our Immunizing Children with Confidence project. And we have an upcoming, um, what we call a pop-up or a virtual event on September 13th. So uh, feel free to join us for that if you're interested in all things immunization, uh, vaccine confidence, and um, protecting children. We've also got a, a conference coming up that would provide an opportunity for network members to gather um, in the future uh, at, at these annual events. Our second uh, priority, um, which is sort of the piece that I lead, um, is about sharing evidence and getting good information into the hands of practitioners and policymakers so that can make good decisions with it and implement uh, with fidelity. And that is showcased through our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark's the shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. So it's our evidence curation, and gathering, and curation uh, process through a variety of different channels and knowledge sharing through a variety of different channels. Spark Live is our twice monthly webinar series. Spark Conversations was started in 2021 with a podcast series wherein we interview system leaders on wicked problems facing child health, um, practitioners, policymakers, or um, the system at large. Spark News is our twice monthly e-bulletin, and there's lots of opportunities for uh, communities with which we're involved to interact or share messages via those that newsletter. Um, and Spark Impact is a new um, consultative service for researchers to build their knowledge mobilization portions of their grants and to access some of our um, offerings through uh, grant support and in-kind uh, partnership. Um, we uh, uh, often approach for letters of support and we offer letters of particip par participation or collaboration or partnership. Um, um, not so much writing letters of support with the idea that something is simply a good idea, but that's something we're, we're willing to put some resources behind. Um, a variety of other Spark offerings that may be of interest, um, clear language abstracts, posters, using a um, knowledge mobilization focus design um, by Mike McMorrison, um, infographic, social media, and access to a variety of our networks, including those practice networks, child health hubs, and executive networks. And Spark Learning and Networking also happens at our live events. And I mentioned those, the national conference and what we're called pop-up events, which are smaller focused virtual events. Um, we've had several in the past, one focused on children with medical complexity and there's certainly a crossover and overlap with 
um, children with rare diseases and that community in particular. Um, as well, we've had them on uh, transitions to adulthood, again, uh, an issue of, of uh, relevance to a lot of folks in the room. Um, and the, the immunizing children with confidence pop-up will be the second in the vaccine confidence and promotion state. Um, our third group is around uniting, our third priority, I'm sorry, is around uniting strategic partners. Um, and it's about improving and fostering excellence in children's health. One example of our work with strategic partners, uh, we co-lead uh, SKIP, which is Solutions for Kids in Pain, and it is a no national knowledge mobilization network through the networks of centers of excellence that uses a hub and spoke model um, to uh, improve uh, pa pain management for children and families um, through purposeful partnerships, uh, sharing great evidence and supported implementation. The vision there is, is better um, pain management, but healthier Canadians through better pain management. Um, you'll see this slide are the knowledge brokers in part of the, um, in, in that it's a hub and spoke model. These are knowledge brokers who sit within a variety of different hubs in the country. So I'm at Children's Healthcare Canada and we're sort of the national arm of that. Uh, Sarah is in uh, Saint Justin. Laura Gibson is in IWK. Uh, Elise Kemmerer and uh, Megan McNeil are out of the Stollery Children's Hospital, and Megan is out of Alberta Children's. And Chad Larrabee is in the Sick Kids. We also have hub leads, which are researchers in the space. Samine Ali again at Stollery. Fiona Campbell and Jennifer Stinson at Sick Kids. Uh, my boss, Emily Grunwald at Children's Health Care Canada, and Emily is the co-director along with Christine Chambers of the um, SKIP. Evelyn uh, and uh, Maria Joel, Marie Street Joel, sorry, is at, are at Saint Justin, and Alan is at IWK. Um, this network has made some great strides. If you go to um, kidsinpain.ca, you will see a number of the resources and a number of the advocacy, knowledge mobilization and implementation supports. We're currently in the process of developing a HSO standard, which we're hoping will become an accreditation standard on pediatric pain management. And sadly, and excitingly, it will be the first of its kind in Canada. Um, we've also had affiliations, and I personally have had affiliations with another network of centers of excellence called FRAME, and it's focused on integrated youth services and promoting those throughout the country. Um, so we have some experience with the networks of centers of excellence and some uh, mechanisms that might be able to help support uh, that moving forward. And our fourth and final pillar in our strategic directions is to advocate for improvements in children's health and health systems. In 2019, we um, set as one of four election priorities, safer medications for children. At that time, up to 75%, and now up to 80% of all children's medications fall outside that uh, Health Canada approved off-label um, use. And it's vitally important that uh, children are not treated just like adults and children's medications aren't treated as uh, like adults. They need their own formulary uh, where it, um, ki kids can be assured that their the families can be assured that their kids are receiving uh, safe medication that's been tested and built for purpose for children. And we're lagging behind others in this regard. Um, we note that on uh, the mandate letter for the current Minister of Health is the continued towards a national universal pharmacare while proceeding with national strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases. So that remains part of our um, focus uh, of advocacy focus. Uh, current foci are um, focused for 2022 on um, post-pandemic recovery, assuming we're in a post-pandemic and uh, depends on who you talk to. Um, I'm still wearing my mask, so. Um, and uh, in support of mental health in a variety of jurisdictions, uh, we wanna build and advance a robust children's health and knowledge mobilization agenda, as do you in a particular area um, that we can absolutely support and uh, communications with the federal government to boost the uptake of vaccines. Um, 
this we inform a lot of our work through through uh, research and um, evidence synthesis, but also through um, polling. We often contract abacus polling for uh, some of the data and the percentage um, that you heard of parents who have foregone medication uh, due to cost um, came from uh, abacus polling. And we also engage with the media and a lot of this uh, is directed media. The media has come to us and our uh, CEO is um, quite expert at uh, media, is media savvy uh, as a result of a number of, of several pieces of our work and previous experience. Um, we've had the Child Health Advocacy Day on the Hill where uh, a number of our members, as well as patient partners and um, parliamentarians came together to discuss uh, what a pandemic uh, strategy focused on children would look like. And a number of the health concerns in various regions were, were addressed. Um, and uh, there were a couple of patient partners representing the rare disease community um, at those uh, meetings. And we're doing a fair bit in the terms of uh, federal engagement, a number of pre-budget submissions, um, the HEAL Action Lobby, and some uh, we're part of um, presenting to and uh, informing uh, the House of Commons sub, uh, Committee, uh, the HESA Committee um, on their, their child health study. So thank you so much for your time. I hope that this sparks some ideas about how we might be involved uh, and support the work that you're doing in terms of the rare uh, disease network uh, and networks of centers of excellence. And I'd be happy to draw on our experience with other networks of centers of excellence um, uh, as we move forward as well. And happy to share anything and everything and over to you if you have any reflections, questions or comments or if they're to be held till the end of the panel, um, that's fine too. Thank you so very much, Paula. And um, trusting that you will be able to stay with us to the end of this panel because obviously you'll be able to build on what we're gonna hear from uh, more global states. So this is wonderful. And really, you know, you're gonna be more than involved as you know, and really kudos to everything that you've been able to do through the association. Okay, have you guys agreed who's going next? You're going to, Marshall's going to, will you arm wrestle for it or something? Wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna now have Marshall Summer, who's going to come in and give us a rousing introduction to, well, not just introduction to, but a rousing presentation of uh, Rare Disease Institute in the U.S. Thank you. First off, I have to compliment the audience on your stamina today, your God in heaven. <laughs> Normally, we used to refer to this as the Blackberry Prayer Hour, where everyone's <laughs> like this. I, I see a few of those there. Prayer time's over. Let's get going. All right, so my name is Marshall Summer. I've been in the field of rare disease since about 1985. Uh, I've run the Rare Disease Institute at Children's National, which is built on the uh, backbone of the genetics and metabolism field. What I want to talk to you, Durhane asked me to cover a lot of ground. I'm not going to cover it all. Uh, first off, it's the end of the day, and I think my brain's full, and I don't know about y'all's. But I am going to come up with some points that might be a little bit of a step back uh, from where we've done a lot of deep dive today. So first off, one thing that happens when rare disease encounters government policy is we have a square peg that often is trying to be fit into a round hole. And so the option is you can whittle off the square peg to try to make it fit, which means you lose a lot of the richness of it, um, or you can just sit there and bang and it never quite fits. Uh, I would make the argument that rare disease is really evolving as a unique field of medicine. So let me get a little bit of input from the audience. How many of you are patients, parents, family, or patient advocates? Please raise your hand. This will help me out with the ad. Okay. How many of you are providers? And do we have any policymakers left, or did they all have to scurry back to their offices too? Ah, yes. All right. So my wife worked for, on Capitol Hill in the Senate for 11 years. So I, you know, the fact that you actually stayed for all of this is nothing short of miraculous. I don't know if you give a prize or not, but you, you should get a prize. All right. So first thing to remember about rare disease is these are genetic conditions that have a lifetime of um, impact. When you look at the two funnels in the bottom, 
Um, if I have hypertension, there are a lot of causes that go into hypertension, obesity, lifestyle, stress, all of the things that we encounter. With rare disease, you start at the narrow end of the funnel, usually with a single diagnosis, then it has a tremendous number of impacts on somebody's health. Um, the other thing is these have limited incidence data. We have limited outcome data. You know, we're, we do the best we can, but you notice whenever we give an incidence, it's got a lot of zeros in the number because we're rounding or we're guessing. Uh, that's because we just don't know for a lot of these things uh, how often they are. The other thing, and this is one thing I teach all of my young docs, the parents and families are your best source of information about these disease. Given the genetic heterogeneity and rare disease, they actually have more information and knowledge sometimes than the most learned person who is studying that field. Also, our families and our rare disease patients use more medical specialties, I'll show you a little data on that in a second, than really any other field of medicine. Now, here's the stark truth of the matter. Since the completion of the Human Genome Project, I, got, I had fun, I, I'm old enough where I got to be an editor on the Human Genome Project, which just means I was alive in 1991. Um, <laughs> But the average number of new conditions described every week is 10 to 11. Remember, the classic model of medicine is I'm supposed to be an expert of everything in my field and you can walk up to me and I know it all. I'm, I've missed two, three diseases today um, that are new and newly described. It's not that there's more of these coming out, it's just we're identifying them. Um, using molecular genetic tools, we're identifying these conditions. There's no way you can use that classic model on this. The other thing to remember is we've only got in the states anyway about 600 approved therapies, half of which are for cancer, for rare diseases. So the majority of the conditions we have, we're treating with medical knowledge, we're treating with, you know, nutraceuticals, we're treating with, you know, what is it, you know, bat wing and eye of newt sometimes it feels like. Actually, that's what they used to call my shelf in the pharmacy, it was the bat wing shelf, because we had all the things nobody else was using. Now, what's happening with prevalence? The number of conditions described is going up. Prevalence is going up as well, too. Take Down syndrome. It's a borderline rare disease, but it's really kind of fallen into that category. In the 1980s, average life expectancy was in the 20s. It's now approaching 60. Cystic fibrosis, same thing we've seen, and uh, our family's still here? Yeah. Um, we've seen tremendous increases in survivability. Some of it by drugs, but actually some of it just by people getting together and sharing their treatment protocols. Um, I have never seen a situation where that doesn't improve outcome when people compare and share best practices. Sickle cell anemia, the same thing. We've seen teenage lethal diseases go into their 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, you know, in cystic fibrosis now, the life expectancy is almost going up one year every year because we don't know what the back end is anymore. A lot of this work is not, it, some of it is because of wonderful new drugs, but a lot of it is because people get together, they get their acts together, they compare notes, they start listening to each other. And you know, one of the things the CF Foundation did early on is they forced their centers to report their outcomes, they shared those outcomes, and then some of the really high-end academic centers that normally is like, we would never listen to podunk Q because they don't know what they're doing, suddenly it's like, Put on Q's survival is about two or three times ours. Maybe we should actually ask what they're doing. So sharing and comparing notes are one of the key themes, I think, in the rare disease world. Let me tell you a little bit about economics. I'll use my U.S. experience for this, but I think it's applicable just about anywhere. If you come to a children's hospital one time, you have a 12% likelihood of having an ICD-10 diagnosis for rare disease. If you get admitted to a children's hospital, it's 18 to 20%. If you visit it twice, even if you just walk in the front door, stare at the scenery and then walk back out, it's 30%. Why? Children are basically healthy. If they are coming again and again to a children's hospital, it usually means something is wrong. And one of the most common things in childhood as a single category, the most common thing is rare disease. Now, what's interesting is that actually accounts for 54% of hospital charges, those rare disease patients. They're some of the most expensive patients in medicine. It's one of the reasons why we've got to get our policies right. You know, the smarter we are about taking care of our patients and our families, the more money we can actually save because they're going to be healthier. Healthier folks don't use as much resource. People who are ignored or treatment is delayed or it's postponed, 
cost a lot more. There's some great data about the diagnostic odyssey. Once you actually get to the end and find a, a diagnosis for the patient, costs for that patient go down. It's the same thing with chronic management as well, too. Now, this was uh, the number of specialties that patients who came to my uh, rare disease service in one year used. And what we find is they used every single specialty in the hospital. Our patients get more secondary referrals to other specialties than any other group by almost an order of magnitude. So rare disease, you know, being that other category, touches on everything. So what's the cost in the states for treating a rare disease patient? It's about 97,000 a year on average. And that's factoring in all rare disease, not just the ones that have a pharmaceutical treatment. As opposed to about 12 to 13,000 for a patient who's got a chronic other kind of disease. If we look at the rate of new drug approvals, you can make the argument that the Orphan Drug Act that's prevalent in uh, Europe, the US, I think we got a little early start in 1983 on this, probably one of the most successful incentive programs in history. 50% of the new medical compounds approved by FDA every year for an orphan disease. And the orphan equal rare. Now that's throwing, 50% of those are for cancer. The cancer world is awesome at finding ways to make orphan categorizations and using DNA and molecular, you know, and, and good on them for doing that. But still about half or a quarter of the drugs are for orphan diseases. All right. Now, having done that, we have increased by orders of magnitude the number of diseases. We have increased by orders of magnitude the number of treatments. Our workforce is flat. So since 1982 in the United States, only 1,500 physicians have been boarded in clinical genetics. Um, I can tell you now that for biochem genetics, uh, Pranesh, Pranesh, if you want a job, I got some great openings down there. Um, we're down to, I know, I'm just kidding. Ooh, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I'm an evil American. I can wave cash around or something like that. That's, I think that's what y'all think about us. It's kind of like, yes, I've got my suitcase full of money here. Let's go, let's go. Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. I, and by the way, I am absolutely honored to be here. This is a, a fun for me. It's been fun listening all day, but I figure we might as well end the day on a lighter note. We're down to about 80 biochemical geneticists in the United States in practice. That's actually almost the level at which a field can go under because you just can't staff enough and everybody else burns out quickly. So we're, we're in a little bit of crisis, so we have to do things differently. Globally, the problem is pretty common in the developing world. It's about one in four to five million uh, clinical geneticists. And I use geneticists as a generic term for rare disease doctors taking care of patients with uh, genetic rare disease. Um, in the in Western Europe, it's about one and a quarter million. Same thing in the United States. But still, that's the normal rate for physicians is one in a few thousand. So there's a real, real understaff. So we got challenges. More diseases and longer survival means more patients. Um, we've got treatment explosions. We've got diagnostic. These are all good things. You know, we can do so much more than when I started in this field. I used to sit around and hold people's hands and say, I'm really sucks, I have to tell you what you have, but there's not much I can do about it. That's not so true anymore. Um, the patients are going from acute to chronic models. It used to be we diagnosed, not much we could do. Now we're taking care of them for long periods of time. And the other big thing that we never had to think about before is transition to adulthood, because our patients didn't. Now they do. And we can't get the adult medical world to do it, so we're going to have to figure out how to do it ourselves. The other thing is we've got ge geographic disparities between patients. We have patients that don't have great access because they're not like next door to a major medical center. You've got folks way the heck back out there. I think some of them you can only reach by bush plane. Um, I know better than that, trust me. Um, but it's also our... Uh, look. So I grew up in Tennessee. Tennessee is rural. Um, there are places in Tennessee you can't get thar from here, um, y'all. <laughs> anyway, the other thing that's happening, though, is our financial impact on the health system is becoming noticeable. The first few rare disease drug treatments that had high sticker prices, everyone was like, well, that's really high, but there's not that many of them. 
Does anyone know what the uh, global percentage of rare disease drug is on the global market right now for rare disease drugs? Anybody want to take a guess? It's about 18 percent, and it's climbing. It's estimated that it will hit 24 percent before too long. Payers will notice. Uh, governments notice these things, and then they have to start making decisions. How are you going to spread that around? So how do you deal with all of these wonderful challenges? Well, you can throw up your hands and quit, or you can hop on your jet ski and ride over the top of the wave. That's my preference. So one thing you've got to look at is medicine is one of the more conservative fields. We like to think we're cutting edge. We resist change like crazy. So we've kind of got one foot on the dock of the traditional model, you know, where we are supposed to be experts in all we do and doing things the way we have, and you come in and see us, and then we do all these things. We've got one foot on the boat, and it's a speedboat, and it's going to leave the dock pretty soon. And I'm hoping in time we can pull that foot off the dock and get out there. So for me, all of these challenges are an opportunity to say, okay, we can't realistically even use the old model. You know, there's no way I can keep up with 10 new diseases a week and know what they are. If I can't go and say, I have to be willing to say to my patient, i got to go look that up. I don't know that. Um, but I've also, and actually younger generation docs are better at this than we are. They are much better at information gleaning from digital sources. Um, I know just enough to be dangerous on the computer. Um, but the young dog says, oh, yeah, I've pulled 12 resources together. Here's the link to the latest gene for this. And here's the three sites that are doing research on it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I do a lot of Socratic teaching in clinic for those of you who get that joke. <laughs> All right. So how do we do this? We do it by collaboration. We do it by new care models. We do it by using technology. And we gotta, we got to grab it with both hands and hold on to it. And we have to involve our primary care providers. We don't have the luxury anymore of saying, we'll handle it all within our rare esoteric field. We actually have to push some of the care, we have to push some of the diagnostic workups back out into the community. We have to do it in a way that makes sense. So one way to do that are centers of excellence. And with a limited workforce, one of the models we've used is what we call the hub and spoke model. Um, you can have a lot of things when you pull it together in one place. And you actually have some already. I mean, you've got some really good centers up here. But it also is a way for the public to know what's available where. And that's where organizations like CORD come in. So who should kind of manage those centers of excellence? The government? Probably not, actually. The physicians themselves? Well, of course, we're all centers of excellence because we're all excellent. No, actually, the patient advocacy groups are the best folks to determine where the centers of excellence should be to come up with the criteria, partnering with them, of course, but still coming up with those definitions. And there's two models. One's called the topic center. That's where you have centers of excellence around a particular disease or disease group. Uh, in fact, actually, European Reference Network kind of uses that model. The other is what I call the generic center. It's where you pulled a lot of resources together, and you can pretty much take care of anything that hits the door. Obviously, those are a lot harder to put together and more resource intensive. So what type of networks are there? There's the Nord Center of Excellence. It was just, um, we had our first class start last fall. Pam Gavin's going to talk about that, so I won't steal her thunder, but I've had so much fun working with them on that over the year. The European Reference Network, the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network at NIH, which is more around research in rare disease, but it's been ongoing since 2004. The WHO program, which we're going to hear about a little bit from Matt, the Global Commission to End the Diagnostic Odyssey for Children with Rare Disease, which is the worst name organization I have ever been a part of, <laughs> followed closely by the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, lovingly known as IRDIC. No, I'm not making that up. And there are others. All right. The central model, which is the one I've worked the most with, what are the advantages? Well, first off, you get mutual support. Our young docs want to actually have some work-life balance. They want to be able to actually take a vacation to actually see their kids sometime during the day. Most of them are working couples. So there's so much going on already, they need that balance. The other nice thing about having a central model is you can provide 24-7, uh, 365 coverage because you've got enough staff in one place. The other thing is expertise can not only be shared digitally, but it can be shared in the hallway. Because, you know, the... Um, 
activation energy to pick up the phone, call someone who you may not know that well and ask them a question is more than just walking next door and saying, I got this weird case, what should I do with this? All right, hub and spoke is the other part of the clinical thing we're using. Uh, you can support outpost programs. So you can have small groups that aren't gonna burn out. What we're seeing in the United States now is we're seeing a lot of docs leaving practice. They just don't wanna do it anymore, it's too hard. And in genetics, we're seeing a lot, and the industry's actually recruited a lot of them. There's almost as many in the industry now as there are in practice. Um, you can standardize care more by getting people working off the same page. It's more cost effective. If you are doing things more efficiently, you can do them more cost effectively. Now try to do that across 8,000 diseases, and it gets kind of challenging. Uh, it works well for geographically spread out areas. It's heavily dependent, however, on digital technology. You've got to be able to build those networks and use them. And the more you do, the better you get. And we've learned this in other parts of medicine. We keep reinventing the wheel. Liver transplant. Everyone wanted to have a liver transplant center at one point in time. Then they learned that the more livers you do, the better the outcomes were. So they actually consolidated, and now there are fewer liver transplant centers that do better work. Same thing with pediatric heart disease and heart surgery and almost everything else. So by having those centers where they're doing a lot of this, you get better outcomes. And from a policymaker standpoint, it doesn't cost as much. Centers of Excellence programs can do a lot of things. I'm not, I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but they can help with education, diagnostics. The, for policymakers, they make a great place to go for one-stop shopping to get ideas uh, for what's going on in the field. You can develop new technologies which can be shared, all sorts of things. One thing we've done is, do not memorize this, there will be no tests later, but you can actually map the patient journey from the beginning of symptoms through the diagnostic process, through that, and actually by using process engineering on this, you can identify places where you can become more efficient. This is just simply to show that there is some process you can apply to this. You know, the old kind, like I said, the old medical model just really doesn't work that well anymore. Telemed is something we learned. We got to do the grand experiment. We were doing a few hundred telemed visits a year before 2020. We've done over 15,000 in our rare disease institute since that time. Patients love it. It looks like the long-term rate's gonna be about 30 to 40%. If you've got a fragile child, bringing them into a children's hospital is not the best idea, particularly if you have to roll by the ER to get anywhere. So we've actually found um, admission rates went down. We saw a 25% drop in our metabolic disease patients when we were managing them by telemedicine. Shorter decision loops, patients could get um, questions answered faster, and also they weren't rolling by the pediatric emergency room catching every infectious disease on the planet uh, that was down there. The other thing is we found for certain patient groups, it was better. Our autistic patients, when we use telemedicine, I've had families crying saying, if we were here at your hospital right now, these two boys would be trying to beat you up because they would be so freaked out. But yet I'm seeing them at home playing, walking around, doing their normal things. And you can't tell me that's not a better exam. All right, there's a lot of things we're doing. One thing is around patient education. Uh, if I come into a clinic, how many of y'all remember your first, for the pa parents and families, your first visit when you talked about a diagnosis? How many of you remember? How many of the words do you remember after they used a word saying something's wrong? Almost everything after that was wah, 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 wah. So one thing we did is put together a series of videos explaining those things that we were talking about after that, that families can watch at home on their own, and also when the rest of the family says, well, what's this whole exome thing you're doing? Saying, here, watch the damn video where you're kind of processing the rest of it. So we're doing a lot of things like that. Uh, it's Gene Clips, it's free if you want to see it. It's on available on Android and iPhone, and uh, we solicit new ideas all the time. We also, uh, one of the things for around our genomics projects we're using with technology is most DNA stuff ends up as a PDF in your electronic medical record, which is very hard to retrieve. So we built, actually working with Cerner, but we did it in Smart on Fire, so it can be used in other EMRs, is an uh, actual honest-to-God storage place for DNA data from patients that links into the DNA registries where those are updated as to whether or not they mean anything or not. Um, some of the, those of you who work with DNA data a lot will know that our opinion changes a lot on friend and foe when we look at particular changes in DNA. 
So a lot of sequence analysis stuff. Oh, goodness gracious. And I'll close on this one. Um, the one thing we're working on, this is my project that we uh, launched last year with Vanderbilt University. It's called RareCap for Rare Clinically Actionable Protocols. It's, think of it as Wikipedia meets Reddit. <laughs> so we have core protocols for diseases that can be stood up very quickly, but then we allow them to evolve with input from the community, which includes caregivers and patients themselves. Uh, what do you do in this situation? They're scenario-based. So what do you do for acute management? What do you do for chronic? What's the impact on routine health care? What do you do with special situations like pregnancy, chemo, um, cancers, things like that? Um, the idea is we make these useful enough so that they can be pushed out to the community. And so someone, we like to call them Friday night protocols. Something someone in an emergency room on Friday night can use when you know the geneticist has gone to their lake home where they finally you know, got sick of the field and left for wherever it was. So those are some of the things you can do by pulling together. Um, you guys are, now the one thing is, I think Canada has a much stronger chance of being successful at this than almost anyone else. And let me explain why. You're small enough where everybody kind of gets along and knows everybody, and you're nice enough too, let's face it. Where everybody, uh, it's small, but it's a small enough group to be manageable, but it's big enough where if you're successful, it will have global impact. So I encourage you to get this right, because frankly, you can lead the way for a lot of other places. And Durant, thank you for asking me to come. Thank you so very, very much, Matt. Matt didn't actually talk about his center too much, and he didn't show any pictures of it. But let me tell you, if we have the opportunity to go down to Washington, D.C., and visit the Rare Disease Institute that he's got alongside of his you know, National Children's Hospital, I actually said I'm going to organize a road trip down there for people to see it because it is absolutely a vision in terms of what they've put together there and really the kind of work that's taking place there. So, you know, I, I have a great counter offer for you, quite frankly. I know that you're stepping down in terms of your, person, your current position. You could come up here and be a free consultant to setting up the Canadian <laughs> network and actually be able to have your imperture on it as a, you know, as having been, you know, a founder, you know, and we could even think of making you a national treasure. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I, no, you've got a lot of national treasure. Right? <laughs> and also my wife drew the line at basically south of Philadelphia, so anything below that. But if you do get to D.C., do look us up. Um, our, we're headquartered in a former atomic blast-proof federal research building that belonged to the United States Army just to kind of whet your appetite for what it would be. We call it the giant concrete cheese box that we now have cut windows in that has two feet of concrete. So given a lot of the weirdness in the world right now, we are taking reservations. Though <laughs> <laughs> so he's not guaranteeing that it's actually bomb-proof no. for today. So, you it know. was built in 1955, and in 1955, they did think hiding under your school desk was probably <laughs> adequate protection. <laughs> Thank you so very much. That was a delightful presentation. And Marshall did promise to come back again as we're doing this yep. working group. So if you want to sign up a working group and you want to be mightily entertained at the same time, think about it, okay? Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Are you next, Matt? Yep. Absolutely. Matt's going to talk to us about the global vision and really was the impetus for our working so hard to put together the model of the Centers of Excellence because we want to be... As Marshall was saying, we want to be that pilot site in terms of a global center of excellence and really be able to use everything that they're developing globally to bring into the uh, Canadian environment. So we're at a really good timing here. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Dorian. So it's, I, I'm really going to struggle to top uh, the previous speaker. Marshall is excellent at this. So really today I'm, I've been invited to talk about the global network but really I want to throw down the gauntlet to you, to Canada, to step forward and go from good to great. I think it's a small step you can make. I've heard all the presentations today and been inspired, but coming together and becoming one of the leaders globally in this network will be amazing. So I um, hope today that will um, be an inspiration for you to do that. 
Um, I used to work in the healthcare system. I worked as a patient advocate now for eight years, and I worked for about 14 years uh, in the NHS in England. And I sort of became a commissioner, and I learned how to say no. I learned to say no 50 different ways. So no matter what situation I was in, I could say no. And protect budgets. And I got really disillusioned. I got disillusioned because we weren't meeting the needs of the people who needed them. And I got a job doing national networks in the UK for ultra-rare diseases. And I saw by how you work together, how you align the clinical needs with the patient needs, and work together, you could improve outcomes for patients by 20%, improve productivity, and improve uh, cost-effectiveness of services. So you can be fitter, leaner, and be better for the patient just by how you work together. And I saw that happening at a national network level by getting clinicians who previously competed against each other to come together with a shared identity, and they competed against the disease and they shared. So what, not, what um, Marshall said was, Individually, people like Marshall, I'm amazed by, they're brilliant. But actually, together, all these experts, which you have in, we've heard today, together they know more. And when they collaborate globally, for some of the ultra-rare diseases especially, actually we can really pull on and harness and leverage that global knowledge to inform care locally. And we can learn from you here as well. So... Um, as a, as a commissioner, I learned that organising healthcare services is best done as local to your population as possible to understand those, those needs. That works for hips and knees and emergency services, etc., or older people's services. But when it comes to more um, lower prevalence conditions, you need to think more regionally or, or nationally. You know, the population sizes in your territories and in your provinces vary significantly what you can do in Ontario on the knowledge base, a size of population for an ultra-rare disease here, you, pr you might be able to cover. But actually, in some of the other uh, provinces and, and st um, territories, you won't. So actually, there's a need for to collaborating together. So you st this, this principle about organising care locally is true, even for rare diseases, but you need to think about a bigger population size to have enough cases to ha know what their needs are and to organise care. Um, I, one of the services I had in the UK was for vein again and malformation. It affected five to ten babies a year in the UK. We gave it to two interventional radiologists because if they, they only maintain competencies by doing, and if they didn't maintain competencies and they went to different centres, the outcomes were not good. We, when we had a low number of cases, we used to bring experts from abroad to review those cases to learn together. And the nearest expert was from Canada. And we flew them in, and we got them to review all the cases with these two interventional radiologists to make sure that the care which they were continuing to do was, was maintained. So what we've seen, what uh, Marshall highlighted earlier, with you know, the ERNs, we've got the National uh, uh, Network for Undiagnosed in the US. Actually, networking has evolved in rare diseases, born out of necessity. Because of the complexities of rare diseases, actually the expertise isn't in one team in one hospital, but actually is in a number of hospitals. And maybe those hospitals might be in different countries. So we've had a move of evolution of the care model from MDT care to network care. And what we're finding now with these networks like the ERNs is we're, that's demonstrating proof of concept. That the lots of those networks were born from research networks active research networks, and actually they now stepped into doing clinical care and health care, and actually five years, four years down the road, it's been proved to be effective, and there's something magical being a patient representative, seeing the two international leads sat there talking and sharing, and you can see that both of them are, are no knowing more and walking away from that, knowing more which they can give to their patients. So we've had this proof of concept of networking, and we're starting to see networking for rare diseases ar around the world. We've got one, a network in China connecting 333 hospitals in 33 provinces. We've got a network in Japan. Brazil is now starting a national network, starting in Porto Alegro and working up. And the US with the Nord centers, which we'll hear in a minute, is also moving that direction. So that global networking environment is starting to warm up. What we, I don't know where I'm facing. 
OK, I've jumped two. That's good. So I'll speed up. So um, I work for Rare Disease International in Eurodis, and we've been advocating globally for rare diseases to be included in, in the, in the uh, health priorities by the UN and the WHO. And in 2019, we got when they were de developing the UN re declaration, political declaration for UHC, universal health coverage, we got rare diseases included as a population on there. So that was unanimously signed off, so all countries around the world who will now deliver that by 2030. And by doing that, they have to do it for the people with the rare disease as well. In Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Western Pacific. So that was a massive step forward, and that made the WHO, the World Health Organization, go, who are you? Durhan's our chair of Rare Disease International. We share a chair, which is great. We do share, so it's... Uh, <laughs> um, and... The WHO came to RDI and uh, has set up in a memorandum of understanding to work together because the WHO has a role and responsibility to implement and support member states, implement UHC. So for the rare disease community, the WHO it says it's like music. They see the vision of a global network for rare diseases which aims at improving universal health coverage for people with rare disease. It's music to their ears. And they're working with us to define that to scope that out, what does it look like? And so the work I'll be presenting now is about the co-development and co-design of this network by our community. Representatives from here, from Canada, from the US, from over 100 countries around the world. We <laughs> it's got their attention and we... We also, in, for us and our community, that wasn't enough. And last year, we got put, got, uh, uh, unani uh, got unanimously uh, voted on a new UN resolution to tackling the challenges of people with a rare disease and their families. Because rare disease isn't just about health, it's about social, it's about employment, it's about everything. And we had in this new resolution, which was passed in December last year, so Canada signed up to that, all countries signed up to that. And in this new resolution, it calls for member states, it encourages them to foster the creation of national networks of centres of expertise in their country. It also calls, uh, asks them to for them to collaborate internationally for research and data sharing. So the work I'm presenting now is about our work as a community scoping out what a global, what our vision of a global network looks like for rare diseases. We've scoped out the need at a regional level and a global level, and then we use that to define, to co-design this model for a network, and we've just submitted in, in March this year an operational framework for the pilot. The work's been, we've had really positive support by the WHO, which we're very pleased about, and we want to maximise on. Um, and, and the work has been seen that it's well grounded in the, our community's needs. So the model is based on uh, a hub-and-spoke model, but seeing the global network as a network of networks. We've got the ERNs, we've got the Chinese network, we've got a US network growing. So what if we can create the development of other regional networks around the world? US I class as regional because it's so big. Um, so what we see, the, no matter where you are, is with the no matter where you live with the rare disease around the world, you should be able to access the specialist advice you need through this network of networks. Globally, we want to uh, see this global network to pull uh, expertise, to give specialist advice, and to build global knowledge. We want to leverage those digital technologies which Marshall and I can't use, but his fellows can at the top of the hat. Um, to ensure that, that that expertise can travel. And really, together, we can inform global policy. And what fills my heart with joy is the idea of a WHO, ro WHO roadmap for rare diseases, and one which we as a community define, which then can be implemented in Canada, in the US, in Latin America, and beyond. At a regional level, we, we want to see regional hubs come together as virtual multi-centre multi networks um, and patient organisations coming together. That They are built based on shared experience, shared culture and shared language under a shared vision. And what can, they can use a digital platform which can support their collaboration. In Africa, there's a real will and desire to collaborate, but actually having that infrastructure would really help them. So we want to try and 
milk as much as that tech which is out there. At a national level, we see these, these regional hubs being connected by national hubs, a national hub in Canada, national hubs in the US and, and down in Latin America. <coughs> these national hubs we see as being single center or multi-center. It could be that you have five or six, 10 centers come together and form one hub as a hub and spoke model, connecting into the Canadian healthcare system. You know, in, in Africa, we don't have many big centers of expertise, so actually they need to connect through to primary care. And these national hubs really should be able to be plug into global knowledge and, and, and draw on it to, in, to strengthen the healthcare systems locally. So these national hubs connect under regional hubs, and these regional hubs connect under a global hub. I've said all this, so I won't go into it in any detail. We think that the national hub model, sh we should bring in the regulators because it's important to get recognition and political support in, in your country uh, by the government. And that the, it isn't just, let's say, one hospital. I, 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 I won't do your hospitals because I, I'll get them wrong. And I'll. So in the UK, it could be Great Ormond Street says, oh, we'll be the national hub. The national hub doesn't need to be the expert in everything. It's about the national hub connecting to a system and they know where the experts are. So that expert for venous and malformation, they connect with Gl Glasgow. So it's about connecting in the system into the global network. It's not the privileged place of one center in those experts. It's not a, a membership club. Um, the regional hubs we think should be defined locally. So by your communities. So what works with you? And I'll talk about that in a second. And globally, it could be that we'll set up some disease cluster working groups. And it could be that there's someone with the, who's interested in metabolic from, from Ottawa, I don't know who, uh, who steps forward and says, oh, I want to get active with other colleagues in metabolic diseases around the world. So we could have a metabolic and endocrine working group where we, the experts come together. So that metabolic clinician here might not be formally in the national hub, but they will be in the national system connected into that so they can step forward and take part. Um, so when we, when we engaged with our community, we looked at where is their shared culture, shared experience, and shared um, uh, language, really, as well. And for, for, the, for the WHO region of the Americas, we identified about four. You can see here Mexico and Brazil are in white. Um, it's because they're pretty much, they're, they don't really fit into one area, or they collaborate with two. It's the same with Turkey. Turkey collaborates with Europe, also collaborates with East Mediterranean. So it, we don't want to create artificial barriers. This, we want it to be a flexible model set on principles which can be tailored based on your needs. So what's your vision for your national network? What's your vision of how that can connect into, into a, a US uh, collaboration, into a hub or beyond? This is our vision of what the global network will look like. This won't happen tomorrow. This is a vision which probably would take 10 years to achieve. You know, Erdic took a bit of time to get off the start line. And so we can see that maybe in the next year we start a couple of hub models at a regional level to test out the mo the, whether the model works. Is a model in North America, what's the needs of that compared with a model of a hub in, in Africa? It might be very different. So we want to be flexible on that. One of the common things is that the hubs should aim to progressively provide disease coverage and population coverage and support implementation of UHC. That's a common denominator. When we spoke to patients in, in the US, they were, they were saying that they still needed to gain access to that. The issue about um, state lines and insurance systems in the US, you know, trying to get Marshall as your clinician uh, when you live in California, your insurance system doesn't do it. So, you know, it's to try and really break down some of those things. Um, so progressively, we'll move down this road um, and we'll do some pilots uh, as we go. So the framework for collaboration, really, we want to look at implementation of the network care model. Uh, that's through pooling of expertise, building knowledge, and um, vir uh, providing virtual consultation. We'll set up a global network with participant members, 
pr probably in individual organizations initially who are early adopters of virtual care and who do networking. I expect Nord to be one of those. I would expect CORE to be one of those. And the work you're doing here, we want you to get involved in this global network. And you know, when I look at Europe and where we started from, Europe in rare diseases is pretty organized, but it's there because of, of France, really. France stepped forward at the beginning and said, we can tackle rare diseases, and they role modeled to the rest of the EU what they could do. And so we want other countries like Canada to step forward and role model to the other countries in, in, the, Latin, in the Americas region and globally to show this can be done, we can make progress. We'll have a steering group, um, the steering group is important to have equal representation. Equi equitable health uh, is key for us, and what we don't want is those who have and are mo most well developed are in the pilot network. We want to have representatives from the ones which need and the ones which want to. We want to be able to build a system based which can meet the needs of the rarest, the remote, and the indigenous. And if we build a system, and, and Canada's huge, so I'm sure you know who they are. If we can design a system which can meet those people in the remote and the rare and the indigenous, then we'll meet the population needs of the others. The working group model we're looking at in different types of cl uh, clustering um, and the regional hub model I've talked about. So the next step for us is to identify the early innovators and early adopters, to connect them together and to appraise them and get them involved in the network, get member state endorsement and support, and launch the network. And then the pilot network will be very much an experimental ground to try new approaches. What works? What works here? What works in Africa? What works in China? And learn and see which, which approach is, uh, you know, our diversity is our strength. And I think we should really maximize on that in the, in the pilot network. So today is about the uh, rare drug strategy and really to, to achieve a better access for people, which we've heard today in the panel of patient representatives earlier. It was really humbling to hear them talk. The first step in building an access pathway is having centres which are designated as being expert. That gives visibility to people to find them and to be referred. If you're referred, Marshall has said, that you, you get the time you get a diagnosis, actually then you can get onto a treatment or support, whether it's whether there's an active treatment around or not. Um, and so the more you get diagnosed, the more visible that population is, and the more recognition by governments of the burden which they need to of disease which they need to address. Um, and the more you then have these national recognition of uh, health priorities, I know your strategy is in place, um, which is great, but lots of places don't have that. Um, by having then these centres which are using these therapies in real world, they know who they're best catered for, and actually the clinical community can then make better decisions on who needs them. So really lots of, this is the pathway which we think the network will, will set and develop around the world. The last slide now, shut up. These three, these four key components of an assessment framework for your network for, for, for an a expert centre programme. You need to have a good governance in place, i.e. an overarching advisory group, having representation from those regional or province level to be involved in that. You maintain their political buy-in and ownership. They'll keep the money locally, but you have to bring them along. Patient involvement at that group is key to do prioritization as well. And that I'll repeat probably on, on the next three points as well. Scoping out what this network should be, what your sense of expertise should be or excellence, as Marshall said, in terms of topic-based or more generic. Um, the assessment methodology for th which you define to set, to, to define your centers and set them up, they should be, that should be co-created with patients. The evidence base shows when, when that happens, you get actually a more valuable um, a, a accreditation system rather than a hurdle, to, to a bureaucratic hurdle to be jumped at a point in time. And then the last point, funding models. We heard it earlier today. Stable funding in, an, in a network like this really helps and translates to service sustainability 
building clinical experience and knowledge, which, guess what, has an impact on care. It means by having a more stable system which connects across your provinces to meet the needs of the most vulnerable, you can actually get a, a more cost-effective and more clinically effective service. Thank you. Okay, you heard again. Canada is right at that point of being able to make a significant contribution. We just have to get our act together. Nope. So <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. And now hopefully, Pam, you're still on with us. I'm really sorry this has become you know, so much more delayed. But Pam, if you're there, we really would love to have you speak to us again with regard to the Nord uh, centers of excellence, and I think as I introduced last time, you know, we had these discussions with Nord. I think, Marshall, you were still chair at the time, chair of the board at the time. Yeah, we were having this discussion, yeah. exactly, about having jointly moving forward with Canadian centers of excellence and U.S. centers of excellence, and in typical fashion, the U.S. Uh, moved ahead and actually begin to implement that. In Canada, we're, we're playing catch up, but we, we can do well is we can learn from the best and actually move ahead, I think is what you're saying. Not that that is necessarily what we're trying to do, Pam, because we're still very, very much, uh, as you saw at the registries, really, really learning from Nord and really appreciative of how generous Nord is with regard to sharing not only their models, but their expertise and also providing the actual hands-on assistance. So Pam, I'll ha turn it over to you. Thank you, Durhan. Uh, oh, there's a little bit of reverb. Can you all hear me okay? I want to share my screen. We hear you just fine. So okay. what you're hearing, we're not hearing. In okay, terms great. Of reverb. Just waiting for my screen to refresh here. Can you all see? Yeah. Oh, except that I have this weird. Um, so is it showing just my screen correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So as the caboose for today, I'm not gonna be as cute as most trained cabooses look, um, but I'll do my best to be to the point because I'm sure everybody's tired and it's going to be hard to follow um, my colleagues, Paula, uh, Marshall and Matt. But I'm here to really share with you a little bit about what NORD's doing in its rare, um, rare disease centers of excellence program and hopefully um, learn from some of the things, um, uh, the, the, the things that we did well or right and the things that we, um, the mistakes that we made. So some of you may have seen um, the announcement last fall. Um, we did announce our 31 inaugural medical institutions designated. Thank you, it was a long process. Um, and although the program is really technically six months old, in reality, it's been a much long, has a lot much longer history that began with discussions with Nord's then board of, uh, of, of directors chairman, Dr. Marshall Summer. We owe a debt of gratitude to Marshall for um, sharing his vision and um, helping shepherding the organization and our research and discussions with other medical professionals at conferences and hallways of institutions, as well as interviews with patient organizations that have established disease specific multidisciplinary clinics or centers of excellence in the past. Uh, we did recognize that even though um, those centers of excellence really improve the quality of care and ease the burden on patients and families in accelerating research, that that is absolutely clear. We do recognize that the model isn't scalable for all six to 7,000 diseases that we know of. And so these communities really needed a medical home. And it was that which um, Nord's board of directors decided that this is the time to build a network of um, centers of excellence that could diagnose, treat, and research a broad range of rare diseases. And that time was now. 
It's always important to start with a vision, but our vision is not unique or really unexpected for a program like this. But it did help us inform what we were going to do and perhaps how we we're going to do it. Um, In establishing an application process, we really wanted to evaluate centers um, dedicated to really uh, not only improving the care of those living with rare diseases and support of their families, but also the quality of life of those individuals. We wanted questions that would help us find centers whose rare disease research was cutting edge and determined to move our rare disease knowledge forward. We wanted centers who not only knew there was a shortage of rare disease clinicians, which Marshall so aptly talked about this afternoon, as well as um, researchers, but also centers who were willing to make efforts to change that paradigm. And under Marshall's leadership, we then brought together a committee of about 10 to 15 stakeholders, many who were leading top clinical genetic centers in the United States, to get their input and help us weigh the importance of these different questions. And from that, we developed a rubric of how the questions would be scored. There were two major sections of the application. This slide really speaks to the multiple choice. They were focused on confirming the applicant had a broad range of specialists involved in rare disease research and care as well as that they had the diagnostic and treatment capabilities required by these uh, rare disease patients and families to be able to coordinate complex care across multiple disciplines. Along with those multiple choice questions, we had a series of essay questions. The essay allowed us um, to really apply centers um, to applying centers to expand their rare disease efforts, their description of their work beyond what was included in the multiple choice questions and really delve into various areas such as how they address pediatric to adult transition or what work were they doing in training the next generation of rare disease specialists. In the first year, the application process really began with invitations. We directed the application requests or the invitations themselves to heads of genetic clinics uh, programs. Although the responses were not to be uh, limited to just ge uh, clinical genetics. They were serving as a point of contact for the application process and they helped to coordinate the responses across their institution, and in some cases, partnering institutions who, went, who came together to apply. We had a technical assessment call, which was really, really valuable. It gave us an opportunity to expand upon our vision for the program, uh, what we thought the applic application process was about and what we were trying to accomplish with it. Um, an explanation of the rubrics that we were gonna use and a, a time to answer questions. And it was all quite informative and really valuable process. Since the first round of applications was by invitation only, these were very well-respected organizations. Most of the centers were able to answer positively to a lot of the multiple choice questions. And in few cases, when the center didn't offer a certain particular resource, they had clear referral systems in place to nearby facilities to satisfy those uh, requirements. There was a real rigorous effort um, on uh, our behalf to evaluate uniformly across these applications. We took the process seriously we knew how talented and dedicated these organizations were. And it was important that we didn't, you know, let them or the process down. 
So you can see we had a pretty elaborate process for evaluating the essay questions as well. In the end, most of the applicants met the criteria and were accepted. This slide shows the 31, um, uh, I won't say organizations because in some cases they were um, a group application, 31 entities that um, are part of our first centers of excellence network. The few that did not, did not make um, the application process received feedback on the program implementations that would increase application strength in the future. So we even, we took that process seriously because we knew that they had really good applications in some areas, but just didn't meet all the criteria we were looking for. This slide is a geographic representation of the 31 centers against a heat map of pop US population density. And you can see the correlation here is pretty well aligned, but we do have areas or pockets of, um, of space to continue to fill. And we have expressed interest in some of these areas for folks who have um, shared with uh, NOR that they will be applying when the application process opens up again. So we're encouraged by that, but you know, really proud of of the folks who have stepped up to do this. And of course, like um, any good learning process, we are taking into consideration the things that we've learned and have already begun. There's a small group at Nord that are looking at how do we continue to evolve this and improve upon what we've learned in the past. And I had mentioned to Durhan, we're happy uh, you know, in an off-site uh, sidebar conversation, we're happy to share some of our learnings um, in further detail when and if that's of interest. A few other things to consider that we're certainly considering as we go is to ensure that when we're looking at the the application process, we are not we are putting ourselves in the shoes of organizations that we know have excellence have excellent reputations, have done amazing things in the field to see how would they satisfy these requirements? Um, and is there a different way for us to um, align the process so that the intended outcome is what we get? So now to pivot to the oper operationalization, if you will, operationalizing this network. It's really, from Nord's perspective, happening in, in two major areas of focus. One is developing and rolling out the infrastructure necessary to operationalize the network's engagement, including collaboration tools. And that has started and has been rolling out this year. The other area is really reflective of what's on the slide. And that is beginning to engage the network and these incredibly talented individuals and institutions on the important issues, the important work to be done that the, that the network is uniquely positioned to address. In this particular slide, you can see some key areas of unmet need that we've identified. We identified them earlier on and we've continued to expand upon them as the network has formalized and we've refined some of these areas. In partnership with these areas of unmet need, we have identified, we've developed working groups to focus um, and create charters that focus on these areas of unmet need. The working groups are starting with a landscape analysis where we're gonna do a baseline assessment of the key needs and where work may be happening already because we have no intention to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then begin uh, to address these needs by planning a 12 month, 18 month, 24 month strategy. The working groups are being supported by the network institutions, as well as um, members of NORD's um, patient advocacy organization membership, as well as NORD staff. And the working groups fall into these four pillars of 
work or, or work streams um, that is central to NORD's um, organization and strategic planning. So they line up beautifully um, and align with um, areas of importance to the community through NORD's lens as well. We've made considerable progress in a short period of time from launching the program. We've onboarded all of the sites. We've um, had initial meeting, I think actually two now with the center directors, which in, is a feat in of itself, getting all these incredibly talented and um, people in high demand, um, getting them all coordinated. Um, getting their calendars coordinated. Uh, we've established the working groups. As you saw, we've not only defined what they are, but we've actually physically established them. We have over 200 um, volunteers across the network in attendance of these working groups, and they've all met at least once and have, in some cases, they've had their second meeting as they work to develop their assessments and their plans this year. Towards the end of the year in the fourth quarter, um, they will meet and the directors will meet and review the plans and confirm the work to move forward. At this point, this is as far as we've gotten. Um, and I wanna express uh, my gratitude to Mary Beth uh, McAfee, who is really um, he's, she's an associate director of the program and she has really spearheaded the operations to date. And um, I owe a debt of gratitude to her for the work she's done so far and the information that she's um, provided so that I can speak to you with some degree of specificity um, and clarity. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Pam. That was a very thorough and almost a roadmap in terms of how one actually can go about getting these centers not only set up, but activated. And as you say, this might be as far as you've gotten, but that is amazing in terms of the progress. And certainly a huge credit to NORT for taking this on. As we know, NIH called for Centers of Excellence and put out a bit of a vision on it, but really NORT took up the gauntlet as they did with patient registries to say, okay, how do we make this work? And certainly I know that when Marshall was there as, as chair as well, I mean, it was really crafting out this road plan. Uh, but where you've taken it now in terms of the working groups is a real inspiration to us and a real challenge to what we need to do. There's a lot of opportunities out of these. So I think this is uh, really a, a great opportunity for us. We are at the end of the day. I'm really sorry that we don't have a lot more time for discussion, but I'm hoping that people really got a wonderful sense of what the opportunities are. I think we started, to, I think as we said, this morning with a visionary panel who actually included some of our key industry leaders, included certainly CADIS, including Health Canada, to help us say, and David, you know, really from a long-term patient perspective, you know, really letting us know kind of what could it look like, you know, a bit from the top down, right? And a recommitment, we heard very strongly from all of these to say, yes, we're there with you. But what you've heard as we've gone through the day, and certainly what Marshall and what Matt and what Pam have really said strongly, is that's the patient organizations. I mean, NORD has actually taken this on strongly and actually has championed this. I mean, and you know, what we begged you, what Matt said very strongly, the ERNs, I mean, one of their keys to success is the fact that patient organizations are integrated into those ERNs and they drive a lot of the work that's there and they hold them accountable. But they're also deeply partners in it and they're trained partners in it. And I think, you know, we owe a lot to also your orders for the kind of instrumental work they've done in terms of training patients, not just to be advocates at the table, but to be skilled partners in terms of driving out this work. So there's also huge opportunities for us here. We want to learn from all of that. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us. So many thanks again to Pam and to Marshall and to Matt for laying out for us 
you know, the huge opportunities, but also the vehicles that we can work with. And I know Pam is very sincere and has always been in terms of North's commitment to working with CORD and really taken us on as a little sister under their wing to really kind of help us move along. But we have an opportunity to really be able to demonstrate what we can do and really be able to make something that works across Canada, as you saw from the expertise that we have. So I won't go into much more. Tomorrow we've got a start in which we're going to recap some of what we've learned here. And tomorrow we have an amazing day because it's going to drive us back into some of the other key areas. We're going to open with a discussion around patient engagement, where patients are engaged now, what we need in order to have the kind of patient engagement we need to get the system to work. We're going to actually have a revisit in terms of existing centers of excellence. I call it decentralized because what we also heard is that we can certainly have centers, but we also may be thinking about regional centers. You know, and as you could see, the landscape there. So we think about the prairies, think about the Atlantic. You know, what about the West? How does that work together? And that would be the beginnings of having then a national center. So this hub model and having different hubs out there will be something we're going to talk about. And again, building on the expertise is there. So important. We're building it on, you know, what currently exists. And then we're going to shift in the afternoon back in terms of what our primary mandate was to start with, and that is what do we need in terms of rare disease drug strategy? Uh, recognizing strongly that at the end of the day, we started off by saying there's a commitment to getting optimal access for therapies, for new therapies, but also for existing therapies to patients in a timely fashion and to be able to do it in a way that's going to meet the need for the patients to get access, the need for affordability, sustainability within the drug programs, including our public and private plans, and also at the end of the day, ensuring that industry and the researchers and the developers are going to be sufficiently incentivized and reimbursed to be able to continue to do this development. And that's all possible. So we're going to talk a bit more about that. But again, you know, with really the partnership, Canada's a great environment. And I think as Stephanie said, you know, as much as we moan and complain about certain things, at the end of the day, we have a wonderful health care system here in Canada. And it's the opportunity for us to build on it and to actually be able to make sure that rare diseases is equally wonderfully, you know, um, support it in terms of all of the needs. So we're going to do that tomorrow, and we'll have an opportunity then to really talk about, you know, what we can do together towards the next step. So many thanks to everybody for your tremendous engagement and patience here today. Again, our huge thanks to all of our presenters and all of those who came in as, you know, sharing and providing their expertise. But my biggest thanks goes, as always, to the patients and the patient advocates, to the panel that was here, but also to all the patients and the patient advocates that are in the room today. At the end of the day, you know, you're the ones that are driving it, and you're the ones that are going to have to make sure that we're going to be able to get it over in terms of that next state in, in the way that we need to. So huge thanks again. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, uh. Join us upstairs. Got to complete for. Join us upstairs for cocktails. Twenty ninth floor, up to the top. Okay, off we go. Cheers. <laughs> This is on now. Okay, 29th floor. We've got cocktails. Don't go away. Please do join us upstairs for cocktails. <laughs>